Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, dear audience, it is my utmost pleasure to greet you all of the second day of 2022 Financial Stability Conference, organized jointly by the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, and the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. My name is Ildiko Nadra, Deputy Spokesperson at Magyar Nemzeti Bank, and I'm honored to be your host today at this event. We are very happy that we can welcome all of you, thousands of experts from four continents, both in physical form and online. And we hope to continue to have an active and fruitful discussion today. Today, you will hear expert presentations and discussions related to the future challenges that the financial system faces, digital transformation, regulatory reforms and the green transition. To channel in as many arguments as possible, we will provide the opportunity to the audience to ask questions and share their views with us after the end of most sessions. Those following us online can use a special platform, the link to which you will find in the description of our live feed. If you miss any of the speeches or you would like to rewatch our sessions of yesterday, you will be able to rewatch the OLA conference later on the official MMB YouTube channel. Today's agenda opens with a keynote presentation delivered by Mr. Gergely Fabian, Executive Director responsible for financial system analysis and statistics at the Magyar Nemzeti Bank and CEO of the Budapest Institute of Banking. The presentation will give a comprehensive overview of the future of banking, touching upon most of the topics that we will talk about in detail today. Mr. Fabian, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, thank you for coming. The, the benefit of hosting an event like this, it has a special privilege that I can be one of the speakers, one of the keynote speakers. I, I will try to set the stage for the, uh, for the upcoming day and, and summarize. Actually, it's a work, it's a presentation, it's a work of, uh, of my team, uh, and it has, a, it has a history. It started in 2013, to the early 2014, when we first published a, a long-term strategy paper about how we envisage uh, the banking sector in the next 10 year, 10, 8, 10 years. And we basically revisited this uh, paper, this strategy paper. Uh, we, we tried to revisit earlier, but then COVID came, so it's, uh, it's time now. It's the first presentation of it, and uh, we, we soon published uh, the strategy papers. And this is a strategy paper, for, just like the previous one, for um, for, for discussion, obviously, because many of the topics are, 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 are not just the topic of the central bank, it's, it's a more broad-based uh, topic. But it has a, uh, and, and I really like this work, uh, it has a benefit, because normally if you think about financial stability departments, we have a, we have a horizon of two years, we look at the current challenges, and if you look at the news, uh, news uh, uh, this week or, or any day, it's, it's, it's easy to get lost in the, in the current trends and in the upcoming challenges. Uh, but this, this strategy paper and this work has a, has a much broader overview, looking at more 10 years. And why we updated it, is it was important to, to have an, there are two major uh, developments which uh, which uh, needed to be more uh, deeply involved. Uh, one is technology and the other is green transition, so I'm going to talk about these ones. Actually, the, the first uh, strategy paper back in 2014 was, was quite successful. We, we, were, we were envisaging and we were talking about how to strengthen the banking sector uh, and how to achieve that the banking sector uh, and what we would like to see as a banking sector that is su supporting efficiently the uh, the economy also had things where, and it's, this were this were actually succeeded, and this all you could see all the macroprudential policy that we have done, uh, that we had done uh, in the upcoming years, it was all together to achieve that goals, and we were also talking about efficiency. 
uh, and this is probably where, uh, just one sentence before that, so it was good because you see that the strong banking sector how helpful was in the, in, in the, in the COVID times, uh, but efficiency was the question which wasn't maybe that elaborated and we look at the technology developments nowadays, it made, made necessary to revisit and more um, uh, and to, to extend, uh, extend the, uh, the vision on that. And it's uh, maybe just uh, uh, one sentence about this that you're looking at two years, if you look at back in the history and uh, you look at on a two years horizon, probably a cavalry in, the, in an army is, a, is an important thing. But if you look at 10 years horizon, probably it's not anymore and outdated. So it's, it's worth to look at this, uh, this way. It's about the Hungarian banking sector, but we will, uh, in this presentation, we will focus also on, on global challenges just to set the stage for, the, for today's, uh, today's agenda. So, there are three topics to be discussed. The one is the technology, the second is uh, changes in monetary system, particularly the, 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 the CBDC, I guess, that uh, was discussed yesterday, and uh, it's, 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 it has to be in the, in, the, in the strategy paper when we're talking about the next 10 years. Uh, even probably for a short term horizon it has to be, and, and transition to a green economy and how a financial system can, ha uh, can have a role in it. Um, this, uh, obviously this uh, paper is gonna be a, a quite a large, almost like a book. Uh, so in this presentation, just to set the stage, uh, the, f the focus will be on data, which probably the most important ingredient for financial system, yet not well exploited at this moment. And if you look at that, uh, if you're looking at the data, what we see a huge boost of the available data in the, in the, in the previous, uh, previous years. And uh, also it become cheaper and the technology developed to, to be able to process this data. So that, that's a very important thing. And we see that many of the, industries uh, where disruption happened, it was based on somehow data. So the main concept was here to, to, to be able to drive value from data and you, you succeeded, you disrupted and you uh, yeah, succeeded. And uh, if you look at what's around the mega trends in, in the financial system, you can see that digitalization, digital transformation is obviously a very important thing and it's, it's, it's uh, the data analytics has an has a important role in, in the digital digitalization. You see the fintech, big tech, uh, open banking appearance on, on, the, on the stage. Uh, AI is, is, is very important as a tool to, to process the data and uh, the, the huge amount of data. Uh, you see CBDC appeared, blockchain appeared, and uh, uh, sharing economy, and obviously sustainability there as well. And the, all, all the data and the big data is, is, is uh, as I emphasized, it's, it's there. And uh, not to repeat myself, but uh, the, uh, with the data and with the the appearance of a, uh, API, uh, the application programming interface, you see this API economy where you can, uh, you can connect data, you create leverage, you create huge opportunities for the economy. And this is uh, something that uh, uh, where a financial system is worth thinking because we see many industries are, are going that way in their, in their business models. And Obviously, what, is, uh, what are the outcomes here is you see that uh, how a future of financial system will look like is definitely, it's not just about banks, uh, but we do think that banks has a, has a, has a, will remain an, uh, an important role. Uh, uh, but there is a changing and we, because of the technology and because of the opportunities of the data, uh, <coughs> probably the, the biggest changing happening uh, right now and will happen in the next two years in, in, in the financial system. So, and just for about the API, API uh, and, the, uh, and the data, what you can see and it's going back to the, 
the previews that definitely there is something where the banking uh, go on a way of being a, pla a sort of platform. And that's obviously the, uh, the evil is in the details and that creates uh, lots of tasks on an operational side and on a legal side. But if you look at uh, uh, this chart, if you look at in the past 10 years how the largest financial institutions changed, back in 2010, you could see traditional banks in uh, uh, from China, from US, from global players. And if you look at 2020, and actually that the trend remained, you see platforms actually rising up like Visa, MasterCard. So actually coming from payment, making a, a huge money. Uh, and al also to Chinese Tencent and uh, Alipay and PayPal is there. So basically what they are doing, uh, they just, they are not just in the payment industry, what they are doing is basically they are doing a, a platform thing. They are utilizing the data and they are utilizing the possibilities from API. And that's already creating value. Uh, and probably it will be create more and none to mention their efficiency is much more higher. And when we're talking about efficiency, uh, and I think that's the banking and that was the hardest part for our strategy paper back in 2013, 2014. Uh, when you talk about efficiency, you, you say that it's, it's, an, it's a nice thing, it's a neat thing, but if you have a, like a quiet life uh, uh, in banking, uh, if you anyway achieve your goals, achieve your profits, it, it's hard to get people convinced to be more efficient. But uh, this is, I guess, the time, uh, in this, decade, uh, this decade is the time when, uh, when what today is an efficiency thing that might be what is about thriving today, it can be a survival thing tomorrow. So I would uh, speak shortly because there was yesterday a, 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 a panel about CBDC, but as I said, we cannot avoid CBDC here. And in the thing on, on uh, why CBDC is, uh, uh, can happen first is to keep up with digitalization, not just on the uh, bank level, but on the central bank level. Second, to avoid uh, probably most important, a sort of dollarization, which dollar is not a dollar, but uh, but some sort of stable coin. So, cryptoization avoidance, it might be important. So it's in, and one thing is obviously the the question in the current system is trust in, in this question of underbank that uh, uh, many of the people, and that, that's a thing that. Uh, uh, how a new technologies can involve and increase, uh, boost uh, financial inclusion. Uh, for that, that, there are just some interesting from, from BIS and, and the ECB. Uh, one is the barriers to inclusion, financial illiteracy, uh, lack of access point, high costs. Uh, anyway, the legacy, the insufficient legacy of the, of the, of the uh, infrastructure. So, and if you look at the ECB, ECB tried to measure with the digital euro that what people think about it, and some of the some of the things were very interesting. But altogether, I think uh, it points to the fact that CBDC has a valid uh, uh, model. And uh, as I said, I don't want to talk about too much on it because there was a panel. Uh, but for people, it's definitely what it's uh, what it's important. Uh, be it underbanked or banked, is uh, is to have a low cost, uh, seamless, fast, uh, and probably digital, but easily understandable solutions. And uh, in that part, uh, also some points on all that robust customer support system, which points to the fact that CBDC uh, will not exist without without the banking sector, without the financial intermediation. Uh, and actually, privacy was important, but uh, not that the important that previously people thought about it. So safety was important in a sense that the transactions are safe. So that's that, that's uh, uh, priority number one. That the fact that the data can be uh, the privacy data can be exploited uh, by 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 economic actors. That that wasn't that important thing. That people took it as a uh, as a as a as a, as a uh, everyday thing that happening anyway in the in the in the big in the big tech world. So one thing is sure that CBDC is coming. 
it's still a, a thing that uh, it's, it's it's not just central bank. It's, it's a government. It's a society. So uh, it's a broader thing that has to be discussed at how it would look like uh, when it will be introduced. But some countries are ahead of it, and if there is going to be a first mover, definitely will be will be followers. Uh, here the question of obviously that how CBDC for look like specifically how uh, retail uh, CBDC look like and how uh, what it creates in the banking sector and obviously uh, it create uh, the more uh, retail the the central bank digital currency the the more risks are coming from the banking sector opportunities are coming as well but it's something that it shows that it has to be carefully constructed and uh, properly discussed in, in the society and harmonized on international level as well. And which again setting the stage, uh, sustainability is a, a, a major risk. Again, uh, uh, if you look at maybe a two years horizon, you can downplay it. Uh, some, of, some people are downplaying it in longer term, uh, but on longer term that's an issue that uh, where the financial system has an important role, and and we see that, uh, uh, and probably that's the uh, for me the best surprise and the uh, the best development is that that more and more people in the financial sector recognizing that and they are doing things uh, for it. So the so the direction is really good. Just an example: which, uh, uh, at the Budapest Institute of Banking, we started. Uh, green finance education, sustainability education, so trainings on uh, 2018. At the time, there was hardly any interest for the, for the course. And what, see, what we see now is basically there are full houses of the, of the training. So it's definitely to see that it's, uh, uh, for, for my surprise actually, but it, it, uh, uh, it, it has a boom and, and that's a good thing. So where should we be in uh, 10 years? Uh, just I had a, a thing which I, I skipped the slide and that shows that there is a need for digitalization. And if you look at Hungary and you can look at on the a way how it has in the operating uh, expenses as a proportion of assets. So you can make some, uh, so you, can, you can just uh, uh, decrease with some items, but still uh, we are in a high cost area, actually in a high income area as well. And if we look at the digitalization, we in the in the back of uh, in in the in the back side of the European Union. So we have that's on the right side. We have a lot to do here, and definitely just to go ahead. So where should we in where should we where should we be in ten years? Uh, uh, what we need is still a stable and efficient banking system. And we need a digital banking system that support for financial deepening, financial inclusion, and cost efficiency. Uh, and we need a sustainable uh, banking system where there is a support not just for uh, digital transition, but also support for uh, green transition. And this is a thing where it's not just a, there isn't just homework for the banking sector. There is a lot of homework for for the state as well. Uh, probably the state, as in, probably it's not just in Hungary, but uh, uh, the state is, is sitting on a huge amount of data that it's unexploited uh, uh, and it needs to be exploited. And obviously, when you go to the uh, state data that creates a huge possibility for, for uh, also for, for the banking sector, especially if you link together with banking data. As I, as I said, the number one priority is to, to create uh, value from data and for that uh, there needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be homework for, for, for the government, uh, the central bank and, and banks as well. And here, just uh, uh, just to show you that how we see that it can create uh, 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 value, and we have an estimation of of, uh, of uh, uh, GDP increases well that it's up to 1.5 percent higher annual GDP can be achieved by exploiting data assets. Actually, it can be more if you 
if 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 there will be unicorns who who can exploit this uh, state data and can grow uh, exponentially. So it, it's a huge opportunity. And one thing in the, in in the banking sector, uh, if you look at the banking sector, it started with the payments where you can see the most challengers. Uh, this is where startups can can just rise and and and, and make a huge uh, make a huge business out of the. Uh, banks payment and account services business and you, you can you know many of uh, successful stories from stripe to 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 revolut uh, and that comes uh, and obviously it's not just about payments payments where the most of the uh, where most of the innovations happen now you see already be, uh, buy now pay later appears in the on, on the horizon which already is something about uh, lending and uh, data is not just about uh, helping in payment services but it, it can be also helpful in in in, uh, 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 in scoring as well so in lending as well and if you look at in the hungarian case we have uh, mostly a, we have basically just uh, application scoring so still that uh, uh, exploitation of data creates a huge opportunity for uh, for for lending as well and for for uh, for credit scoring. Obviously, one question here is, is data protection. Uh, and uh, this is why I said that it's, it's not just a central bank thing that we say something. It, it's, uh, it has to be a consent on, a, uh, it, ha it has to be with, uh, discussed on society level and it, there has to be a consent on where, would, where, would, uh, where do we draw the line. Uh, in efficiency, probably uh, definitely it's it's much more advanced than a uh, banking, but but not that open as a big tech. But somewhere in the middle, uh, it has to be met. And uh, here, just a thing about uh, bank efficiency and data protection, and and definitely where we draw the line. As I said, it's it's somewhere closer to a, a, a let's say a big tech, but uh, but yet it's not entirely that one so uh, about what is the consent of the of the uh, of the customers so that they are allowing to use as a data for banks to create value and uh, here one thing I, I mentioned the BIS uh, uh, findings as well uh, financial literacy and digital literacy as well actually it's a very important thing and uh, uh, whenever we do these things we we need to we need to have an emphasis with the government to to work on financial literacy as well to achieve digital transformation uh, you need financial literacy that that's why we opened the money museum which we had, had the visit yesterday uh, and also it's very important to, to train the people in the financial sector because if you think about uh, just think about it introducing a cbdc that that's a game changer if i haven't emphasized in time that's a game changer for the financial system so basically you, you need to retrain you need to upskill all of your people to understand the new new way of of, of doing financial intermediation so competent finance uh, finance professionals are very important. If you look at examples, uh, uh, <laughs> Singapore hasn't wake up yet. Uh, but if you look at examples like Singapore, uh, you can see it's that uh, if they that they invest a lot in competent financial professionals, and you see that they are more advanced in in innovations and in in, in the financial sector in general. So some more about the Hungarian banking system. Uh, like I, I, one minute left. Uh, we achieved a lot of things uh, uh, in terms of strengthening the banking sector and achieving that they are that the banking sector properly and if, and uh, uh, substantially contribute to to economic growth and and, and economic convergence actually. Uh, as I mentioned, as uh, we had this 2014 paper, uh, and we are uh, now for us, we feel like the time to take uh, the banking system to a new level. And in this uh, strategy paper, which we will publish, we, we will uh, uh, emphasize that. And here are some goals uh, 
uh, that we would like to achieve for for uh, we would like the banks to achieve uh, for digitalization by 2030. Uh, uh, I have hardly time left, so I'm not going to read up things, but definitely you see that uh, it, it's a much more digital banking sector. And uh, we have clear goals, and not just clear goals, but clear strategy as well, which uh, uh, which I think the mo it's going to be the most important thing to to start with. And it is, this is a data reform in Hungary to achieve. And here is just an example on the uh, on the open access to data in Europe um, uh, survey uh, that we, we have a lot to achieve here to to have more open access data. And then uh, the, our goal is to to really have a to to really be a transactor and. Uh, and thereby helping in the digital infra, uh, infrastructure and, and in innovations. And uh, some of the examples, some of the concrete examples where we really aim at uh, uh, improving data access can be, here, here, can be seen here. It's not just about the central credit information, it's energy certificates for real estate. So there are many data for the uh, uh, property, there are many property data that can be digitalized and uh, is more easily uh, accessed openly as a data. So here there are a lot to do. And uh, just some final words on the uh, uh, on the on, on the on the green aspects. There's gonna be a whole. There's gonna be two whole sessions for that. So I'm not. I'm just really a few minutes. It's really important to to consider it and, and to deal with it seriously. And uh, actually, here the central bank can do a lot of things, and we already are doing uh, in the macroprudential policy, in supervisory measures and regulations, and also in the monetary policy. We already started. Actually, we are the first central bank who has a green mandate. So, and and we and we pursuing that green mandate uh, in, in the past uh, and in the future. Thank you for your attention. And I let this. I hope I set the stage and I let the uh, most part of people to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fabian, for this very insightful presentation. I hope our other speakers today can refer back to the arguments you mentioned. Our first session today also covers a topic of the future, sustainable finance and implications of climate change in financial risk analysis. We continue with three presentations in the topic. The first one will be delivered by the chair of the session, Ms. Irene Monasterolo, professor of climate finance at EDHEC Business School. Afterwards, we will hear two further presentations on this topic from the authors of papers selected by the MMB from those received in answers to our call for papers. First, we will hear Mr. Hugh Miller, Research Officer at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He will join us online. And then, Mr. Remko van der Molen, Senior Economist at the Dutch Central Bank, who also joins us online. Now, I pass the word to Ms. Monasterolo. The floor is yours. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, today, uh, we will, in this session, we will mostly focus on uh, climate and the relation between uh, climate change and financial stability from the angle of uh, financial risk. With, um, it's also a pleasure to be here because this allows me to, I mean, take stock of what have, um, with an international group of researchers we have been doing in the last 10 years now on climate stress testing. And I just want to mention that when we started in quite 10 years ago, climate stress testing was quite a esoteric word. <laughs> and now instead it became very uh, widespread and um, 
uh, actually, uh, the role of climate stress tests become very much acknowledged, both by uh, central banks, financial regulators, but also by the industry and academia. So what I would like to do today is to uh, actually have a, take a step, ba a step back and look at uh, what we achieved so far in climate stress tests, what is still missing, both from a research and uh, applied uh, perspective, and what can be already done to strengthen climate stress tests to make it more relevant for, to inform financial supervision in the era of climate risk. So, step back, back to 2017. In that year, we uh, published our climate stress test on natural climate change, showing for the first time that a disorderly transition could lead to large potential losses for individual financial institutions, as well as for uh, the financial system, with implications on financial stability, given conditions on leverage and interconnectedness. What did we find? Well, here, uh, we what we did we do? Actually, we analyzed the individual exposures of financial actors, being them banks, pension funds, investment funds, uh, insurance, you name them, uh, to what we call, we define their climate policy relevant sectors. The climate policy relevant sectors classified economic activities at the NACE four digit level or NICE six digit for uh, those of you in the US standards into unique classes of decreasing exposure to climate transition risk. Well, we'll uh, we did analysis on equity holdings. We know that this is only a limited share of banks and uh, investors' holdings, but at that time, it was uh, data we could assess. And what we found is that the value at risk for banks having a certain exposure to climate policy relevant sectors could vary largely given the bank's investment strategy. So as you could see, the values uh, in the bottom of the uh, potential losses for like Deutsche Bank would change massively given a business as usual investment strategy, which is the brown one, or a low carbon aligned investment strategy. At that time, there were still no NGFS, Network for Green Financial System scenarios, so we use the uh, IPCC scenarios. And what you can see, the different, uh, the dark and light color actually show respectively first and second round losses. So light color takes into account financial interconnectedness. And this analysis was also important because it shows that, show that individual financial institutions could be exposed to large losses, depending also on uh, their uh, level of inter, uh, I mean, their uh, financial risk profile. And in particular, as we can see here, some banks like Deutsche Bank uh, and Credit Agricole will be exposed to climate risk from either from first or second round, round losses, mostly. How did we get there? Actually, we, uh, we developed a climate stress test to assess climate-related financial risk for investors. In particular, we used the uh, trajectories of uh, economic trajectories of integrated assessment models, the same models that are now used by the NGFS, uh, to uh, shock, uh, actually, firms' um, output trajectories. And then we translated this into uh, adjustment in probability of default and into adjustment in financial risk metrics, such as value at risk, climate value at risk. And then we uh, actually uh, run financial network model on the adjust, adjusted um, portfolio. What we found is that uh, actually investors are, were highly exposed to uh, climate transition risk, actually for even 40% of portfolio of pension funds and investment funds, um, and the losses could be um, uh, amplified by uh, interconnectedness. Similar approach to climate stress test is now followed by the Network for Green Financial System, who has developed, and this is the major innovation, its own supervisory climate scenarios for climate stress test, and applied it already in several uh, climate stress test uh, um, exercises. Here you see some of them, Bank de France, uh, Dutch National Bank, uh, recently also the European Central Bank, Economy-Wide Climate Stress Test, 
and Austrian National Bank. Why this matters? Because now, in 2022, and it was kind of two months ago, the IPCC, in its uh, uh, sixth assessment report, and in particular uh, in its chapter 15, which is the first time that the IPCC has a chapter on investment and finance, identified poor climate financial risk assessment as a major barrier for capital reallocation, reallocation and to make the transition. Why? Well, the IPCC identified by reviewing the literature a double side connection between climate change and finance. On the one hand, climate change could have an impact on finance via physical and transition risk. And in this regard, risk perception of investors determines the investment decisions that they might or might not do. And this, in turn, impact on the realization of the scenarios. Importantly, that feedback is not considered yet in the scenarios that, uh, we, uh, that financial supervisors uh, and central banks that compose the NGFS, now they are over 114, are using for climate stress test. These are the, uh, the scenarios, just a brief introduction on what the scenarios are. They are produced by process-based integrated assessment models and have, are based on distinct features of how the low carbon transition could occur. In particular, given a certain carbon budget that would allow us so how much we can still emit in order to stay within the two degrees target by the end of the century, the integrated assessment models for each sector of the economy, they calculate a trajectory uh, based on timing of climate policy introductions, carbon pricing, emission and temperature targets, technology development, and reliance on um, carbon dioxide removal. And based on that, the NGFS has developed uh, four reference scenarios, in, uh, well, in particular, an orderly transition, disorderly transition, and hothouse world, and the last one that has not been assessed yet, which is too little, too late. Main difference, in an orderly transition, we implement climate policy early, meaning that we have low transition risk and low physical risk because we do mitigation. In opposite, uh, at the, um, on the contrary, in a disorderly transition, we still have limited physical risk because we do mitigation, but we do mitigation later by introducing climate policies late in a sudden way, meaning that financial actors and markets cannot fully adjust and this could lead in turn, is expected to lead to larger asset price volatility and financial instability. Hotels world, we don't do mitigation policies that are needed, so we stick just on the nationally determined contribution and current policies, meaning that we will get close to three degrees. But in that case, we will have larger physical risk. So this was an introduction. What are the gaps that remain? Well, I will talk about the three major gaps the for climate financial risk assessment. The first is about scenarios. The second one is about climate risk, risk exposure data and metrics. And the third one pertains to the macroeconomic models that we use to assess climate damages. Scenarios. On the physical risk side, the NGFS scenarios still neglect acute risk, such as uh, risk from uh, hazards like floods, droughts, and their compounding of shocks. For instance, we know that uh, natural disasters don't happen only, might not happen only once in a country, but could be recurrent and could even compound among itself, like having first floods and then droughts, or even compound like with other type of shocks, like COVID pandemic. Why this matters? Because when risk compound, they amplify the magnitude and duration of economic shocks, with implications for financial losses. Here an example, this, come, this is based on a joint work I done with the World Bank Disaster Risk Finance Initiative, where we assess the compounding of climate acute uh, physical risk and COVID uh, on GDP of several uh, emerging countries. And we developed a compound risk indicator. The risk uh, that you see here, the uh, um, CRI, uh, actually uh, shows the non-linearity of shock on GDP. 
And the two trajectories uh, the, um, consider two different scenarios. The first one is a scenario, uh, the, the red one, sorry, which is actually a smaller uh, impact uh, and uh, earlier recovery, is a scenario with uh, mild uh, acute risk. In this case, it was uh, hurricanes and a pandemic, while the purple one is a case of strong hurricanes and pandemic. Sorry. Back to scenarios. About transition risk, NGFS scenarios still neglect the role of finance, and in particular the fact that investors are looking at the scenarios and they might decide to adjust their financial risk assessment and, for instance, their credit rating and uh, cost of capital for firms, uh, depending on their energy technology, much earlier than climate policy introduction. And this matters because when we account for the feedback from financial risk assessment into the scenarios, we get very different orderly and disorderly trajectories. How different? It's here. This is an, uh, we analyzed this point in a paper that we published on science last year. And uh, actually, in the boxes that you see here, I highlighted two examples. In the bottom one on the left, we have the case of immediate climate policy introduction, which would be like northerly transition, but financial system which doesn't actually believe that the policy will be introduced and thus doesn't anticipate it. What we get there, so trajectories. The straight uh, and um, trajectories are uh, um, actually the um, results of the output of the integrated assessment models for uh, coal, output, which is the brown one, and renewable energies output, which is the green one. The dotted lines instead are the results that we obtain where we feedback climate financial risk assessment into the investment decision in the integrated assessment model and thus in their trajectories. And what we see here is that in a case where we think that we are in an orderly transition because we have immediate climate policies, and so we should be fine. Everything should, I mean, we, uh, implications for finance would be limited. Well, if the financial sector doesn't uh, trust the policy and doesn't react, we will have actually a more abrupt adjustment in the output of those sectors, respectively positively for renewables and negative for uh, coal, which will translate in much larger asset uh, price volatility, which is the second panel that you see in the bottom box, in contrast of a condition when we would have even, we are late on climate policy introduction, which is the top panel, but the financial sector anticipates the policy. In that case, we will have a much smoother adjustment, both in output of trajectories for sectors and in the value of their assets. Of course, the way in which the adjustment will occur and the, the, uh, the behavior in terms of asset values adjustment as a major, I mean, the difference between the trajectories in the uh, asset value in the bottom panel and in the top panel has major implications then for financial, uh, might have implications for financial stability and thus for financial policy. The second point is about data and metrics. For physical risk, scenarios currently lack the asset level dimension, and with asset I mean plant, physical plants, and not only their geolocalization, but also their role in business revenues. Why? Because a firm could have a lot of plants uh, which are highly exposed to um, like floods, but these plants represent only a minor, uh, a very limited, share of their revenues and thus even if they are largely shocked and even destroyed could have low financial relevance. Of course the opposite would hold true. Example, this is what happens. Actually in this analysis that we recently published we developed an asset level approach to climate physical risk assessment and we assessed the cascading financial losses for European in, uh, on the portfolio of European investors. And here you, see what I, uh, here you can see what I mean. 
In the boxes uh, with the dots, these company assets in the... Sorry? No, that's fine. The company as, uh, assets uh, in the database, you see the localization of the plants. These two companies are both active in elect, uh, energy and electricity business, but their assets are dif have different localization, and these uh, and actually they have rather different composition. The company on the right is more focused on gas, the company on the left on um, electricity. Well, what we see is that if we only, if we don't consider the acute shocks, so the shocks like disasters impacting on individual plants, the impact on the price, which is the top uh, panel would be actually uh, uh, would have that shape but actually if we consider the shock on the assets individual assets and we reconstruct the shock transmission on the firm's business line and value of its of its stocks the trajectory will be very different which means the price uh, recovery will not even occur for the company on the left for the company on the right it's instead a different story, and this is due to the fact that the company has a different location of assets, and these assets are, have much lower exposure to climate physical risk. So actually, if we don't consider that these two companies, despite being in the same categ uh, category and sector, have different assets, and different, which are localized in different areas and have different technology, we would have, we would, we might, uh, get large error in our estimates on how their stock prices will behave in the future. With regards to state of transition risk, this po uh, data for disclosure of climate transition risk is mostly based on uh, GG emissions and carbon footprint, and now more in increasing on ESG, environmental social governance. However, there are some major limitations in using emissions. Why? Because even for the scope one emissions, which is the one for which we have most data, actually we should consider that a utility company producing uh, electricity out of coal could decrease its scope one emissions just by expanding its uh, line of business in trade. This will not be decarbonization, uh, but will uh, look much better in the scope one reporting of the company. Uh, with ESG scores, I mean, there was growing research showing aggregate confusion and greenwashing. But how this matters, I mean, how sh we should really pay attention on how we uh, disclose climate transition risk at company level. Because in five years, all financial markets might be sustainable, but we will not have enough green investments in the economy. And this means that we will not be able to deliver on the Paris Agreement climate targets. And this is a reality already now. Look here, this is results of our recent research. We looked at uh, the composition, uh, sorry, and the um, evolution of the ESG scores uh, of uh, 10 largest asset managers, universal investors, you see them like BlackRock, uh, Fidelity Investment, Judy Capital, uh, JP Morgan, and so on. Uh, and the ESG scores actually um, are uh, the, the bars. You can see that there's been quite uh, large, uh, mm, sorry, uh, sorry, the mm, ESG scores uh, are the bars, yeah? And the investment in fossil fuels. Well. What should we believe here? Yeah. What does the E of ESG, which is represented in the bars, tell us about the fossil fuel investments of these companies? So fossil fuel investments either stand still or increased, but the ESG score increased much more. So that could be a problem. Third, modeling climate shocks. We don't see large shocks yet. Why in the economy? And this gives rise to... Uh, let's say, uh, declarations like the one that we heard from uh, uh, Mr. Kirk last week. We don't see large shocks because actually we are still using in climate economic modeling aggregate damage functions. And 
we don't consider asset level information. And if we don't consider this information, actually at the level of the same company, having plants which could be either positively or negatively impacted by climate change, in particular on the transition based on their energy technology, shocks will level out, meaning that we will have, in average, uh, a smoothed adjustment of GDP in the economy. But, and also, the macroeconomic models that we are using to analyze shock of climate, impact of climate change on GDP actually don't consider the fact that fine, don't consider finance and its complexity, meaning they don't consider that there is actually uh, money and access to credit, which play a big role in firms' investment decision. But this is not considered yet. And thus, actually, it makes it much a simpler story that as, as soon as firms want to change from one sector to the other, from one technology to the other, they can do it. But in reality, this is not, uh, this is not true. What can we already do now to strengthen climate stress test? Cl for climate transition risk exposure, in 2017, we introduced the climate policy relevant sectors. This allowed us to map uh, NACE four-digit economic activities and the variables of integrated assessment models into unique and decreasing classes of climate transition risk exposure based not only on emissions, but also on the technology profile of the company, the uh, role in the revenues and business models, so input sustainability, and the sensitivity to adjustment in climate policies. Importantly, this classification uh, is replicable and comparable across portfolios and jurisdiction, and for companies that have bis uh, mixed business lines, imagine utilities that have both electricity production from fossil fuels, but also from uh, uh, renewables, this can be matched with the EU taxonomy criteria, showing thus the shades of brown and the shades of green. And this is what uh, CPRS uh, is what we introduced in 2017 at the level one and two, which however were still based only on the NACE sector. More recently, we went much more granular using asset levels or plant level information, for instance, about energy technology and their role in the firm's revenue shares. And what we got is CPRS granular. And this is, as you can see, the difference in the quality and detail of information that we get about the firm's exposure to climate transition risk. Actually, we can now distinguish between, for instance, energy intensive production for fertilizer or iron and steel, all electrical. And the same can be done for all the um, economic activities at NACE for digit level. Even more importantly, this can be mapped now in the variables of the integrated assessment models with which we uh, actually, uh, on which NGFS scenarios are based. So we can go now from the NACE four digit level of the economic, declared by the economic activity to classification into climate transition risk, so the CPRS granular, and assigning it to the integrated assessment model variable. In this way, we can assign a climate transition risk profile to the integrated assessment model trajectory. Last point about models, and then I will, done, will be done. Why this matters? Because ideally, when we want to do, uh, we use, we do climate transition risk exposure and climate physical risk exposure as a first step for climate financial risk assessment, we want to see first how firms, to what extent are firms exposed to climate physical and transition risk, translate it into an adjustment in firms' profitability, in firms' probability of default, and then in the performance of the economy considering that these firms have financial contracts uh, and securities, meaning that they are also dependent about the, their ability to uh, do investments in either green or brown sectors in the future is uh, affected by, for instance, the cost of capital. And this is what we recently found in a joint work with the European Central Bank, uh, Laura Parisi. Actually, we analyzed the impact of all, um, physical and transition risk of NGFS scenarios on the euro area economy and banking sector. On the left, 
you see the real GDP comparison between uh, two types of disorderly transition. So the yellow one is disorderly transition and limited physical risk. Blue bar is disorderly transition and average physical risk. And red bar is hotels world. Well, what we see here is that an orderly transition has low, low, short-term cost to economic growth, but significant co-benefits. In contrast, a disorderly transition as lower leads to decrease in output, uh, but potentially larger trade-offs for growth. Hotels world, we would expect it to see much worse than minus 10% by 2050. Why we don't see it? Because current NGFS scenarios don't include the acute physical risk that we realize much earlier, like disasters, than impacts of temperature increase. And when this I conclude, what we learned so far is that doing climate stress tests is important, is very important, but the way we do it, it's even more important. We need to be aware of the methodological challenges that we still face and work to address them. And this is crucial in order to, let's say, um, uh, align finance uh, but, uh, to sustainability but also allow us really to um, reallocate the capital that we uh, need to do the transition in the very short time that is left. And this we know from the last IPCC report, we have mostly five years left to make a big shift. And in this regard, financial risk assessment is crucial for capital reallocation, also in the case of climate. Thank you so much. So if you have questions, yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, when we are talking about the scenarios, so we think that uh, it is something that is happening, uh, that will happen sometime in the future. But uh, are we perhaps currently already living in a, a disorderly uh, transition scenario because the prices of uh, uh, fossil fuels have gone up, so the prices of carbon have gone up, and for example, for a fertilizer producing company that mimics the situation of a disorderly transition. So would you compare the current situation with the one where the uh, 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 climate transition has uh, started later, uh, too late and the companies have not adapted uh, to, to climate change or the, mm -hmm. the, the rise in fossil, fossil uh, fuel prices? Or no, thank you. This is a very uh, interesting question that allows me to clarify. Well, no, I will not fully compare because the drivers of the shock are different. So we are used to see shocks in energy commodity prices, which are actually driven by uh, exogenous events, uh, but are more or less uh, temporary. What we are expecting to see instead with, uh, in, an, in, a, in the case of the, we make the transition, this would entail a structural change in the economy. Which, not only, which means not only, okay, we will have a period of higher energy prices, but actually will lead some of the uh, companies uh, out of business. Because we know that if we, have to, if we want to stay within the two degrees target, fossil fuels uh, extraction and production should shrink. And we need to actually uh, have new ways to produce energy and electricity uh, that fuel our economy and probably also to use much less resources. Yeah, the perhaps is the, is the point here, because actually this is what also we expected uh, from the COVID recovery, you know, all the discussion about uh, uh, aligning the COVID recovery with the climate targets. Actually, if you look at a lot, uh, several uh, COVID recovery programs of countries uh, in Europe, uh, didn't really uh, uh, went like that, but let's hope that this time is different and uh, we could really use uh, this occasion, because I think that 
will be one of the last occasions we have. Yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, it was really useful. I have a couple of questions about the design of stress tests in this area, if I may. So one is about what we assume about the asset price falls that go into scenarios. It seems to be, you know, that to, to work out how much asset prices might fall in a disorderly transition, you need to know what's priced in today. So I'd be kind yeah. of keen on kind of your thoughts on how that calculation is done. The second thing, the thing that concerns me in the stress test that I've seen central banks putting out in this space so far is the scenarios run out decades in the future and we tend to assume that bank balance sheets will remain fixed, which seems like a very, it's obviously a crude assumption, but it also seems to risk overestimating the effects because in reality, you know, these are risks that are well known and well flagged banks will be able to reprice their balance sheets, move out of different asset lines. So I think this kind of fixed balance sheet assumption is potentially quite crude and problematic. No, it's a great questions both, and uh, please allow me to go beyond the 30 seconds left to, to reply. First question, very important indeed. So there is a big, I think that there is a confusion about, when we talk about, for instance, potential carbon-stranded assets, and we hear that they will be like uh, um, bi thought billion. Actually, this is based on analysis of exposure, meaning what is the value of uh, the price of stocks that banks, financial institutions, and individual investors have in these activities today. But, of course, you know, when we do uh, um, exposure, it's important to do climate financial risk assessment, but it's not financial risk assessment, so exposure doesn't mean losses. In order for this to occur, we need to have mispricing and adjustment in asset value. How we do so? The, well, I haven't included it in the, in the slides, but actually uh, we are presenting a paper in, uh, well, we work a lot on adjusting uh, valuation of both equity holdings, but in particular of corporate and sovereign bonds. And what we do is to actually uh, take the value today and adjust, adjust it based on the adjustment in the PDs of the firm conditioned to the scenarios. And uh, this is not simple because, I mean, it's a bit technical because if you consider a Merton model, then you have some assumptions that you have to relax, but it's possible to do this. But this, we have to, to be clear, I mean, exposure is something but doesn't mean losses. Uh, losses come if there is mispricing and uh, we could, uh, but already it's possible to look at how the financial valuation would adjust if we get to, uh, the financial valuation of a contract would adjust if a certain scenario realized. The second question, sorry, was about? It's really about the duration. So the duration, if we assume yeah. fixed balance sheets for decades long risks, that's yeah. quite problematic. So, standard stress test have a static balance sheet approach. However, uh, for instance, the work that we did recently with the, uh, with the ECB adopts a dynamic balance sheet approach. So we allow the balance sheet of the bank to uh, adjust uh, depending, of course, on the evolution of the economy and their uh, financial, risk, uh, financial risk assessment. However, this still resolves a lot of issues, a lot of points. For instance, banks may have insured against fossil fuel companies, so they might, or they have, could have edged against that, so they might have not, no incentives to uh, actually um, uh, disengage from fossil fuel companies. So there are <laughs> several, uh, this is one point well taken, there are already other, uh, also other points that we still, <laughs> we still need to consider. Okay, so then if there are no other questions, no other questions, okay. Could invite. Uh... Okay, so now we will have uh, two presentations and very old style, I think that I will <laughs> read the names of the, of the, um, 
of the presenters. So the first presentation uh, is by Jürg Miller, London School of Economics, uh, Preventing a Climate Minsky Moment, Environmental Financial Risk and Prudential uh, Exposure Limits. It's co-authored with Simon uh, Dickow, and both are London School of Economics. Uh, uh, Jürg, it's a great pleasure to have you today in the session. The, uh, you have 25 minutes. The floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Now we, well, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. It's a great honor. Uh, so yes, I'm uh, Hugh Miller at the London School of Economics, and together with my colleague, Dr. Simon Dikau, we have written a policy proposal for central banks, um, looking at how you could incorporate uh, transition risk into the prudential framework for banking supervision. Um, so today, uh, my presentation is sort of going to cover four main aspects, looking at the financial risks and challenges of a net zero transition, uh, how to identify and assess transition risks and establish exposure and materiality, and then look on how you design as a transition aligned uh, large exposures framework, and then finally look at the policy rationale considerations, next steps and calibration. So starting with the risks and challenges, um, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, there's sort of three main sort of types of risks are identified from climate-related financial risks. So physical risk from extreme weather events and chronic changes in weather patterns, transition risk, which is what, what we'll be focusing on today, which are the implications for the economy as a consequence of progressing towards a net zero economy. And finally, liability risk, which is typically seen as a subset of the other two types, where this financial conversation is sought from damages from climate change. Um, so within the transition risk, there are sort of three main drivers that are often identified. So this is climate policy, so for example, the implementation of the carbon tax, uh, technological advancement, so the uh, deployment of low carbon technologies, which may disrupt uh, the expected future cash flows of the currently established carbon intensive technologies. And finally, shifts in consumer investor preference as greater awareness of climate related issues may lead to sudden shifts in spending and investment. Um, so here we sort of done a, a stylized version of the um, potential sort of transmission channels for, uh, for these transition drivers and how they'll first affect the real economy through a, a, a stock and flow effect. So the flow effect will be um, increased costs and reduced revenue for companies that have misalignment between the drivers uh, and their business models and the stock effect with the potential revaluation of carbon intensive assets. And then these sort of lead into financial risks with your sort of conventional market operation and credit risks, as well as the possibility of stranded assets. And then also uh, sort of something that's sort of a bit less covered is the possibility of sort of transition pathway risk, where uh, through to uh, fault and metrics or increased understanding the transition pathway changes, uh, which uh, leads to potential risk and green risks, which are transition related risks, which specifically affects um, green firms um, in, and assets. And so, for challenges for central banks um, in terms of measuring transition risk, we sort of identified three key areas um, uh, for these risks. So first is, is the lack of data on climate related risks. So the lack of disclosing companies, the fact that you need forward looking data um, for this type of risk, uh, and the fact that it's very hard to quantify um, transition risk in a sort of single value. Um, secondly is, is, yeah, sort of a link to that is the unique characteristics of of climate risk, so looking at the fact that it's forward-looking, the endogeneity aspects, the deep uncertainty, and the, the long time horizon is typically considered in firms' business models and within financial supervision. And then lastly, which I know Dr. Ari Monastrelli also covered, was the these inter-industry differences in transition risk, the fact that the exposure to, to transition risk differs on a company and at an asset level, and therefore needs to be assessed as such. Um, uh, the NGFS have sort of come up with these sort of four high level uh, transition scenario narratives uh, within their framework and come up with uh, six individual scenarios, um, which has sort of been started to be used, you know, for climate stress testing and scenario analysis. Uh, and we're sort of looking about how these could be utilized within um, integrating into the prudential regime. Uh, so as our second sort of part of the presentation, we did a sort of example analysis of uh, the type of analysis central banks could conduct to establish materi materiality and exposure to transition risk and use it as a foundation uh, or a basis for uh, changing aspects of the prudential regime. 
Um, so we, we use the climate policy relevant sexes methodology developed by the Ferry Monsoro, among others, um, which uh, uses four digit NACE codes to identify six rich categories in economic activities, uh, going from fossil fuels to agriculture. And the selection criteria uh, of these sectors is direct and indirect contributions to GHG emissions, relevant for climate policy implementation and their role within the energy value chain. And from this, we use um, the TPI data sets and uh, include companies that would be classified under the CPRS methodology to do a threefold assessment. So um, initially, we look at uh, TPI's rating scale for management quality. So this is looking at uh, to what extent climate related uh, risks and aspects are included within uh, a business's um, sort of strategy and business model for each of the categories. It, it's worth mentioning that agriculture isn't included due to the lack of firms that are included in the TBI database, but the other five categories under CBRS are included. Um, so here, uh, the rating goes from zero to four star. Zero means that the company does not consider climate change as a business issue. Uh, four star means there is a, a fully adequate strategic assessment on climate change, which is integrated into its business model. Uh, and as you can see from the slides, 30% uh, of companies within these transition sensitive sectors score uh, a two or below, um, with 40% of the fossil fuel and building companies achieving this score, and only 10% uh, 10 companies in the sample disclosed a fully adequate strategic assessment on climate change out of 468 companies considered. Um, as, a, as the second step in our analysis, we looked at um, TPI's classification of company alignment to climate, poli the climate policy pathways. So this uh, was out of 292 companies in the sample that only 60, so that 62% either did not offer suitable disclosure or not aligned with any of the climate policy targets. Uh, the targets considered was 1.5 degrees below or at, you know, aligned with two degrees and, uh, and then thirdly aligned with a national or the Paris pledges. And we also find that 80% of uh, companies classified under the fossil fuel and building categories uh, do not uh, offer suitable disclosure or are not aligned with any of these uh, climate policy targets. And then finally, for those that were aligned, we did a, a further assessment looking at what we call decade of alignment. Uh, so this was looking at when companies were planning on aligning with uh, these climate policy pathways to look at whether there was potential backloading of climate commitments and how that may potentially expose them to transition risk in the near term. Um, so as you can see, 40 out of the 111 companies, so 36%, only became aligned after 2040, and 50% of companies in all risk categories except the energy intensive category would become aligned only after 2030, which means in the period between now and 2030, uh, a significant proportion of the companies assessed, which did have an alignment target, were only planning to align after 2030 um, timeframe, which would leave them ex potentially exposed to near-term transition risk. Um, so from the, so using this as a basis, we sort of uh, designed a, what we like to call a sort of transition aligned large exposure framework. Um, so for those of you who are unaware with the, the conventional large exposure framework, a large exposure is any exposure that can, uh, exceeds 10% of a bank's eligible capital uh, with regard to CET1 uh, or a monetary value over 300 million euros uh, as defined under Basel and firms are not permitted to have an exposure to a single counterparty or a group of connected counterparties which exceeds 25 percent of their eligible capital and groups of connected counterparties are determined on two conditions first is a control relationship in terms of ownership or other uh, legal contract which would uh, could be seen as controlling and the second would be economic interdependence which would mean that the failure of one would necessarily lead to the failure of the other um, counterparty. Um, and uh, large exposures are reported using uh, the NACE code system, uh, which is a classification system used to, uh, to identify the economic sector and activity of the counterparty. Um, so within this transition aligned large exposure framework, uh, you would map large exposures to the CPRS methodology um, to look at uh, aggregate uh, exposure to sort of transition sensitive sectors. Um, and banks would be subject to a large expression uh, sort of threshold 
um, of aggregate exposures to climate policy relevant sectors, uh, and we'd set the threshold at equivalent to 25% of their eligible capital, similar to the current large, conventional large exposures limits. However, this would be a soft threshold, which means if firms were to exceed the 25%, they would, um, they would be subject to a climate-related disclosure regime. Um, so the whole point of this is trying to pinpoint the banks um, that are most uh, potentially most exposed uh, to transition risk. Um, so on the disclosure regime, so yes, uh, let's just reiterate, this is for any firms or, or banks uh, that would be in excess of this 25% aggregate exposure. Um, uh, and they would be required to sort of submit a transition strategy. And we've identified three main components of this. So firstly would be banks would be required to identify uh, the identif identification of exposure to the main climate related risks and under which scenarios would have the most abrupt and severe impact on their portfolio. The second would be to project a sort of uh, portfolio exposure alignment uh, to climate policy targets uh, on the sort of aggregate sector level. And finally, a sort of forward looking strategy of how they might mitigate the potential risks uh, through their ex uh, portfolio exposure and how they've integrated climate risk into their risk management and governance processes. Um, so off, off the back of this disclosure, um, there would be several supervisory measures a financial supervisor could take if they felt that the climate related disclosure by banks was seen as insufficient for the level of exposure to transition risk. So initially we would look at uh, what we call a climate awareness course, which where senior management within the bank would be required to undergo a climate risk awareness course. The purpose of this is to try and improve the understanding of climate risk throughout a bank's operations and help them with the building capacity and integration of climate risk into throughout their operations. Uh, a second more um, uh, sort of a uh, bigger measure, which would be for maybe sort of repeated inadequate disclosure, would be looking at changes uh, to the board composition, placing limits on capital distributions, or requiring, requiring the hiring of climate experts um, throughout uh, various banking departments. And then finally, um, the sort of most strict measure that, su that financial supervisors could employ uh, would be a, a capital surge charge. Uh, we would envisage this being implemented through what the Bank of England would call pillar, pillar 2B, or I believe in the European context is often referred to as pillar 2G. Uh, this would be looking really at implementing it through the um, business model risk management and governance element of pillar 2 on the Basel. And we sort of envisage this capital surge charge would only would sort of be a final resort for consistent and adequate management and disclosure of climate related risks. Uh, so now on to the sort of policy rationale considerations, next steps and calibration. Uh, so the rationale for using a large exposures framework. So firstly, there is a necessary trade off between prudential rigor to mitigate the risk and the burdensomeness of requirements. So the cost of policy impact needs to be considered both for banks themselves and for the underlying corporates. So obviously, if you were to get every corporate to uh, um, disclose uh, intense climate related data, this might seem as uh, sort of unfairly burdensome on SMEs and could lead to financial exclusion, which is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and then sort of the other two reasons for using large exposures is firstly that conventional large exposures have potential implications for financial stability, hence the conventional large exposures regime, and therefore large exposures with unobserved climate risk propose a, uh, a greater threat to financial stability. Uh, and also said that, you know, through this regime, uh, 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 supervisors could look at the aggregate uh, sort of macro prudential level uh, of firm um, submissions to sort of look to influence macro um, prudential policy. Uh, and secondly, also the transition sensitive sectors tend uh, typically are concentrated by a small number of companies, hence that we envisage that a lot of the companies with potential transition risk are likely to already be captured by the large exposure framework. Um, so the strength of the policies is that it's a uh, qualitatively based and sort of forward-looking assessments that would overcome some of the challenges of trying to quantify climate risk with a sort of economic, specific economic value, um, but also it uh, looks at inter inter industry differences by doing a corporate level uh, assessment uh, and looking at the different assets. It also would incorporate um, data into supervisory judgment. So for instance, 
banks practices around data collection of climate data would be included in the supervisory assessment of how banks are managing their climate risk, uh, which would then help improve the current issues of lack of climate related data. And finally, the supervisory measures on disclosure, we've gone for a sort of a, more of a principle based flexible um, framework, which would allow supervisory judgment uh, and offer flexibility on whether to use capital buffers and things like that, as well as other measures for inadequate disclosure. So looking at the considerations, obviously the inclusion of green, green risk could be seen as quite controversial and could be seen to undermine support for the transition to a net zero economy. So the way that this was integrated in the supervisory judgment of firms climate related risk would need to be uh, very careful indeed. Also the the policy impact and the endogenous nature of climate risk means the adoption of this policy could uh, to mitigate transition risk may actually cause a materialization of transition risk and hence why we've gone for this rather flexible and proportional approach rather than going for sort of a fixed uh, capital add-on or an adjustment through pillar one uh, minimum capital requirements um, and finally this sort of soft versus hard hard limit approach um, again we sort of done that to sort of avoid this endogenous to the climate risk but have it the soft approach could be seen as an insufficient deterrent in the long term to encourage banks to incorporate transition risk into their business models um, so looking at next steps and policy calibration so the, the first step for central banks would be to better understand the exposure so this would be to do the uh, sort of type of analysis that i showed you earlier to determine banks exposure to transition sensitive sectors using the cprs methodology within their large exposures Secondly, would be to estimate the cost and feasibility of companies within different sectors, uh, ability to transition, particularly with a particular focus on the hard to abate sectors, more to understand the sectoral differences um, with regard to transition risk. And finally, to examine exposures in banks, non-large exposures, to ensure that a significant proportion of the risk wasn't being missed through this policy. The second step would then be to build capacity. So this would be improving the reporting of NACE codes uh, for, to ensure the accurate identification of climate policy relevant sectors, as I believe that NACE code reporting is a non-blocking validation factor at this moment, which means that four-digit NACE codes are not required within banked regulatory reporting. And secondly, would be to hire sector experts within financial super supervisory authorities to understand the uh, sector and uh, inter-industry differences in, uh, in transition risk and the, those sector-specific risks. And then finally, off the, off the back of this would be develop supervisory tools. Uh, so, you know, designing and creating the climate awareness calls, um, establishing thresholds, risk thresholds for when uh, measures such as change to board composition, risk management and restriction capital distributions would be um, and it, uh, uh, implemented. And finally, how uh, the methodology and calculation of a potential uh, capital size charge through Pillar 2G. Um, Thank you very much for listening to our, our presentation. Please give me questions if you've got further questions, but obviously happy to take any questions now with the Q&A. So thank you so much, and I will take advantage of the fact that I am the moderator of this session to uh, make a clarification on the climate policy relevant sectors that you are using and have uh, a first question, and then I will uh, uh, open the floor. So the climate policy relevant sector classification used here is the main level, the one that was used, for instance, by the ECB already in 2019. Uh, one suggestion is uh, to uh, maybe use the CPRS2 and the granular one that we will publish uh, uh, in two weeks. So it will be public available as the CPRS1 because in this way, so you have a strong point, which is actually improved sector identification and uh, intra-industry -ind differences. With CPRS main, it's very difficult to do this. With CPRS granular will be straightforward, so we will <laughs> make aware, and this will be, I think, a big improvement. Also, and also allow to compare what do we gain with higher level of granularity of this information. And, but in this, in this regard, and this is also an issue then, uh, and a question for central banks, I mean, we need asset level information and access to asset level information because the work that we did for developing CPRS granular was massive manual work because machine learning doesn't always help and uh, in order to be replicated uh, and uh, put it at scale uh, we really 
need central banks and financial regulators to uh, help and provide us uh, to plant level uh, data. And then I have another, just another question. What is the value of exposure that you find? Um, so, uh, so to answer the sort of first bit on CPRS, um, I absolutely agree that you need asset level data. Uh, I, within current large exposure reporting, obviously that's done at the corporate level. Yeah. So you would need maybe a, and then for the initial classification, you'd need maybe a, a less granular methodology, but then you would inc uh, include your more granular CBRS granular methodology within the bank's disclosure requirements to then get the asset level information yeah. for supervisors to then make yeah. that assessment. Uh, in terms of uh, exposure, unfortunately, so I, I used to work at the, the Bank of England, I, I did the assessment there, but I can't actually share it, so I can't say that, and I wasn't allowed to publicly use the data for this assessment, so we use TBI as a proxy, okay. but we don't actually have the data on, on, ha on the level of exposure within uh, banks' large exposures. However, I believe the 2019 study you just referenced to reference the ECB study, use large exposures as part of that CPRS methodology study. And so our sort of advocate for central banks is okay, so do the commercial assessment to, us, to establish exposure and materiality. Okay, so it should be comparable. Great, great work. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, okay. We have a question. Thank you very much. Sorry for uh, asking twice. Uh, however, uh, well, we at the Croatian National Bank and I'm coming from Croatian National Bank have replicated your analysis uh, using the CPRS. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, there, are, uh, there is a cr uh, climate risk that is incorporated uh, in uh, uh, loans toward, towards households, housing loans, and what about them? Uh, so uh, here we talk only about uh, the loans to non-financial co corporates, but uh, there is also a climate risk exposure related to the housing loans and to, to the other loans uh, to the households. Um, excellent question. Uh, thank you very much for asking that, because that is something that I have uh, actually thought a lot about when I was at the Bank of England and, and since. Um, so, firstly, just to clarify, this would be this policy is just focusing on the transition risk elements and wouldn't be accounting for physical risk. So physical risk would be you need separate other policies in order to account for. Uh, and on the on the transition risk with regards to households, um, I think it's you know it's it's very important. But uh, obviously, the housing sector is a very different um, uh, sort of structure compared to the other transition sensitive sectors in terms of obviously everyone owns a house rather than the other sectors are typically dom dominated by a few big players and therefore for the housing sector you kind of need different rules of the game and a different policy in order to look at that. So I know there's been some evidence to suggest that um, uh, houses with uh, uh, better insulation and things like that uh, have a you know, and greater energy efficiency have a, a lower default rate than those that don't. And so I've, that could be an evidence base to potentially have a sort of gr green supporting factor to encourage uh, individual homeowners to um, put in energy efficient measures such as double glazing, uh, you know, insulation and things like that to try and then lower the trend, you know, that sort of transition risk. But I think that needs to be done because of this difference in market structure. You need a separate policy specifically for the housing sector um, and maybe more of an incentive based approach. Uh, with, you know, um, uh, coordination with treasuries rather than uh, through the large exposure regime. Thank you. We have another question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and I, I work in the Central Bank of Spain, so, but in financial innovation, not in supervision. But I would like to take the position also to think about combining your two works, Irene and Hugh. Um, can we afford to go for a soft threshold and to delay the prudential requirements? Or can we include this, Irene, in your model of double materiality or thinking about the dynamic balance sheet? You know, can we include this variable to quantify a potential delay in the prudential requirements? I do not work in supervision, <laughs> and that's my disclaimer. May I go first to you, and then I leave it to you? Of course. <laughs> well, this is indeed what we are 
planning to do with the new work uh, with uh, Laura Parisi. Actually, we are planning to apply the CPRS granular mapping uh, young variables, so NACE codes, young variables into CPRS granular in order to have a better uh, assessment of the adjustment in, uh, in uh, firm sectoral and sectoral PDs and then translate them in the adjustment in financial valuation and translate them in the adjustment in uh, um, cost of capital in the integrated in the stock flow consistent agent based model that we use with the central bank and look at uh, what are, I mean, how different ways of implementing green in prudential, macro prudential regulation, like there are other system, I mean, you can use uh, in the approach proposed by you, you can sim easily go on and uh, use it for systemic buffer. So use CPRS granular as threshold exposure for deciding systemic buffer and look at what would happen in the economy, how would the economy and the banking sector would respond to, to that. Oh, this is what we're planning. <laughs> I, I, we are thinking of, uh, of doing. You? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, both the approaches are, are very compatible. Uh, and yeah, exactly as Irene said, I think you could use this aggregate version to for systemic risk buffers. Uh, and in terms of this sort of soft and hard approach, like do we have time for this soft approach? I think it's, I, don't, I, don't, I would argue that uh, a soft approach isn't necessarily going to delay capital requirements, but it would just be more up to the individual financial supervisors. And I think if you used it on a model basis and just automatically implemented capital requirements on this basis, it would have a number of implications. So firstly would be that the policy implementation could have unintended consequences for financial stability and a sudden sort of sell off of carbon intensive assets within the banking sector. Secondly, you would run the risk of just moving these assets from the banking sector to the shadow banking sector, where there's less regulation and it's much more opaque and you wouldn't actually be de-risking the financial system. Because um, ultimately, you don't want uh, you want uh, mobilization of, of capital allocation, but within the non-financial corporates themselves, not within banks, because um, that's the way that you're actually going to get corporates to decarbonize. Um, so I think using this more flexible approach also allows you to take into account um, these very uh, sort of granular asset level differences between companies, um, and to sort of have a more understanding of you know the forward-looking perspective in terms of underlying corporates transition plans and these sort of things rather than a sort of hard approach it would be much much harder to ensure that you've exactly accounted for all these within a model um, and especially with model variability it would be very hard to ensure that the transition risk is fully accounted for okay there are other two questions okay uh who goes first you just okay A very quick question. I've been in listening to the presentations. The, I believe the consequence of your suggestions would be to sharply increasing the cost of financial intermediation, and therefore we would see because at the end of the, if you if you lower risk or increase capital or whatever you by definition make financial services more expensive. So the question is, that of course will come, create a significant political backlash. So if supposing the policy authorities were to listen to your proposals, what is your strategy for dealing with the political backlash that would inevitably result from what you want? Oh gosh, okay, that's, that's, that's a good question in terms of the political backlash. I mean, in terms of, yeah, the, the you know, cost of, uh, of financial intermediation, I mean, that is uh, a very good point. And that's why I, we've gone for a more targeted approach looking at large exposures, so looking at just the largest corporates rather than applying it to the entirety of the bank's balance sheet, which would, you know, in, increase uh, the cost of financial services for all, all firms uh, and definitely could lead to sort of financial exclusion and much greater political backlash. I guess our hope is here is by having this much more targeted approach based on the corporates which have, you know, offer the, uh, the greatest threat to financial stability, that central banks would argue that this is within their financial stability mandate to ensure that, um, to ensure that, you know, transition risks don't derail 
uh, in the future, the financial sector. Uh, and whilst, yeah, they might be at the corporate level of political backlash, I would imagine that they're also at the, maybe the individual level, there'll be a lot of support for central banks to make sure that uh, we do not uh, uh, face um, the consequences of not incorporating climate risk into the prudential regime. Thank you. We have cool. another question. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. So I have a, a slightly related question. So I must admit the, the, the idea of introducing a green surcharge into capital requirements at the moment seems a little bit dangerous to me. So I'm, I do agree that there are, you know, important financial impacts of the transition that we, you know, we're still trying to understand. I think the case for this being an actual financial stability risk really hasn't been made, as far as I'm concerned, just yet. So if we were to kind of think about it, you know, layering into the capital requirements framework some kind of climate elements, that would seem to be going beyond what, what we normally think of as the purpose of capital requirements, which really is about financial stability, and really using these requirements as a surrogate for a carbon price, which would be a kind of a superior instrument. I think there are additional reasons why just putting this into kind of bank capital requirements could actually be counterproductive. It will shift risks out of banks into markets in a way that will, will be harder to understand. So interested in your thoughts on, on that as the, some of the pitfalls of going down this, this route. Um, no, and I, I think you're completely right. And I, I, I feel like I maybe slightly touched on this earlier. Um, that's the whole point of a, a proportional framework and not having a, a model that exactly did, like, uh, increases capital requirements. Uh, sort of verbatim, but more having a supervisory approach that you wouldn't, you know, if financial supervisors aren't convinced that there's a financial stability risk based on the exposure of materiality, they wouldn't necessarily have to act. They wouldn't have to implement, you know, as I said in my presentation, the, this capital surge charge is as a last resort. Uh, and it's much more about work, engaging with banks, working, you know, understanding their understanding of climate risk and how they've integrated it into their you know risk management processes so under this framework you know a bank could have uh, sort of a very large exposure to transition sensitive sectors however if it's got adequate risk management practices in place if it shows that it's collecting data from those um, necessary non-financial corporates on potential sort of climate risk on their transition strategy and they can then satisfy financial supervisors that look, there isn't a risk here because we're, you know, we're managing the climate risk adequately. There would be no financial supervisory action on that basis. And so it's not just saying, oh yeah, you use this, you implement capital requirements and that then, you know, uh, to try and force banks to sort of stop lending to certain sectors, you know, actually we need more uh, capital allocated to these sectors to help finance their transition. Um, so that's, so I would sort of disagree that this um, regime, you know, this sort of policy proposal does do that. I would say, you know, if we were saying, you know, changing risk rates through pillar one or doing a, a sort of fixed add-on just based on exposure, then yes, you would be absolutely right. But I think because we have this more flexible proportional approach um, and that the capital surcharge is a sort of last resort, it's not having that, that effect that you described. Okay, are there other questions? Yeah, one. Thanks for the very interesting presentation. I think very eloquent. And some the questions I've already actually tackled some I wanted to ask. Um, so I have one remaining one I didn't, uh, that didn't get addressed yet, and that's banks increasingly are, are focusing on transition plans. Um, so you'd already accurately noted that sometimes they're quite back backloaded in terms of the uh, Paris alignment. One of the questions here is this missing technology problem, though. How do we deal with that? So there's this lock-in risk if firms are too... Uh, some, some, some industries like aviation simply don't have the technology to comply with climate targets currently if they're to retain their, their current revenue basis. What do we do about that? Do we have some, some issues in terms of setting upfront requirements now for risks that we want to be managed in the future, potentially with a little bit of a lag? Um, so that, that's a very good question, and that's why, uh, yeah, as part of my presentation, I sort of noted that central banks should look at the cost and feasibility on a sector-specific 
um, to, to look at the feasibility of transitioning at the moment and becoming aligned so that certain sectors were not sort of unfairly punished for not being able to align. Um, I think on that, yeah, you need to, you know, yeah, for aviation, for example, it is very hard to align with a temperature target. So you, you, that's why you would take a, a risk-based approach rather than an alignment-based approach. Um, i just quickly explain the difference. An alignment-based approach would be uh, uh, conducting financial supervision purely on the basis of whether an aggregate portfolio was aligned. A risk-based approach would be take in the reference the alignment of the aggregate portfolio, but would have additional measures and more qualitative measures to understand how the banks are managing this risk. So, you, you know, they, not all their exposures need to be aligned. And for, for the example of aviation, you know, they banks would disclose the fact that aviation companies find it very hard to be aligned, but they would show maybe the fact that they're doing the best in class and taking measures and taking that into account in their business model. Uh, and that actually the risk, to, the transition risk to aviation might be much less than the transition risk to other sectors because you don't have this technology alternative. Does that make sense? You know, I think it makes sense and also opens some discussions about, uh, I mean, the distributive impacts uh, because according to net zero scenarios, emissions in the aviation sector should decline by 90%. So who will be able to still fly then? <laughs> That's, uh, who will be allowed, sorry, to fly then? Okay, if there are no other questions, we can move to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Hugh, again, uh, for, your, for your presentation and your work. So the next presentation uh, is joint work uh, by Cayola, uh, van der Molen uh, and Zhang, and it's real estate and climate transition risk, a financial stability pr uh, perspective. Today we have with us uh, Rem Remco van der Molen from uh, Dutch National Bank. Remco, the floor is yours. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you very much. And um, I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to be here and to be able to present uh, in, this, uh, in this seminar. So thanks also for the, uh, to the organizers for, uh, for, having us, for having me. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, I, will, uh, I will take a rather practical uh, point of view. I will present uh, recent work uh, in climate stress testing that we did at uh, the Nederlandse Bank. Um, and um, so actually uh, in presenting it, so I will focus, uh, I will present the results, of course, but also uh, uh, share some of the experiences and challenges that we faced. And, um, and actually, I think there are quite a lot of links to, to the, the, the two previous uh, uh, presentations. So maybe to, uh, um, to set the scene. So the, the work that we have done uh, at the Nederlands Bank uh, related to climate stress testing is basically um, summarized in, in the, these three uh, studies. Um, the first uh, energy transition stress test was actually already published in 2017 and uh, a paper based on it uh, was published later. Um, as follow-up work, uh, we started, uh, uh, so for, uh, uh, the first project only, uh, only dealt with transition risk um, and in the follow-up uh, study, we also um, took on board an uh, analysis of physical risk, so uh, more specifically a flood, flood uh, stress test. And uh, what I will focus on today mainly is the third um, uh, paper, which uh, takes, uh, uh, focuses more on real estate and uh, uh, climate transition risks, especially in, in real estate. Um, now, just to sketch where we where we uh, came from, so the the first the initial energy transition stress test that we did uh, was actually uh, uh, so back in 2017, really a first attempt to quantify uh, energy transition risk for the financial system. Um, so, uh, like Irene said, that's uh, that's already uh, uh, six years ago. So, so a lot has happened since then. Uh, so, I think this uh, this was really. Uh, uh, like I said, an initial attempt. So, um, um, for example, um, we had to think about scenarios. Uh, we came up with uh, with uh, these four scenarios based on uh, two two drivers: climate policy and energy technology. Um, so, this is, I think, uh, uh, to a certain extent, um, also uh, um, similar to um, 
the NGFS scenarios that have, have since developed. Um, but this is basically where we came from. Um, and also, I think uh, one of the challenges that we faced back then, um, and I think are also now much more, let's say, uh, uh, common, is that, uh, that we use a combination of macroeconomic and also industry-specific modeling based on, uh, on NACE codes. Um, in this, uh, uh, in, so the initial stress test that we, that we did, uh, we, um, we took the following approach. Um, I think also by now, uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, what, is, uh, um, what is used by, uh, by others. So first uh, start with the scenario design. How do, do these scenarios feed into um, a macroeconomic model? And also at a, a look at the uh, industry level, how exactly um, uh, at, at, an, at a four digit NACE level, the industries are affected and are uh, vulnerable to uh, transition risk. Um, then map that into exposures of uh, financial institutions. Actually, uh, it was uh, uh, um, a sector-wide stress test. So it was based uh, on the exposure of both banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. Um, and uh, as a final step, uh, see how that, uh, how that would, uh, could lead to financial stress in our, let's say, um, standard stress testing model. Um, very briefly then, what did we find? Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I think that uh, some of the points I want to highlight is that uh, um, uh, some of the, the, uh, the main results that are, I think, also still relevant today is that uh, we see quite a lot of um, uh, differences between the different scenarios and also between the different sectors in terms of impact. Um, so that's the first thing I, uh, 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 <clears throat> that we learned from this. A, a second point is that uh, there is also a large impact of macro financial factors on top of carbon sensitivity. So for example, if you look at the exposures of banks on the most carbon intensive sectors, uh, these exposures are uh, relatively limited. Um, and uh, you see that, that also macro financial factors are important, and this is uh, even more uh, so the case for insurance companies and pension funds. Um, you also see that uh, we focus here on the uh, on the impact on uh, assets. Um, now, uh, if you would look at these uh, impact and supervisory ratios, I think the, uh, what we found is that the impact seemed to be manageable. Um, but um, I think we also learned from this is that um, the uh, impact on supervisory ratios um, uh, is, let's say, a step further than just looking at the impact on assets, uh, which is especially the case for, for insurers and, and uh, pension funds, because uh, uh, there also the impact on the liabilities is, uh, uh, is important. Um, but also given uh, the, um, uh, the long time horizons and also the, um, uh, let's say, the uh, slightly problematic assumption of a, of a, of a constant balance sheet. Um, we also uh, found that it's actually important to focus on the, uh, on the asset impact uh, even more than, than on the supervisory ratios as such. So this is just to very briefly sketch where we came from and what the, let's say, the main uh, takeaways uh, were from the, uh, uh, from the previous uh, stress test. Now, um, let me continue with uh, the more recent work that we did, uh, where we decided basically to focus on real estate exposures. Um, actually, there are two reasons for that. The first, uh, the first reason is actually from a financial stability perspective. Um, real estate is a uh, very important uh, uh, asset class for Dutch finance institutions. So both residential and commercial uh, real estate exposures of banks, insurance companies, and pension funds are large, um, but also on the, uh, on the, uh, on the house, household sector side, um, we, uh, we see that, uh, uh, that properties and uh, the related mortgages form an important part of their balance sheets uh, with uh, the, the implication that uh, also the, uh, the macroeconomic uh, impact may be substantial. The other reason for looking at real estate is that uh, actually, in the initial stress test that we did, so the uh, first energy transition stress test, we didn't pay attention to real estate uh, at all. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, that was an, uh, an important omission. And uh, we wanted to, let's say, as an additional analysis, also look into that. 
but real, real estate is also important from a, uh, let's say, from a climate perspective because it has a sizable carbon, fo carbon footprint. I think for the Netherlands, it's uh, depending on how exactly you define, it's between 15 and 20 percent of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and um, another thing is that uh, real estate is also clearly uh, vulnerable to both physical and transition risks. And um, uh, since we also wanted to um, um, to assess physical risks, um, this was also an, an important reason for us to look into real estate. Um, maybe to to uh, to underpin uh, the first point, so the importance of real estate from a financial stability perspective. Uh, what this what this figure tells you is that uh, uh, that actually um, real estate exposures form a substantial part of the uh, of the of the asset side of, uh, of Dutch financial institutions. Uh, so for banks, it's almost forty percent, uh, and for uh, and non banks, it's around fifteen percent. Um, a lot of it is uh, is 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 mortgage loans, um, but also uh, commercial real estate. Uh, loans and investments, especially for insurance companies and uh, and pension funds. So for um, for us, this was uh, all the more the reason to um, look into uh, real estate in more detail. Um, now, if we do that, um, we of course need data, um, and um, ideally, we need data at the asset level or at the property level. Um, so there was a there was a need for very highly granular data um, on the financial assets themselves. So the assets on the uh, on the balance sheets of the financial institutions that are related to real estate, um, but also on the underlying properties. Um, and uh, third, uh, we also wanted to look into uh, the uh, the uh, the consequences for uh, for the household sector. Um, so we also uh, wanted to link. Um, these um, um, th this gr granular data to um, characteristics of the owners of uh, of houses. Um, so basically, we combined a lot of uh, different data sources, uh, which was uh, uh, um, an interesting um, learning exercise in itself. Um, so combining uh, supervisory data, um, basically uh, loan level data on uh, RRE CRE loans. Um, line by line reporting by insurance and, and uh, insurers and pension funds. Um, also, we did an ad hoc data collection to basically uh, um, to uh, enrich the the the, the uh, um, supervisory data from insurers and pension funds. Um, we combined that with a lot of administrative data on buildings in the Netherlands and uh, Dutch households, and um, also let's say more on the on the um, Technology uh, side and on the physical side, uh, we also um, used a lot of expert uh, knowledge from uh, from uh, from colleagues at uh, at other institutions within the, within the Netherlands. So, for example, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, who have very detailed information on the um, energy characteristics of uh, of buildings and also on uh, the. Um, the, the technology that is uh, uh, that is needed um, to, um, for example, to retrofit buildings, um, and also we used, uh, um, for example, the uh, carbon risk real estate monitor. I will come back to that later. Um, so in the end, we uh, we we combined a lot of different sources um, into uh, into a data set. Um, now I think from this um, um, basically. Uh, th th this was driven by, by actually by, by by two questions. I think one is to what extent are we able, uh, as as a central bank, uh, as a supervisor, to um, collect this data ourselves and to our, to do our own assessments. But it was also an important check to see to what extent uh, financial institutions had access to this information. So, for example, if we asked them for detailed information on the uh, on their uh, um, real estate portfolios. Uh, we found quite a lot of differences in the extent to which these uh, these institutions were able to uh, to provide us with this information. Um, now, focusing on transition risk, uh, basically we um, uh, we had two main questions there. So the first one is 
to what extent are the real estate exposures of the Dutch financial sector vulnerable to climate transition risks? Um, and uh, the second question is, okay, so if we know that there is transition risk, how can we translate this into a measure of financial risk? Um, so the, um, um, the, the methodology that we, uh, uh, that we uh, took is, more, is uh, uh, we use different scenarios for, for the energy, energy transition. Um, so, um, yeah, actually, I think this is also more like a scenario analysis than a full-fledged stress test. Um, and then the first step we took is to identify the um, exposures at risk. So basically, um, uh, the extent to which the underlying properties uh, do not meet uh, energy uh, or, or climate-related regulations or requirements um, that are already in place or uh, that we assume in certain scenarios. Um, and uh, so if, if a property, for example, in the Netherlands, we have a, a regulation that as of next year, all office buildings need to have a minimum uh, energy label of level C. Now, all the office buildings that, uh, that do not meet that requirement are, 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 uh, are at risk um, as, of, uh, as, of, uh, as of next year. Um, so after, um, um, like I said, identifying whether exposures are at risk uh, gives you an idea of, uh, uh, of the, um, the size of transition risks, uh, but then um, trying, to, um, um, trying to translate that into financial risk, um, we take, we, we actually use two, two different methodologies. Um, so the first one is um, uh, basically um, computing how much uh, needs to be invested um, to make uh, the uh, buildings to uh, to make the buildings Paris proof, um, and uh, the second methodology is basically uh, uh, it, it, suppose that uh, you don't do any retrofitting, so you leave the buildings as they are. Um, then uh, uh, they will uh, emit too much carbon, uh, but instead of retrofitting, you basically pay for the excess carbon emissions. So I think these two approaches are, uh, are used in the literature and very much also, I think, depending on, on, on the data that is available, um, uh, which, one, uh, which one you prefer. Um, and uh, so basically we have used uh, uh, both of them and uh, I, will, uh, I will show you some of the results from this, uh, from this analysis. Um, so first, um, on the domestic real estate exposures. So that is typically, uh, uh, we had a lot of information on, uh, on uh, retrofitting options and retrofitting costs for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, buildings in the Netherlands. So that's why for, for the domestic real estate, we, um, um, we chose this approach. Um, but first, when we look at exposure at risk, um, we find that, uh, uh, well, uh, of course, different uh, policy options can have a large impact on the exposure at risk. So, for example, what we have, uh, we, we have, of course, looked at different scenarios. Um, you see that in a, um, in a, in a, uh, the light blue uh, bars on the, uh, on, on, on the left is a relatively um, uh, mild uh, or not too ambitious uh, policy scenario. Um, and there you see that already for example, for residential mortgages, uh, almost 30% of uh, the residential mortgages are at risk um, between, uh, between now and, uh, and 2030. Um, now, to give you uh, an, 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 uh, an idea that 30% uh, uh, is, that, is that a lot or not, um, uh, we, well, we actually think it's quite, quite a lot. I mean, it would, have, it would mean that uh, uh, almost a third of all um, uh, all owner-occupied houses would have to be retrofitted uh, uh, before 2030 uh, in order to, uh, um, um, to basically avoid this, uh, this risk, um, which is quite a, quite a large number and which will also require uh, uh, quite an, in, uh, an, uh, an increase compared to the current, uh, the current uh, um, speed. Uh, but what, what you can also see is that if the, um, uh, if the um, minimum label requirement would be more ambitious, um, then uh, the share of um, uh, the share of exposure at risk would uh, would also uh, increase quite uh, quite strongly. Um, 
So this also, this also means that um, there's large uncertainty depending on uh, uh, what policy will be uh, actually um, in place. Uh, so I think uh, in the Netherlands, and, and uh, th this may also be the case in many other countries, so there are, let's say, long-term goals, uh, which are, let's say, uh, set by the, uh, uh, by the Paris Agreement, but how exactly they will, uh, will be transferred into, let's say, more specific uh, targets and requirements uh, or prices, um, that is still, uh, still often very unclear, and that may have a large impact on the, uh, on the, uh, actually on the transition risk. Um, so what we also did is then look at uh, the, um, the investments that need to be made in order to uh, make all buildings in the Netherlands zero emission. So that's basically the 2050 target that the government has set. All, all buildings need to be zero, zero emission. Um, and um, um, we, we developed different scenarios for, um, uh, for assessing the, uh, the total uh, investment that is needed to get there. Um, so I, I will not go into the details of these scenarios, but may, uh, so, so for example, the, the, uh, the, uh, the scenario with the highest cost, it's, uh, it's called heat pumps. So this is a situation where basically there is no, um, there is no uh, let's say, government strategy or government plan or local government uh, infrastructure, uh, but basically each and every building owner has to, uh, um, has to um, make his uh, uh, building zero emission by, uh, let's say, individually. Um, so this is actually the, uh, um, um, the, most, costly, the most costly option. Um, and, and on the other hand, you have a scenario where green gas would be uh, available at large scale, uh, something that will not be the case uh, in, uh, uh, very, very soon, but um, it, it, it is a possibility. And there you see that, uh, uh, especially for the Netherlands, uh, all the infrastructure is already there. So there, the, let's say the, the, the investments would be, um, would be uh, substantially smaller. Um, so it very much depends on the uh, on the scenario what the investments will be. Um, well, it, um, if we if we look at the uh, um, uh, since it's a stress test type of exercise, if we look at the uh, let's say more extreme case, then we see that the uh, um, that building owners need to make substantial retrofitting investments. Um, and um, then the question, of course, is so what does that mean for the uh, for the value of the property? Um, and that's actually a, a, a difficult, difficult question to answer. Uh, I think that already came up uh, um, during this, the discussion of one of the previous presentations. So first of all, you would have to know to what extent is the, um, the current energy status of the building already priced in. Um, uh, <clears throat> but uh, there, are, there are more complications. Uh, uh, so for example, um, not all the measures may have a, a uh, or we know that not all the measures actually have a positive business case. So in, in some, some cases, these investments are simply costs. Um, and um, um, so for, for homeowners, you could, for example, um, assume that uh, uh, an investment with a positive business case would in principle lead to an increase in the value of the house. Um, but for, um, uh, for investors who, uh, uh, Let's say for landlords, it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's it's more tricky um, because there it's it's not an, it's not entirely clear whether the landlord is also able to reap the benefits of the investments or whether it's actually the tenant who will reap the benefits. So, um, in let's say trying to uh, get from the investments to an impact on the property value, uh, that is. Uh, uh, that is still a, uh, actually a step that we did not make uh, because there were uh, basically too many, uh, too many questions surrounding it. Um, one aspect of this is also that uh, these investments have to be financed, right? Um, and, and what we found is that uh, uh, for uh, more than half of the homeowners, uh, that they don't have sufficient own funds um, to finance this investment. Um, so. We looked at each uh, individual, uh, uh, each individual homeowner, 
the required investment for uh, his or her uh, property uh, and compare that to the available, uh, available uh, savings. And then we found that, uh, that in 50% of the cases, that's not enough. Um, and uh, digging a bit deeper into this financing issue, we also find that, so these households that, um, uh, so uh, that's what you see here on the, uh, on the, on the left, um, we have uh, for the different uh, income quantiles, we have uh, shares of homeowners and the ability to finance their, um, uh, their retrofitting investment. And what we find is that uh, uh, typically uh, the higher income households have, uh, have sufficient savings to, uh, um, to finance this investment. And especially at the lower incomes, uh, their uh, um, savings are insufficient, but also borrowing capacity is actually uh, not sufficient to, uh, to finance the, um, uh, the, uh, the required investment. Um, also for uh, commercial real estate, financing may, may be problematic. Uh, I think that was a bit more difficult for us to, uh, to assess, but what we see here is uh, on, the, on the right, you see that um, in, in, in quite a lot of cases, retrofitting uh, investments are very substantial compared to the value of the collateral. So what we see here is that, uh, for example, uh, in, in residential, uh, that uh, uh, almost 20% um, of, the, um, of the properties have uh, uh, require investment, an, an amount of investment that is larger than 15% of the protection value. Um, now, it's hard to, it's hard to difficult, uh, it, it's hard to determine case by case whether that investment is worthwhile for the owner uh, and whether, for example, uh, 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 financing uh, is going to be problematic for that specific investment. But let's say the, the sheer size of these investments does suggest that this, that this can clearly be, be, become an issue. Um, then going to the uh, international real estate exposures. Um, so that's mainly uh, investments, real estate investments. Uh, by, uh, by pension funds and insurance companies. So there, uh, what we did is basically um, uh, used the um, uh, decarbonization pathways developed by the uh, carbon risk real estate monitor. Um, so basically they have, uh, uh, depending on the, on the starting point of a, of a country and a sector, they determine uh, uh, how the, uh, the, uh, what the decarbonization pathway needs to be in order to be uh, in line with uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, and um, uh, based on that, uh, we can, for example, see uh, um, that um, in, uh, in, in, some <coughs> uh, in some countries there are uh, large exposures. For example, if you look at uh, in, the, in, the, in the top left corner, uh, we see that uh, the Dutch uh, um, in financial institutions have uh, quite substantial exposure on uh, U.S. residential real estate, um, and we also see that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, re the reduction requirement uh, uh, for that sector in the U.S. is, uh, is uh, quite large. So this gives, uh, gives us a nice overview of, let's say, where the, where the challenges are. Um, and um, we, we also, again, looked at the um, exposure at risk. So, uh, to the share of exposures that will, uh, uh, that will not be uh, Paris proof. Uh, so that basically does not, uh, is not um, uh, in line with the decarbonization pathway suggested by the, uh, by the CREM uh, tool. Um, and of course there, uh, uh, we also look at uh, different scenarios. So there's basically a two degree scenario and a 1.5 degree scenario. Uh, what we see is that uh, again, the exposure at risk are substantial. Uh, so 35 to 45%, depending on the scenario. Um, note also that this is the, uh, the light blue part is between now and 2030, uh, which is uh, 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 in, 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 let's say, real estate, um, seven years is not very long, right? So, so it's, it's really quite, a, quite substantial. Um, as a next step... Sorry, may uh, we ask you to shortly get to the conclusion? Yes, yes, I will. Um, just to briefly show you that uh, when we look at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the value of, of, of excess emissions, um, so um, 
if, uh, if a building does not meet the reduction target or is not in line with the decarbonization pathway, uh, it will lead to excess emissions. Um, and uh, the, the excess carbon emissions uh, in, uh, in, in the two scenarios are, in the, uh, in, in, are depicted here in the, um, <clears throat> in the, in the graph. Um, and now the cost of, um, uh, so, so in a, in a 1.5 degree scenario, uh, uh, obviously the, uh, the excess emissions will be higher, uh, but also the price of carbon will be substantially higher. So this is based on, uh, on the NG, uh, NGFS. Um, so um, that means that the net present value of excess carbon costs uh, can be sizable. And uh, we computed it for a subset of the, of the exposures and we found that it's in the order of uh, uh, 35 to 60% of the property value, depending on the scenario. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to say about the transition uh, uh, risk uh, study that we did. Uh, I, I will just mention that we also uh, uh, did an, a stress test uh, on, a, uh, uh, on a flood uh, risk in the, a flood risk in the Netherlands. Uh, also, again, using uh, uh, location information, um, and um, uh, in this case, we did uh, uh, we did um, uh, develop a, a full-fledged stress test because uh, let's say damage, damage functions for floods were let's say readily available. In that sense, that's a for us at least, it was an important difference between the physical risk and the transition, transition risk part, uh, where in the transition risk part, it was much more difficult to find actually, um, let's say, uh, damage functions um, to, uh, to measure the, uh, the financial impact. Um, so I will not value with these results. So my main takeaways, <clears throat> scenario analysis and stress testing are clearly valuable tools uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this field. Um, there are many issues. One of the important ones is that uh, is, is, is data gaps. Uh, so we need, uh, it, it has also been said by Irene, we need asset level information. Um, well, we have taken some steps, I think, in this, uh, in this uh, exercise to, to get there. Uh, and it's quite, uh, but we, we also find that it's quite a challenge to find, uh, let's say, the, the data at the, uh, at the um, level of granularity that is, that is needed. Um, also, identifying exposure at risk is a first step, uh, but then uh, assessing the impact on asset valuations is, is quite a challenge. Um, I think also one of the lessons that we, that we take is that we combine, combine various models and approaches uh, rather than, than trying to come up with a single best model. Um, and um, so we're not there yet. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, the transition risk analysis that I showed you was more of a scenario analysis. And uh, we, of course, would like to develop that into a full-fledged stress test. Um, but there, are, I think there are uh, quite a few steps to take before we get there. And um, uh, I think we also run the risk of um, uh, creating a black box where you have like a final, final outcome, but uh, all the steps that are intermediate uh, are not so visible. Whereas I think that at, at least at this stage, it is also very important to, uh, to show those, uh, those intermediate steps. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and uh, I am, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have already a question. <laughs> Thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Now, central banks are unique institutions in that they are giving immunity from political interference because the, the mission, which is primarily monetary policy, is so important. So anything that moves the domain of central banks into political areas like climate undermines the independence of a central bank as an institution. So therefore, I'm wondering why should central banks be concerned with the climate, with, with climate risks, especially when one cannot really make any argument that climate risk threatens financial stability, which is within the domain of central banks. Well, at the very least, these are highly contentious areas. So the, I'm really worried about politicizing central banks and how and the mission creep they have. So can you say something about that in the context of what you're doing? And as a follow-up, given the fact central banks have so much power, 
how would you want the Bank of Netherlands and the ECB, if it's also is represented, to use its power to accomplish the very important task of uh, reducing carbon emissions, etc. And then, how would you deal with the? Po why are you? But why are you? Why are you not worried about the politics of all of it? Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, for this question, uh, which which takes indeed a bit uh, a broader perspective. Uh, but I, I, I mean, it's in, in, it's definitely an uh, an, uh, um, an important question and also an important discussion to have. So I think that. Um, um, uh, so first, maybe from the perspective of, uh, of BNB. So BNB is a, both a central bank and a prudential supervisor. Um, so I think our, uh, our let's say, climate risk related work um, is, um, um, is relevant uh, for us both from the central bank perspective, so both in our central bank role and also in our uh, supervisor role. Um, so, um, from the uh, from the role of supervisor, I think that uh, and, and I think that's also uh, that's always the the perspective that we take is that uh, climate risk is an important risk for the financial sector, uh, and that is uh, for 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 us uh, a first reason uh, and uh, to uh, um, to be involved in this in this topic and to um, uh, also to do our own analysis of climate risk. So it's not just that we, uh, that we uh, demand uh, from uh, financial institutions that they have their house in order uh, when it comes to uh, assessing climate risk, um, but it's also that, uh, since this is, I think, still a relatively new field, what we, what we saw, for example, when we first um, published our uh, energy transition stress test back in 2017, um, that led to a lot of discussion with financial institutions uh, who were also looking for ways to um, do a proper risk assessment of climate risks. Uh, and um, um, so we, we had a lot of discussions with them, uh, showing them what we did uh, um, and uh, um, explaining them our methodology. Um, and um, uh, basically, on, uh, um, a lot of financial institutions have used that uh, discussions to also improve their own um, their own uh, uh, risk assessment methodologies related to climate risk. So I think that is uh, that is one reason why uh, why we why we do this. And also, like I like I said during the presentation, um, um, uh, when I talked about collecting the data. There, uh, uh, one of the reasons was also to, um, um, to see um, to what extent banks are able um, to, um, um, to give that, to provide that information, whether they have access to this information themselves. And we think that having access to this information is in fact, in fact crucial for doing the type of risk analysis that a financial institution should do. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's let's say more the the, the, the supervisory perspective, um, and apart from that, we think that also let's say um, 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 the the um, the challenge of of, of um, uh, climate change and the uh, the energy transition is uh, is 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 huge. Um, I think. Um, uh, I think it is important to discuss whether or not and in, uh, in, in what form this is also a financial stability risk. Um, well, uh, I don't claim to, let's say, give a final answer to, to that. Is it a yes or a no and how big is it? But I think that uh, the fact that, uh, financial, uh, that uh, climate change and the energy transition are, uh, uh, is, is huge, uh, that is, I think, uh, already a sufficient reason to at least assess also from a central bank, from a financial stability perspective, to assess uh, the extent to which this uh, could be, uh, uh, could have a systemic impact and what the impact uh, uh, then, then would be. Um, so that's basically why we, uh, why we work on this, uh, uh, on this topic. Um, and um, when it comes to the, the, um, the, the powers that, that uh, the, uh, the, the central bank, have, or at least uh, in, in, in the case of uh, um, of, uh, of DNB, so I think that um, um, 
at least in, in, in the Netherlands, I think the uh, uh, DNB is, is also an important, also has an important advisory role towards government. So I think these, these type of analysis also help in that respect uh, to, um, for example, uh, to, to, um, um, to make the case for clear and specific um, uh, energy, uh, energy and climate related policies. Um, and, uh, and the other part, I think, where powers are important is, is in, in, uh, uh, in supervision. Um, and I think there, are, um, um, well, the, the, uh, um, we, we, we make it clear to, uh, uh, to the financial institutions uh, that uh, what we expect from them when it comes to, uh, to their, their climate risk assessments and the actions that they take. So, and we can also do that based on the, based on our own analysis. Thank you. And maybe just to make a point on this, because uh, the point is uh, of climate change for central banks is not political, it's scientific. Actually, in 2015, 196 countries uh, agreed on the Paris Agreement, meaning that they agreed to limit their emissions. Even if we don't get to the two degrees, they are still uh, working on, and we are indeed progressing. There are already changes in the economy to get to at least 2.7 degrees by the end of the century. And this actually is already happening if you look at the composition of companies. I mean, if you look at the composition of uh, utility companies, now they switched a lot to renewable energies. If you look at the composition even of uh, energy companies, now they have mixed plants. So now when this will be uh, a much larger shares of the economy as I mean uh, we know that the European Commission for instance launched the fifth for 50, 50, sorry fit for 55 meaning that we will have to decarbonize actually the economy the composition of the economy is changing if the balance sheet of financial institutions is not are, uh, are not changing if their composition are not changing then this will be actually uh, um, a source of risk because if, the, if fossil fuels will decline because we uh, to meet the emission targets, and this is already, however, happening, and investors are already adjusting their investment decision, this will have an impact on uh, asset prices. And depending on the composition of your balance sheet, if you're a financial institution, you might have losses. And however, if you looked also at the first data that I presented, the value at risk for Deutsche Bank only on the equity side in 2016, without stringent scenarios as the ones of the NGFS, was already 300 million, only on the equity side and in a very conservative scenario. I would think the yellow jackets in France might object to that, and I can also see a significant part of the political domain in the United Kingdom also have that view. All I'm saying is I'm not disputing the importance of the environment, and I'm not disputing the importance of the government doing something about the environment. What I am questioning, why the central bank is the right vehicle for doing, for doing this, because this is political, I can certainly pick a number of holes in your analysis if one wanted to pick holes, and so can anybody else in the media pick holes in this, so can the analysts. And I'm just wondering whether the risk to the central bank and its mission, and, and that's all I'm asking, I'm just, questioning, I'm just questioning whether the central bank is the right vehicle for doing this rather than some other part of the government. No, of course, but these are two different points. Of course, the first best solution will be that governments agreed and introduced in a co coordinated way a, carbon, a relevant carbon pricing, I mean, not below $150 per ton. But in this, at the same time, central banks could signal investors show, uh, that actually they might need to consider that scenarios of climate change Will, uh, will, uh, will realize. And for some countries, it's already there. If you are in the Philippines, and if you are, for instance, in India, I mean, things are not going really well for the sovereign. I mean, the Due to the climate now. there's a lot of studies showing that basically the only thing a central bank says that anybody pays attention to is interest rate decisions. That is, that, that is but like, but. 
and, and maybe by I will the way, and by the way, intra -banker and <laughs> by the way, it is not the perp. However, you are said you said something quite dangerous. You you are claiming that the central bank should dictate how private investors allocate money. That's that's a lot. That's fo follows from me. And I would think if the government wants to dictate how private investors allocate money, it needs to come with the full legitimacy of the democratic political authorities, not an unelected institution that is given freedom from democratic accountability. So I think the central bank is exactly the wrong institution to send that message. Well, probably not if they have to deal with the financial stability as it happened in the last financial crisis. This time there will be no government saving banks or rescuing anybody because there is no money left. So but probably <laughs> moving a bit. Yeah, sorry, we, we have to move away with time, I think, because we are very late, but I think that everybody would be happy to continue this discussion. So let me thank uh, the presenters and the audience for the very lively discussion. And uh, I think we have a break now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for giving us an insight into your latest projects and research. It was really exciting to hear these thought-provoking arguments. Now, we will take a, a lunch break and after which we will continue our second session, a panel discussion also related to questions of climate change and financial stability. We would like to ask those here in person to accept our invitation to a light lunch.
dear all, after the lunch break, we, the conference continues with a panel on the implications of climate change and the green transition in the financial system with a focus on analysis and policies. The discussion will be moderated by Mr. Paul Hebert, Head of Systemic Risk and Financial Institutions Division at the European Central Bank. The members of the panel are Mr. David Carlin, who joined us online. He is the Climate Risk Lead at the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative. Mr. Gabor Gyura, Sustainable Finance Consultant at the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative. And Mr. Wang Xin, Director General of the Research Bureau of the People's Bank of China, who also joined us online. Please give them a warm welcome. Mr. Hebert, Mr. Yura, please take a seat on stage. Thanks very much for the introduction. And I think we couldn't have been preceded by a more interesting panel than the one that just occurred. Um, there's a big debate that just, uh, for those of you online, took place just before lunch, and I think now that we're post-lunch, hopefully we can keep your interest in uh, carry on that debate, uh, but mainly with the focus now on prudential questions. So effectively, um, what I think this, this panel should do um, is basically look, have a look at the question of climate risk, taking that as given, um, what does that imply for financial risk? And, and analyzing this, as the title would suggest, both through the perspective of analytics and also policy questions. So what I wanted to just kick off with just a few slides to get the discussion going um, as moderator of this session. And then I'll pass on to our panelists, which I'm very glad have joined us, and I think can bring a lot of expertise to related questions. So in terms of kicking this off, um, I think what is true is if you're thinking about financial risk, you have to ask yourself the Rogoff Reinhardt question in their book 10 years ago, is this time really different? Um, and they talk about, what, eight centuries of financial folly and the empirical regularities which follow. Is climate somehow fit within that paradigm of financial risk? Or is it somehow different and new? Is it a, is it a structural break which will lead to a paradigm shift of the type pandemics recently or the war might have led us to, the things that we weren't expecting beforehand came as a surprise and led to a fundamental reassessment. And again, the additional leg, does that lead to financial risk? Now, just before I launch in the slides, I mentioned that Patrick Bolton in Columbia University had looked at the question of climate adjustment, the 1.5 degree Paris compatible global warming element. Um, and what he found is if you take the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the scientists, which are behind environmental science, we are now at 1.1 degrees warming in the globe. So we have almost no carbon budget left to get to that 1.5 degrees. So it's not a risk per se, it's baseline. And within that sphere, they did a quick test. If you look at the asset valuation adjustments which have to occur on aggregate, Patrick Bolton's analysis suggested you'd need 10% reductions in carbon emissions across a balanced portfolio starting last year, sustained for the next 10 years. And to put that into context, the pandemic last, uh, I guess in early March 2020, we had these global shutdowns where you saw streets empty in cities. That type of adjustment led to 7.9% carbon emissions reduction in that given year in 2020. We need to see that sustained for the next 10 years. And the next thing they say is, well, in five years' time, that increases to 20% per annum reduction. And in 10 years, it's geometrically impossible. So with that in mind, it looks like we'll have a combination of transition or physical risk, or perhaps even worse, both. So the next slide, just to run through these very quickly, just gives us an idea of what features of climate make climate very special. So if we could advance one slide. Um, the idea is you have four features which are effectively inherent to climate. Um, one is that these tend to be, I think the slide is not advancing, is it up here? Not necessarily, ah, we don't have the slides up anyway. Okay, then I can continue talking. Um, so one is, is climate is systemic. Is it, is it diversifiable, systematic or systemic risk? undiversifiable risk, and insurance will be a key question here. Can we insure against given shocks? Second point, the uncertainty surrounding climate. So normally we have enough difficulty with macroeconomic and financial linkages. Add climate to the mix, does that make it more complicated? I see the slide up now. The third thing is this irreversibility. So this trade-off between transition and physical. The more you have a, a transition now, 
the easier it is to deal with physical risk later on. And that carbon, once it enters into the atmosphere, basically doesn't dissipate for hundreds or maybe even years or longer. And the last, I think, is the most complicated one, is horizons. Um, horizons are rather long when it comes to climate, and sometimes we're a bit uneasy dealing with these as financial risk uh, drivers. Next slide then just gives us the idea of forward-looking scenario analysis. I won't dwell on this. It was touched upon by Irene. I think any scenarios you look at, the Bank of England had their CBES last week, the ECB's work or any other work generally looks at these ideas of an orderly transition, early action, a disorderly, which is much more about late and abrupt action, and then this idea of a hothouse world, which is more physical risk, no action or insufficient action. The next and last slide is just some panel questions I wanted to give, or sorry, the policy question here before I get there. Are there market failures we should worry about which would motivate a macroprudential perspective beyond what we would think about in terms of microprudential perspectives protecting against the risk? Irene talked earlier this morning about dual materiality and this idea that banks lend or, or financial lending lends into climate specific uh, outcomes and therefore you have to think about this feedback mechanism. Is that sufficiently important that we should think about systemic risk changes in the way we look at the prudential framework, um, for instance? Um, so I think with these types of questions, you see some of the elements traced out in this, this infographic, which might be worried we would we'd be thinking about. Lastly, here's just some questions I intend to go through with the panel, time permitting. But quite frankly, I'd be more interested in hearing from the floor. Um, so once the, we have an additional um, initial uh, exposition by the panelists, I would suggest then we, we shift to also include the audience because I'd like to hear your views. These are some of the questions I had put up on the screen here in terms of salience, um, in terms of financial markets, institutions, forward-looking aspects and policy. We won't be able to get through these exhaustively, but I think let's see what we can pick and choose depending on the interests of the audience here and also online. You're welcome to submit questions. So without further ado, I pass over to our panel. And David, I would like to go to you first, then to Gabor and then to Mr. Wang Jin. So David. Great. Uh, th thank you so much for, um, for a terrific introduction and, and I think a really uh, important scene setting on what, what is increasingly a critical topic for the financial sector as well as the real economy overall. I wanted to make a few remarks about the overall degree of development both around decarbonization as well as um, efforts around reporting, uh, because I think those two are beginning to, uh, to move together and supervisors certainly are seeing the connections between the areas of climate risk and that of climate alignment. And so the framework that really has become the basis of not only how institutions are making these disclosures, but also the regulatory rules that we're seeing in Europe, in the UK, in Asia, in the Americas now are really tied back to the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures and its recommendations and specifically the four pillars of that framework. And so the aim of that framework when it was initially created in 2017 was to provide clear and coherent information about firms' climate risks to the market and to financial participants to avoid some of this mispricing, to avoid some of the unstated risks that will allow us to continue on what would be a destructive or damaging course um, well past the time it's too late. And so by providing these four pillars of governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets, the aim of the TCFD and thus the basis of other existing required frameworks was to provide a full and clear picture of the institutional impacts on climate, so things such as global emissions um, from operations, but also on exposure to physical as well as transitionary risks. And so in thinking about this, uh, we can see that for each of these themes, there's been a significant global development in, in expectations around their disclosure, as well as a greater degree of assessment of climate risk through activities such as stress testing. We saw just earlier this week, the Climate Biennial Exploratory Scenario or CBES in the UK just concluded with its results being released. Uh, likewise, the EU has uh, itself one of the more uh, comprehensive and, uh, and detailed set of climate stress tests and assessments, as well as many member nations having their own national level 
evaluations. If we go to the next page. Um, perfect. Um, we, we can see a few of those examples, as I mentioned, of both mandatory disclosures and also increasing adoption. And part of this is to create a more complete uh, market for these disclosures. So similarly to the way that financial statements are presently used by analysts at banks, by, by risk managers, by investors, and by stakeholders to really get a sense of how firms are doing, by having more widespread adoption of climate disclosures, we're seeing a greater ability to be able to understand how these relate to each other by using a common set of scenarios, often ones developed through the Network for Greening the Financial System, that group of regulators. We have a real opportunity here to begin to compare across uh, industry and to look at how climate is being managed within some big organizations. And the push toward mandatory disclosure and the use of stress tests and other risk assessments will only continue to enhance that process. If we go to the next slide. So on, on the next slide, uh, when we, when we get there, I'll just briefly talk about some of the developments in each of those four pillars, because I think it's a helpful way for us to, uh, to think about that. And so, um, as I mentioned, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets, what we're seeing is a lot of involvement um, from boards and increasing recognition from institutions that climate is a systemic risk as well as a individual operational risk. And that uh, in a closely related point on the strategic side, we're seeing more and more climate related um, opportunities being incorporated into strategy, recognizing that strategies need to change to account for climate in a way that is going to leave institutions better prepared and more ready to, uh, to deal with the challenges. On risk management, um, we see a lot of focus on the transition. Uh, as, as Paul was saying, one of the big conclusions here is that we have such a limited carbon budget and we have such a big task in front of us. And I think investors, as well as those who are doing capital planning processes, are really beginning to ask those hard questions about which assets will remain viable, where there are likely to be significant shifts, both in policy and regulation, as well as market expectations. And so, while physical risk is certainly of uh, importance, transition risk has been predominantly the focus that many institutions have explored, especially uh, in uh, industrialized parts of the world. And then finally, the metrics and targets piece, this is an area that still requires significant development, but we are seeing progress in it through the commitment to net zero targets. Um, now there are over 400 financial institutions that have made these commitments to net zero. Um, also in the um, expectation from central banks around activities such as um, green bonds, such as um, their, own corporate, um, their own corporate bond buying schemes. We've seen these also become incorporated into um, regulatory targets and so Targets are still an area of greater um, development being required, but also one where we're seeing institutions begin to set and develop some of those, um, those approaches. So with that, uh, I'll hand back to, uh, to Paul and very much looking forward to the discussion with, uh, with my fellow panelists. Okay. okay. That's mine. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, great, so um, David has introduced us to the world of TCFD reporting. 
uh, which the most developed banks and large corporations already do. Let me very briefly talk about what, is, what we see uh, among Hungarian banks, where uh, so far no uh, commercial banks have signed up to TCFD reporting. And probably what I tell you is characteristic also for Central Eastern Europe uh, as well, but I will just um, talk shortly about uh, Hungary based on the slides which we prepared together when I worked here at the Central Bank. Um, so first of all, um, at the Central Bank, um, the Central Bank of Hungary has been measuring the carbon intensity of the Hungarian banking sector. And um, what we can see on this slide is that basically since 2017, uh, altogether the, the total carbon intensity of the banking system has been risen. So we don't really see a decarbonization in bank balance sheets. Of course, let's be very frank. Uh, um, basically, the banking system is mirroring the structure of the economy. So we shouldn't be too uh, unjust with banks. But basically, the trend is not looking, looking good. Um, we cannot really see the signs of decarbonization in banks' balance sheets. Um, at the micro level, um, the central bank has uh, started to survey uh, banks, commercial banks, um, about their practices. And what we can see on this picture is that uh, still the vast majority of commercial banks cannot really um, identify and, um, and uh, measure climate or environmental risks. So it's, uh, it's more than half of banks who cannot or just part partially can uh, identify climate or environmental risks, whereas that would be basically the beginning to be able to capture such risks. Even more tellingly, um, just a very, very small fraction of Hungarian banks um, said that uh, it can basically measure its uh, so-called scope three emissions, so the finance emissions coming from their portfolios. Um, it's really a signal that banks are currently a little bit unaware of the, of the climate risks that could be in their balance sheets. Um, I, can, I think it's fair to say that there are market failures uh, in the banking system, especially in Hungary. Um, so I think there is certainly an, uh, a space for regulation to address these market failures. And I would just very briefly mention here two types of regulations which you see uh, internationally, but also Hungary, in Hungary. So first of all, many supervisors like the Central Bank of Hungary have introduced um, explicit requirements for banks to integrate uh, climate risks in their, their corporate governance in their business. Um, and I think there is very wide global consensus that this is the right thing to do for a regulator. And this will be also part of the EU um, legislation. But there is much less uh, agreement about the so-called green or brown um, support or penalizing factor dilemma. So basically the idea that prudential regulation should be used to actively uh, incentivize banks to decarbonize. Um, this comes with many questions, but uh, just to be short, let me mention that in Hungary, the Central Bank of Hungary has introduced the temporary green support factor, and so far it has been effective in, uh, let's say, jump-starting green lending. But of course, uh, we should say that the long-term financial stability implications are, of course, too early to judge. What I'm just trying to say here very briefly is that uh, at least the good news is that some, uh, let's say, greening of bank balance sheets have started thanks to this uh, green support factor incentive. And with that, I close. Thanks. Thank you, Gabor. And related thanks to David as well. I think um, both very interesting points of view. So we move from the global points of David to, I think, the Hungarian CE perspective of Gabor. I'd now I'd like to move over to Mr. Wang Jin and ask him about the Chinese perspective being, I think, a very large economy. And I think over 30%, I understand, of global emissions emanate from China. Whilst at the same time, I think China is taking a lot of interesting policy initiatives in this space. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, it's my great pleasure to attend this uh, uh, interesting and important uh, panel discussions. Uh, now I would like to mainly talk about the policies uh, we have been taking to address the climate-related uh, financial risk. Um, next slide, please. And now the PBC, uh, the China Central Bank, has attached uh, great importance to the uh, climate-related financial risk. Um, as uh, Pao just mentioned, that uh, we, the, the emission uh, from China account for 
something like a certain percent. And now we are still in the industrialization and urbanization. And um, so uh, the carbon emission is still a very important, a very big issue. Um, now we manage, uh, we have taken several measures. One is to evaluate the green finance performance of financial institutions, including the uh, performance of uh, uh, green bonds and green lendings and the riskiness of their uh, performance. And the results are included in the uh, bank's uh, rating uh, by the central bank. And the number, number two measure is to conduct a climate risk stress test for major banks. Now the PPC has already organized uh, 24 uh, national uh, big uh, commercial banks to do the stress test. And uh, uh, preliminary results, uh, um, we have already had the results and, and it seems that uh, generally speaking, the banks are doing okay uh, in the stress test. And now we are also doing research on the climate risk stress test at the microeconomic level. Now we are in the process of uh, uh, dra drafting the plans to do that and we learn a lot from the uh, experiences uh, from our counterparts of uh, other major uh, central banks. And um, last but not least, we advance the green development while gradually and orderly promote low carbon uh, transition because um, if we can have uh, uh, develop a green uh, uh, developments, then uh, the transition risk and other risk can be reduced. Next slide, please. And uh, as to the uh, green finance performance uh, evaluation, um, it's a quarterly uh, evaluation process. Um, and now, as I said before, I includes the green loans and green bonds. And now the green bonds account for uh, something like 90% of the total uh, green finance. So uh, green loans are still very much uh, dominant. And if it is necessary, the evaluation might include more green finance uh, products and services. Uh, and the evaluation results might be used in more scenarios. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And um, in terms of the uh, climate-related risk stress test, uh, the PBC has already organized 24 banks uh, to participate in the climate risk stress test. And now we focus on three uh, high carbon industries. Uh, that is um, Samo Power, Iron and Steel, and Cement. And, uh, and the uh, test mainly looks into implications of increasing uh, carbon prices and uh, based on several scenarios. Um, and uh, to look into the implications of increasing carbon price for the bank's financial strengths or weaknesses. Uh, for example, uh, the bank's credit asset default rate, uh, their expected uh, losses, and change of uh, capital adequacy uh, level, and so on. And we conduct uh, the stress test uh, in 10 years' time and using 2020 as the base year. And uh, the preliminary results shows that uh, if the uh, enterprises, uh, the enterprises in the high carbon industries have done nothing, uh, actually they uh, will suffer uh, non-performing uh, assets and uh, uh, resulting in uh, non-performing assets in, in uh, commercial banks. Um, and um, all participating banks are able to meet regulatory requirements of capital adequacy ratio and uh, mainly because their exposures to those uh, industries are relatively small. Um, maybe another reason is that uh, in the past uh, several years, uh, the, those high carbon uh, industries actually are doing okay and uh, the prices are up. And
and uh, uh, the loans to those uh, industries uh, are good uh, for the banks. So uh, probably their risk limits are not fully uh, evident. And um, we are doing a research on the uh, stress test at the microeconomic level, um, but uh, we are still facing uh, some challenges, uh, including data gap. Uh, we just don't have uh, much um, high quality data. It's a big problem. And uh, for banks, uh, they uh, now they are in the process of uh, voluntary uh, disclosure of uh, environmental and climate uh, uh, information. Now we are require some banks in our uh, green finance uh, pilot uh, zones to do some uh, uh, to uh, more uh, uh, in-depth uh, uh, disclosure. And hopefully uh, we can have a mandatory uh, information disclosure for uh, commercial banks. Uh, very soon. And uh, the PPC will further improve the stress test and measure and cover more high carbon industries. And we will require more uh, commercial banks to participate in the stress test. Um, for the uh, stress test for the microeconomic level, um, now we in the process of, ha of uh, having our uh, climate scenarios based on the NGFS scenarios. And now we are considering uh, the transmission uh, mechanism from the climate change to the economic source and to the uh, change of uh, industries and uh, financial institutions, uh, financial stands, and, and so on. And uh, hopefully we can conduct the stress test at the microeconomic level soon. Uh, due to the time constraints, I will stop here. Thank you very much. I very much look forward to uh, our discussions with uh, fellow panelists and with the audience. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for the presentation. And I think a very, very helpful compliment to those we heard thus far. So we did a bit of a tour of the world, if you will. Um, so I think we've come back around then to the point where we can maybe open up the, the panel discussion. Um, I'll, use, I'll abuse my privileges as, as moderator to maybe uh, put in a first question, then I would collect some from the audience to spice up and, and maybe make a bit more interactive this discussion. And the first one is about this, this point I made, mentioned at the outset of my remarks, which I think you've all picked up upon, of horizon. Um, so Mark Carney, I think, famously said in 2016, it's a tragedy of the horizon. Back then, arguably, very few people were thinking about financial-related elements of climate risk in a serious determined, evidence-driven way. I mean, we are now effectively almost, almost like half a decade forward. There's a lot more awareness in the industry. Is, is this horizon issue still one that is relevant? And could we imagine that there would be a, something which could constitute this conference is about financial stability and systemic risk, an abrupt and maybe unforeseeable dimension to this or, or uninsurable dimension this we should worry about? Um, so first, maybe I'll, I'll pass over to you, David. On the side of informational market failures, there's a lot more information out there. Is that something we can maybe imagine, maybe brings, either brings the horizon closer to the present, or we could think about these informational market failures being largely resolved or resolving? So I, I think the, it, it's, a, it's a really good point because there is a lot more information. There's a lot more awareness. There's a lot more stakeholders that have made climate a priority, whether um, those be policymakers or financial supervisors or um, individual market actors themselves. However, I think we're quite far, unfortunately, from a, say, climate efficient market, because I think even in the latest assessments and um, tests that have been conducted, there are many types of risks and many types of challenges that aren't necessarily assessed, whether it's because the um, horizon of the analysis or the nature of the analysis doesn't adequately cover them. And then in terms of the efficient um, disclosure of this information, I think we only need to look to um, the ECB's previous assessment uh, just a few months ago of 112 of the largest 
financial institutions um, within the Eurozone to see that disclosures, while improving, are still nowhere near adequate for stakeholders to make the decisions they need. And I think the, the dream and the vision that we have is to have climate information be as central to business decision-making as traditional financial information, as well as as comparable and as well understood. And I think we're, we're still a long way from there. And in some ways, this isn't just a, a, a criticism of the financial sector or of any institution in particular, but also a bit of the nature of the challenge that these are risks that are inherently non-stationary. They're risks that by their very um, existence are going to be novel, are going to be um, causing significant um, challenge and understanding both how to measure them and deal with them to, to the point you made before about, is this time different? I think the answer is almost definitionally the challenge of climate modeling, the challenge of effective action is recognizing that there is an unprecedented nature to this, that the past can only take us so far as prologue, the past can only take us so far in its information. So I think what I would say is there are positive trends in this, but we are, we are still a long way from really capturing the extent of the risks and the manifestation of those risks, especially in the near term and the, the shorter time horizons. So I think some great points in there, David. I think it's true that there's a lot more information in the system, but to your point that it's not necessarily aggreg aggregatable information or comparable, maybe dilutes, it's, maybe it makes the noise to signal ratio of that information higher than we would necessarily like for having um, informed decisions. I'd, I'd ask you um, then over to Gabor, a question um, related to this somewhat. You talked about scopes of emissions. So of course the scope three downstream use of a particular product, so take a diesel car. There's a lot of emissions on production um, or inputs to that production, but when the diesel car goes into use, it's quite emissions intensive compared to an electric car. But if you compare a diesel and electric car, of course, at production, an electric car looks quite emissions intensive. So, so I guess the question is, there's a lot of devils in the detail of the scope three emissions. Do we feel that the, what banks are able to report in terms of desirability or feasibility, is there such that that information is actually decision ready or usable when it comes to business model adjustment? Well, great, great question. Um, I think it's really fair to say that um, even though I think there has been great progress in the methodology of, of uh, how to measure finance emissions um, by banks, this is still not everything is crystal clear and there could be, I would say, like um, cases when I think there are, there are legitimately at least two or three methods. Um, so we still don't have the crystal ball, I would say. Um, um, but, I, but in Hungary, I think we are still not there. So I'm in Hungary, and again, I think I can speak also on behalf of uh, all emerging markets, at least in, in Eastern Europe. So basically, the, the problem we have is right now not that basically banks uh, are struggling with the very uh, details, uh, how to really measure their finance emissions, what kind of methodology should we use, what kind of weighting, and what kind of scenarios. <laughs> the problem is really that we are not really doing uh, it. And this is why I think regulation is, is so important. So first, basically, you need to convince them to do it. Um, also, because uh, without that, you won't be able really to measure the risks themselves. So basically, now everything is, is a bit of a black box. We are, I think it's great that we are talking so much about climate risk, physical risk, transition risk, and we have now evolving tools to capture many of those things. But um, even though climate stress tests are so, uh, let's say, crude, uh, without really accurate granular data about finance emissions that we are really far from, I would say, uh, accurately just uh, assessing the size of the problem. Okay, no, super. And I think it's very interesting points. By the way, I'm used to looking at screens now with too many, too many years of WebEx, and I don't look at people, so I'm sorry about that initially. Uh, that's a function of being online for too long. Um, Mr. Wang Jin, I'd like to ask you a question as well, which was related to Horizon still. So the, if I understood correctly, the, the, the People's Bank of China has a 10-year horizon on the climate stress test. And of course, one thing that came up this morning was this idea about static balance sheets. Are they an adequate assumption to make when you're looking very f much forward? Should we not allow for dynamic behaviors? And I guess with that in mind, there's the idea the corporate sector often tells us to the banks actually more, more readily that they have a, maybe a, a five to seven year average duration of their corporate portfolio. So they would just simply roll off these risks. It's not relevant 10 year hence 
Um, do you think this horizon issue is something we're able to tackle with the tools we have at hand? Yes, um, actually our stress test at the uh, commercial bank's levels are at an early, very early stage. And uh, when we are look in, looking at the 10 years horizon, actually there are a lot of uncertainties. And uh, now um, at the market players, actually uh, some are reluctant to take uh, concrete actions. And, um, and uh, since uh, the, uh, the carbon pricing uh, is not that, um, um, reasonable uh, and now it's uh, still very low. Uh, actually, a lot of uh, issues are uh, involved. Uh, so it's very difficult to have a very uh, scientific uh, results uh, in the stress test. But I think that the stress test is a very good uh, reference. Uh, we can have a broad picture uh, regarding the, the climate, uh, the, the overall profile of uh, climate risk and the sources of the risk uh, come from. And I don't think at this moment is too uh, important for some uh, uh, specific uh, results. Uh, the key issue here is that we need to uh, take measures now to address the uh, uh, climate related uh, risk. Uh, for example, we need to uh, put a lot of resources to develop green um, sectors, uh, green energies. And um, we need to have a gradual and orderly uh, transition and don't have the U-turn approach. And we need to have a systemic approach to address the uh, climate risk because it is kind of a, a systemic risk. Uh, so when we... Um, now we are uh, drafting the Financial Stability uh, Act, and we are now establishing the Financial Stability Safeguard Fund. It's a, it's a huge fund. Uh, we now collect a lot of money to, 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 to do this, uh, this fund. And I think uh, uh, at this stage, we need to consider uh, the climate-related risk. Um, that's very important. Thank you. No, I think to your point, what we can measure, the old adage is what you can measure, you can manage. And I think this does yield presumably information which can be used to also manage the risk and adjust. I've, I'm conscious of the time and I'd like to open up the floor to some questions. So I see here in the front row, I have at least two questions, maybe three. So if we could bring the microphone to this area. We can maybe go, um, John, I think you wanted to ask first. Um, I don't care. I'm finding this discussion, both in this session and the previous one, to be absolutely fascinating. But I'm not quite sure what the takeaway is from it. I, I don't think any reasonable person disputes that climate risk is real and we should do something about it as quickly as possible. I would certainly be in favor of much stronger policy action by, than we have so far done. And what gets in the way of that is the politics of climate is difficult. This is disputed and it hits economic interests and all of that. So therefore, with that in mind, I'm thinking about why is this being discussed in the context of financial stability and central banks? Are we trying to find, sneak in a policy objective by the back door? That is, find the inappropriate part of the government to achieve something very important. And in listening to this, so David said something that struck me. He called it unstated risks, which implies to me that some of the rest of us are not smart enough or clear enough to understand the real risk from the environment. And only if we appreciated that, then we would take correct action. Now, if we think about financial stability and Financial stability is all about whether financial institutions are solvent, they can continue to serve the functions they are meant to serve, whether the, we end up with a major financial crisis. And here's a question I always give to my students on an exam, and this is a good question, which is, is bank capital, CET1, designed to cover expected or unexpected losses? And of course, the answer is unexpected losses, because expected losses you're provisioned against. And if the climate risk is 
as well as is clear, if you know what the risk is, and I think we have a fairly good understanding of how it maps onto all the things we care about. I live in London, which would be flooded, etc. All of that is well understood. A, so there are, there are a couple of things about this. First of all, does the price of assets that might be encumbered reflect this? And I would think that the price of, if you just look at the present discounted value of future dividends from, say, oil companies, it reflects the fact that the market doesn't expect these firms to be around for, for very long. That is, the market is pricing this in already. And the second, th and the second thing is, over time, and, and this is the question been asked twice already, so I'm going to ask for, ask for the third time, and uh, in neither case did we get a good answer to it, which is asset allocations are not static. So as we move into this disaster scenario in the future, investors, financial institutions will change what they buy. So therefore, we could certainly say that an asset allocation in the year 19, 2015 or 2020, if nobody does anything, that it doesn't trade anything, I mean, will lead to huge losses in the year 2090. That you can do, but that's not the appropriate way of doing things because asset allocations will change. And therefore, I have a re I really struggle with how climate affects financial stability or how climate affects systemic risk. And I'm just, I mean, we had three presentations on this morning. I was not convinced at all, I mean, by, by any of them. And here's the problem, because if we then say, if I'm not the only one who's, who doesn't see that particular connections, so are we just using the central banks and financial regulators a backdoor to get in a very laudable political environment, and how are we going to deal with the fact that when the rest of the world, all the climate deniers, point to, look at how stupid these people are. They're making all these mistakes in analysis, and it gives yet another ammunition, am ammunition to those who object to climate emissions. So I think this is the the more I think of this, this is the wrong way to go about this very important goal, because it, it doesn't really fit into the mandate of stability or regulation. Thanks, John, for the provocative view. I suspect I'm going to collect questions simply because I suspect they may be related, if, if this morning was a guide. So I'll go with David next. Mine isn't related at all. Two Davids, yeah. Shall I, okay. I say it anyway? Well, why don't we collect them, because we're yeah. short on time. Yeah. Okay, so I think I've got one question for all three of you, perhaps, and one for David especially. So the question for all three of you, um, Paul, this takes off as a starting point something you said in your opening presentation, where I think you noted that an orderly transition scenario is the kind of baseline that's normally assumed. A simple question is like, is that, are we now kind of past that point? Is it kind of foolhardy, foolhardy to think that we can still have an orderly transition? So that's the question for all three. And for David especially, you talked about the TCFD um, disclosure framework and you know the good work that's being done in kind of mandating those disclosures. I think one concern I have is just the sheer number of the areas that firms have to kind of report on. Some of those are kind of fairly kind of, I don't want to use the word wishy-washy, but you can understand what I mean. They're kind of management related, um, you know, are certain risks being taken into account. They're not hard data. And I was wondering if you can see any kind of progress in terms of narrowing down the kind of scope of what we're asking firms to disclose so that that could be more useful for investors. Great. Thank you. And maybe I'll take the last David question. Uh, this is from David Marsh. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, a mercifully short question to uh, Mr. Wang Jin. Very good to see you uh, here. And uh, the question is, do you have the data and the mechanisms to keep a, a tack, uh, keep register on what the Chinese banks are doing in their overseas lending, let's say to Africa or to other countries in Asia, do you have the tools to make sure that you can do a climate uh, assessment of those loans? Great, so I think we have many questions. Let me just list the ones I heard. So I think from John Danielson, the ones I, I detected were the, are these foreseeable shocks that are actually priced currently in assets? Can we expect that there's any adjustment we haven't seen before, which I think mixes in with David's point about are we past an orderly transition. The political question you asked, um, the TCFD one, which I think is to David about qualitative versus quantitative aspects of reporting, and then this issue of data in, uh, related to Chinese banks. Why don't we start off with all the panelists? Uh, maybe I can go in order of the presentations. 
That is uh, from David over to Gabor over to Mr. Wang Jin. David? Yeah, wow, I, I feel like there, uh, there's a, a whole slate of questions. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to make three, three points in, in, in hearing what, what the audience has asked. I think the first one about, is this the right way of addressing this topic? Second, um, about the orderly transition. And then finally, about um, the concretization of, uh, of, of metrics and information and disclosures. So on that first topic, I would say I, I certainly understand. And I think the argument that this is solely a financial stability issue is, is incomplete and, and somewhat um, misguided. That said, I think it is absolutely a financial stability issue. In the same way, probably back in 2005, one would say that um, that housing markets and and credit, you know, were were not necessarily a financial stability issue, but by 2007 and 2008, they they absolutely were. So with climate, I, I don't think it's about people not being smart enough or not knowing, but rather recognizing the inherent uncertainties and nonlinearities, both in the climate system, but also in the um, shifts technologically. And when we just look at the mountain of, of challenge before us, if we want to attain these climate goals, the transitions required are so massive that they do need to be considered as part of financial stability. If we try, as, as you mentioned, to go through the back door and not link these things to policy and not link these things, um, to market actions. Yes, it, it will be an incomplete response and it will continue to produce a, a stack of, of regulatory reports that, that don't necessarily really move the needle. But, but I see this as an integrated part of the, the whole. And so it has been frustrating to see relative inaction in, in legislatures on this topic. But I think that the analysis that's being done, even where incomplete and even where in certain cases not fully conclusive, leads to better practices and better understanding of potential sizing of these risks, the nature of whether these pose imminent risks to financial stability or more midterm or, or longer term risks. So I think that there is a real critical use case um, that goes well beyond just the, the activist um, central bank argument. The second point I would say is on the transition. As um, Paul rightly mentioned, when we look at how much of a decrease in emissions, um, this is the statistic I always love to cite as well about how much the decrease in emissions from COVID uh, really resulted in um, only about a seven to 8% fall in our global emissions. And it's about that pace of emissions cuts that we'll need through 2030 to get us onto a net zero trajectory. And so recognizing that this is a massively disruptive and not necessarily in a bad way and potentially that, that Schumpeterian creative destruction, but, but in a, a way that really will require significant change. And so there will be definitive winners and definitive losers from this transition. We're seeing this now just in how various companies are performing, especially um, in many countries around coal. But the, the point being that when you're talking about these capital intensive sectors, ones where we need to be making projections about power generation, about extraction decades in the future, the question may not be, are people using oil today or tomorrow? But in 20, 30 years, will volumes be such that a new project can be amortized and make sense? So I think there is a really strong probability that sectors will face disruption and sectors will need to make adequate preparation. And then finally, on the, the part about TCFD, I think more and more work is going into this comparability. I think it's why, why having requirements uh, from supervisors are so important, because that does play a powerful role in increasing the number of disclosures as well as standardizing those critical quantitative elements. I would push back a little bit against the point that some of these governance considerations are simply wishy-washy. I agree that they can be written as a lot of fluff, but I think similar to um, qualitative disclosures in financial reporting and in other cases, this information can be used to determine and discriminate between who is taking this issue seriously, who is 
investing and who has senior buy-in and who doesn't. So I don't think it is only numbers. I think if you imagine yourself sitting as a equity analyst, it's not just that you look at the financials, but you also look at overall industry outlook. You look at what the board is doing, management quality. So I think these, these are still considerations, but I agree with you, the predominance of these qualitative metrics needs to be balanced with sufficiently quantitative ones to enable comparability. Thanks so much, David. And I think very interesting points, all of them. Um, I realize we're a bit past our time, so I suggest we round up this, this set of questions and then we can end the panel with, I think, many questions unaddressed. But okay, more refined questions as an outcome is maybe not a bad thing either, as it's an interesting debate. Over to you, Gabor. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll try to be very, very uh, brief. And there were really so many questions and great ideas from the, from the audience. Maybe let me just react to one uh, element. As an ex-central banker, I'm a little bit more free to talk about central banks' roles and mandates. Um, I think it's really fair to say that there is now very um, increased pressure from society for central banks to do more. And a little bit, uh, this also means that central banks are many, very often expected a bit to a little bit substitute for government, for government action. Um, and I think this is, of course, from one point of view, this is a ta taboo, because central banks cannot really take over the role of government. But if I can a little bit think a little bit more openly, mm. central banks are independent. Central banks traditionally have a long-term view on the economy, on society, on, on, on wealth. Uh, and that's why it really makes them a, 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 well, a good candidate to at least partly uh, substitute governments. Whether it's a good idea or not, uh, again, I think that's up for debate, but I'm just arguing that central banks have a special characteristic that makes them prone to be the unlikely heroes in the, in the story. And maybe just one more thing very shortly. So Ken, it was also maybe briefly touched upon whether financial stability or financial stability tools, um, prudential regulation, macroprudential regulation can really, let's hmm. say, um, solve the climate crisis. My short answer would be no. It's, it's not really for that. It can really be part of the solution, but I would... Uh, even as an ex-central banker, wouldn't go as far as to use all the macro and micro potential policies to, to, let's say, solve the climate crisis because it's not really suitable for that. And I don't have time to explain it more in details. Okay, Marua, thanks for the succinct answer, and I think by touching upon many of the questions. Over to you, Mr. Wang Jin. Okay, uh, thank you very much, David, for your question. Uh, long time no talk. Um, and since then, now I'm at the research department. I'm not where well aware whether or not we already have the data you mentioned. Um, but definitely we can uh, require uh, the, the banks uh, doing overseas uh, lendings to provide the, uh, the data. And now Chinese government uh, has attached a great importance to uh, green developments and low carbon um, transition, of course, including uh, those um, uh, businesses um, uh, overseas. And now we also uh, underlined the importance of uh, uh, green developments in the uh, One Belt, or One Road uh, initiative. And now more and more uh, Chinese uh, commercial banks and other financial institutions uh, have taken measures to uh, do the carbon accounting and information disclosure and so on. Uh, I guess that the, now the problem is that um, they need to correct uh, um, uh, more and more data, I mean the, the commercial banks are uh, doing overseas uh, lending, and uh, they need to have the, the right tools to uh, do the carbon accounting and uh, uh, information uh, disclosure. And actually more and more Chinese banks have, has, have uh, participated in the Sino-UK uh, uh, information disclosure initiative. Uh, so I think um, we can have uh, more and more uh, necessary data, uh, which are very helpful for the assessments of the, our uh, overseas lending. Thank you, David. Thanks, and I think, uh, thanks to all three panelists. I think, you know, they say sunlight is the best disinfectant, and transparency, I think, was a theme that was pervasive across all of your interventions. And I think in this respect, I think one thing we can agree is more information is certainly out there. And I think as information grows, our questions become more refined. And this debate, I think, can be a bit more informed as a debate um, than, say, was even, even a few years ago. So with this in mind, I know some of the questions might be still cut live. We maybe spill over in the coffee break. But I do hope this panel, I think, brought some interesting perspectives to the debate. And I, I thank all three panelists for really, really incisive, interesting, 
and I think uh, poignant uh, observations which really help bring our thinking forward. Thank you all. Gentlemen, please take your seat now. After this very engaging discussion, we will move to the next item on our agenda, a panel discussion on questions of overregulation, optimal regulatory simplicity, and financial stability consequences. Before the discussion starts, Mr. David Aikman, Director of Qatar Center for Global Banking and Finance at the King's College London, will deliver his introductory presentation. Dear Mr. Aikman, now I pass the word to you. Well, a very big thank you uh, to the organisers for putting on this fantastic event. It's been so nice to actually meet in person, have in-person discussions uh, once more. I've kind of got so much more from this than previous conferences I've attended over the last two years. So um, this session is really going to be about regulatory complexity, um, or at least my remarks are. Before I get into that issue per se, I thought it'd be nice just to do a bit of scene setting. And I'll show you some data on the impact that um, Basel III has had on bank balance sheets over the last 10 years since the global financial crisis. So that'll be a bit of background. And then the meat of my talk is really gonna be trying to tackle this question of whether the regulatory system is too complex. And if so, what can we do about that? So let me sh start with showing you a little bit of data. Um, the charts I'm gonna show you all have this format. So these are distributions of different balance sheet variables. Um, so in this case, this is, this is the tier one capital ratio. So the chart on the right shows you distributions for the population of global systemically important banks. So the, about 30 of the largest banks worldwide. And the chart on the right does the same thing, but for this time for the sample of domestic, systemically important banks. And just to kind of walk you through the slide, because there's a lot of lines on it, the three, three year snapshots happening here. So the kind of reddish orange line is 2010, blue is 2015, and green is 2020. So for this particular variable, the tier one capital ratio, this is kind of like Basel III working as intended, I'd say. We've seen a big shift to the right in the distribution of tier one capital ratios, whether you look at the largest banks or the kind of next run down. I think it's also interesting to look at variables that are not specifically targeted by the regulations. So in this case, this is a measure of leverage. It's not a regulatory measure, it's just tangible common equity divided by total assets. And there I'd say the picture is a little bit less clear cut, but you know, on average, if you compare the kind of green distribution to the red, you can see there's been a shift to the right. So in leverage space as well, we've seen an improvement. That's not true though, if we look at market perceptions of bank leverage, right? So this is, I think, kind of reasonably well known, but it's interesting to see anyway. So these charts show you the, the ratio of market cap to total assets. And you can see the green line is kind of, I would say it looks kind of to have deteriorated relative to red and blue. So the markets don't perceive banks to be safer uh, than they were in 2010. So moving away from solvency and looking at liquidity metrics, I think an obvious thing we can look at is the loan to deposit ratio in the banking system. And there I'd say, you know, there's some, this time we need to kind of flip signs, right? So a lower loan to deposit ratio is kind of a more resilient funding structure, I think we can say. So here we can see the green distribution is kind of shifted to the left. So again, that's probably what we were hoping to achieve with Basel III. You can do like a crude estimate of the net stable funding ratio. So we can't do this for 2010, but we've got it for 2013 as the starting point. 
Here, I'd say the pitch is pretty inconclusive. So there's kind of no real impact that banks' net stable funding ratios have, have improved on average over this period. That could be because these rules were introduced quite late in the day, or it could just be you know, the calibration of the NSFR got watered down quite a lot in Basel III, to be frank. And then the last of these charts are profitability metrics. So looking at return on assets, you know, this is the thing that underlines arguably the reason that market cap is looking so weak. So return on assets has clearly deteriorated relative to 2010. So there's a big kind of mode of the distribution is kind of, well, the, the left-hand mode of the distribution has shifted to the left at least. You can see, interestingly, it's a bimodal distribution or, or possibly multimodal. And that right-hand mode is kind of US and Canadian banks in the green, whereas the left, I'm afraid, is European, UK, Japanese banks. So to kind of summarize that stuff, so this little table is going to show you the, the means of those distributions. I'm going to focus on just 2010 and 2020, and this is just for the GSIP population, the global systemically important banks. And we get a picture, if you look at solvency, as I said, that tier one capital ratios have improved a lot. Tangible equity, it's a little bit less clear cut, but there's still an improvement. And market leverage has deteriorated. On the liquidity side, we've seen the loan to deposit ratio falling, which is kind of a more resilient funding structure. No change at all in the NSFR. And profitability metrics, whether you look at net interest margins or return on equity, they're all a lot weaker, reflecting the low interest rate environments. So that's like a bit of a backdrop in terms of what's happened to bank balance sheets over the last decade. I'm going to spend the rest of my time kind of shifting gears a little bit and talking about evidence for, com for the complexity of the regulatory system. I'll try and give you a little, some concrete ideas for what we can actually do to remedy this. Let's start with kind of just some facts on complexity itself. So what this little table does is it takes the documents that you can find on the BIS website that describe Basel I, Basel II, and Basel III. And the first row is the number of words in those documents, right? A simple measure of complexity. So Basel I had 10,000 words in it. That was a, that was a short 30-page document, which is quite amazing. By the time we meet to Basel III, that number had grown 15-fold. So that's where the big increase in complexity came from, so 150,000. And then it's increased almost three times further from that in moving to Basel III. So to give you a little bit of context, so War and Peace has, I'm reliably told by Google, it has 600,000 words. So we're not far off that with Basel III in terms of the kind of body of material you need to master to, to kind of understand what's happening. There's some kind of slightly more sophisticated things you can look at, like the number of conditional statements that these documents contain. So the if, but, howevers, maybes. So you can see a big increase on that front as well, although it's probably roughly in proportion to what you think of in terms of the word counts. You can also look at the, the frequency with which certain terms appear. Key terms like conflict or trade-off, I think, are quite indicative of complexity. There we've seen a big increase too. You've probably seen these reading ease metrics. I don't know if you use them within the central bank here. It used to be a thing we'd look at at the Bank of England. So these are basically metrics that, that I think they're based on like the length of sentences and the length of words relative to documents, and lower numbers indicate more complexity. So there's been kind of signs that these documents are now harder to read, but not only longer, but harder to read. All right, so hopefully that convinces you complexity has increased, and I don't think that's a big surprise to anyone. A few thoughts on kind of why the regulatory system is so complex. This is kind of my personal experience, having been involved with Basel Committee stuff in previous, previous life. So I would say, you know, one argument you often hear is, you know, the regulatory, sorry, the financial system itself is very complex. So surely we need a complex regulatory system to control that. It's kind of, you know, the right answer. A related argument is, I guess, concerns that a simple framework could distort incentives. So we want to be risk sensitive with the regulatory system. That, that way we will align banks' incentives with 
you know, with social incentives. I think that's a huge error, personally. I should say that was the view of my former boss at the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney, as well. So, you know, there are a variety of views on this. I'm going to emphasize three other factors, though, that aren't really so benign. So, I mean, the role of lobbying and compromise in writing down these rules, I think, is well known. A great example is the Volcker Rule, the passage of the Volcker Rule in the United States. So the kind of initial um, expression of the Volcker Rule was a three-page letter that Paul Volcker sent to um, uh, the president at the time. By the time that kind of entered the Dodd-Frank Act as a, in draft form, it was 10 pages. And a year later, after public consultation, it had grown to 300 pages. So that's an example of how the kind of consultation process can lead to an explosion in size. I think incrementalism is a big problem in writing these rules as well. We, we tend to kind of build on what's there existingly. It's path dependence. And then this is perhaps a little bit unfair of me to put this last one on the slide, but I think it is actually a factor. So I think there are kind of insider rents, I think I'd call them, within the regulatory system, both in terms of regulators and the firms being regulated. So if you have the specialist knowledge where you understand those 425,000 words within Basel III, you know, you can use that to your own advantage. So you don't really want to see those rules kind of simplified. I think there's an element of truth to that. All right, so does it matter that we've ended up with such a complex system? I'm going to answer that the answer, the, you know, the answer to that question is unambiguously yes. That would be my, my answer. So you, there's some obvious things like compliance costs are enormous. You know, every bank would tell you that. Also, in terms of the regulator, the number of people working, implementing the rules is enormous. I think um, a, a related factor to that is I think complexity is intrinsically anti-competitive. So if you think of it as basically being a fixed cost to you know, understanding implementing, interpreting the rules, that gives incumbents, large banks, a big advantage. More importantly for me is I think complex rules, there's, there's no kind of right or wrong here, but I think there's, there's at least a potential that complex rules could be less effective in meeting their aims. I say that for like two reasons. So my, again, my personal experience um, is that there's actually very few people in the world who actually understand the current system of regulation. I think I would probably put it as strongly as that. And I think that's kind of not a good thing, <laughs> just a priori, in terms of you know, having a system that works well. If you wanted to kind of put it in more scientific terms, so there is kind of interesting research out there that in, in environments of uncertainty where you can't write down the full probability distribution of future states of the world, simple rules can often do better than complex rules. I think it's kind of very much case dependent, so there's no general theory around this. If you want some kind of intuition for why that happens, it's, it's kind of, in the econometrics language, it's linked to the variance bias trade-off idea. This is the idea that you can basically overfit the past with a very complex model. So that's why simplicity can sometimes be beneficial. The last point I'd make is really an accountability one. So I think complex rules, with complex rules, it's harder to know whether the regulator is doing a good job or not. Um, I think evidence, the first bit of evidence I'd point to there is the well-documented enormous variability in risk weights across banks for what seem like the same exposures. I think we still don't understand why that's happened. A number of countries have had a downward trend in the average risk weight in the system through time. The UK certainly has. I don't think there's really an acceptable definition or oh, explanation for why that's happened. So that points to an accountability problem for me. There's a, um, an amazing example from the UK recently where one of our largest mortgage lenders um, revised its CET1 capital ratio from, I think the number was 36% in 2021 to 24%. So a 12 percentage point fall in its capital ratio, basically just because of a model change. So you know, that's, that's not a healthy system for me. All right, so tangible ideas for what we could actually do to attack um, regulatory complexity. And I want to 
try and put some concrete things on the table that you guys can react to. I think there's like two broad routes forward um, here that people have thought about a little bit. So the first one is, it's well known that Basel III introduced a bunch of new regulation, new regulatory rules, leverage, NSFR, LCR, all these different acronyms. So one idea is we could just get rid of some of those rules we've introduced. And the two things that have been like in the crosshairs are the leverage ratio and the NSFR. Now I'm not gonna have time to kind of go into the arguments as to why you know, it's been proposed that they are eliminated. I'm just, perhaps we can get into that in the discussion. I'm just gonna say for now that I don't find either of those arguments convincing at all. So I think the leverage ratio is an absolutely key, you know, fundamental component of the, the regulatory system in my eyes. It's there to kind of protect against us underestimating risk weights in a way that we didn't expect and then finding out that we've got huge leverage in the system in, in ways we didn't realize. I'll just remind you all that sovereign risk weights is still zero right now, right? So if you wanted a clear example. So I think the idea of removing constraints for me isn't the right way to go, and I'm gonna argue instead that we should try and simplify the things we've already introduced. And I think there's lots of potential for doing that. The, um, the example I wanna kind of build on is a recent speech that was given by the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, Sam Woods, who is in charge of the PRA, so the supervision part of the Bank of England. And his proposal, which, I mean, it relates to the really nice discussion we had um, in Javier's session yesterday about buffers and the you know, plethora of buffers we have in the system. So Sam's proposal is really that we consolidate all of these buffers we've introduced through Basel III into a single consolidated buffer that would be fully releasable in a stress, okay? This would be purely held in common equity, so we wouldn't have cocos in the system anymore. We'd kind of simplify in terms of the, you know, the definition of capital. Sam describes this as being something that would be calibrated to reflect both macro prudential considerations and micro. So the story he has in mind, which I think is quite compelling, is the macro prudential authority would be in charge of the aggregate level of the buffer for the system. And then the micro prudential authority would decide how that's distributed across banks within the overall envelope. Sam suggests that we should basically remove entirely the system of automatic distribution restrictions that we introduced through Basel III. So these kind of, this escalating layer of, you know, more and more stringent distribution restrictions, which I think many people argue hinders buffer usability, and I think there's probably some truth in that. So his, his idea is instead of that, we should have something much fuzzier, a conversation between the supervisor and the bank, and yeah, I think there's probably an element of truth that that would make these buffers more usable. But of course you wouldn't need it if you were gonna release the buffer anyway. Um, he would retain the idea that we would impose, you know, in extreme states of the world and across the board dividend restriction, a the theme we discussed yesterday as well. And then one pretty interesting element of the proposal, he doesn't put numbers on this, but he basically says the buffer should be the vast majority of the system. The minimum, if we retain it, should be just something that's right at the bottom. So it's actually a reallocation to. And I'm going to say I'm mostly in like complete agreement with these proposals, and I've long thought this would be a good idea, although I don't think they go anywhere near far enough. So I'm going to try and kind of give you my views of extra places we can we could simplify. Before I do that, let me just pick up a couple of things. So visually, if you want to just get a sense of what his proposal looks like. We take the kind of current version of Basel III on the left with all its buffers, and we'd replace it with a single fully releasable buffer. Then there is a question about what the balance between the minimum and the buffer would be in that new proposal. All right, so one obvious reaction to this is, okay, that sounds great, that is simplifying, you know, we have fewer acronyms to keep track of. Has anything actually changed? You know, you've kind of just relabeled a bunch of buffers. I think that perhaps is true, you know, so the question is, you know, the meat of the proposal really is, you know, is it leading you to a different calibration of buffers across the system? And I've argued, or 
picking up Sam's argument, really, you know, if, if this does mean we have a smaller minimum and a larger releasable buffer, that would pass that first test. And then the second one really is this question about how important and effective is it to have a buffer that you can release in a stress. And I think, you know, we can kind of use the experience from 2010 where, sorry, 2020, where all the regulators who applied the CCYB in advance slashed that, that CCYB. Um, they also found kind of ingenious ways of cutting other buffers that on an ad hoc basis that weren't intended to be cut. So it feels like it is meeting a demand, at least, for more flexibility in the capital framework. It's jury is still out on how effective these releases can be and whether the market requirements kind of dominate in those states. All right, so I'm just going to end with like three areas that I think we could go even further than Sam's proposal. I'll try and be a bit provocative um, if we wanted to simplify. And I think these should really be on the Basel Committee's agenda, personally. I'll start with the easiest, and that's the leverage ratio. So I think, you know, if we took Sam's proposals as a kind of a benchmark, the obvious way to introduce the leverage ratio on top of that would just be to introduce a single flat scaling parameter that's applied to the, the buffer and the minimum in Sam's proposal. And that scaling parameter would determine the minimum average risk weight that we allow in the system. Right? So you, you just have a single number, a single parameter that you'd multiply the risk-weighted stack by to arrive at the leverage stack. That's, I think, a lot simpler than the system we currently have. And it would allow for some release of leverage constraints as well in a stress. Second idea really relates to the counter-cyclical capital buffer. I think in hindsight, I mean, in a full mea culpa, I was part of the Basel Committee group that designed the buffer in the first place. I think in hindsight, it was a mistake, in my view, to design such a complex system here. So I don't know if you are fully au fait with the way the counter-cyclical buffer operates, but it's basically, um, it's the buffer that applies to any individual bank will depend on where it's lending in the world. So if you've got a big bank that's got exposures around the world, its buffer will be a weighted average of all the countries it's lending to. And the impact of that is when we kind of turn on the buffer in the United Kingdom, say, the impact on HSBC's capital ratio is peanuts because you're only getting the UK pass through. And I think in hindsight, that was an, an error. And I think it would be simpler just to have a one-for-one -one add on that any national authority can, can choose to implement depending on what's happening domestically. Um, I would kind of, the second point I'd make really is the CCYB is, I mean, we discussed this yesterday, but it's not being used anywhere near as actively as was envisaged when these rules were being written down. You know, I'll point out it wasn't applied in the United States or China in the years before 2010, even though financial conditions looked pretty frothy to me. I don't know what the solution to that actually is. It could be that we try and have a higher steady state buffer that's kind of always on. I would personally like to see a more rules-based system, I think, for building up the buffer in good times. I think it's unlikely we'll get that, but that's, that's where I would go if I had um, some control. All right, so they're the two areas I think that they're not super controversial. I, I'm gonna argue, though, that, that if we only went that far, we'd have a real illusion that we'd made the system simpler. Because, you know, you could look at the capital stack and describe it as a minimum and a buffer and the other bits would be simpler too. I think it would be an illusion because the real complexity in the Basel rules is all about the denominator. It's about how risk weights are calculated. If you, want, if you don't believe me and you want some evidence on this. So this is a chart showing you the word counts of the different chapters of Basel III, as you can find on the current BIS website. So those kind of highlighted bars there, that's basically the, sec the sections of Basel III that are doing risk weights for credit risk and risk weights for market risk. So that's kind of where the complexity lies. My view is that it was a major error to introduce um, internal models into the Basel process in the first place. It was a catastrophic decision to do that. I think it kind of underestimates, the people who designed this underestimated the potential 
um, the vulnerability of such models for gaming, basically. Um, so what I would like to see personally is the Basel Committee reviewing the use of these models and developing a standard that's solely based on relatively simple standardized risk weights. I think that, that's the way forward for me. Um, probably issues we can discuss in the panel. So let me summarize my, my remarks. So hopefully argue that regulatory complexity is an important problem, it's something we need to address. Didn't really go into this, but I think arguments for removing existing constraints are not convincing, they're not compelling. And I think there's lots of scope for simplifying the things we've already got, and that would go a long way to making the system more interpretable. I think the buffer framework can quite simply be, um, be simplified. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, I think the scope for looking at the leverage ratio and potentially the CCYB and making streamlining efforts there. The big ticket issue really is um, the use of internal models, which I would eliminate. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this, uh, what I found to be an amusing cartoon by Rube Goldberg, which describes his version of a mouse trap, which I think is a, an apt metaphor for um, this whole process. Stop there. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Please take a seat on stage. The discussion followed by the speech will be moderated by Mr. David Aikman, who will be joined in the discussion by Mr. Andres Alonso, senior economist at the Central Bank of Spain, and Mr. Malcolm Kemp, member of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board, who will join us online. Unfortunately, due to a last minute change by Mr. Prasanagai, professor of macroeconomics at the University of Auckland, cannot be here with us today. Mr. Alonso, please join us on stage. Mr. Aikman, now I pass the word to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It is very bright here. I realize what people were saying when they were in the seats earlier. Um, so, yeah, let me just start by saying, unfortunately, um, Prasanna Guy, who was going to be the third member of the panel, hasn't been very well, um, so he won't be joining us. But um, i delighted to say we have Andres Alonso, I hope I've pronounced your name reasonably well, and Malcolm Kemp, who I hope you can see, or I can certainly see on my screen, so hello Malcolm, thanks for joining us. So I wonder if the way we're going to structure this is we'll have two opening talks um, from our panelists. We'll see how the time goes. I might ask a round of questions, and then we'll open the floor to a discussion. Malcolm, I wonder if it makes sense for you to go first, because I think look, looking at your presentation, oh, I see, sorry, Andres's slides are already up. So I, perhaps it doesn't really matter. So Andres, would you like to kick off? Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation. At the beginning, I have to admit that uh, I found myself a little bit an outlier coming from financial innovation. I, I, I'm working financial innovation in the Bank of Spain, so not working on system-wide um, issues, but more at entity level. But I think, David, that we will have to find a compromise because my talk is about complexity and, and the need for complexity. So I was not expecting your, <laughs> your outcome. But I think that we can find a compromise. And I'm going to talk about something that also I got inspired by the keynote of Fabian at the beginning, that machine learning, it's a, it's a new trend, it's a new challenge for banks. Um, nothing has still been said or studied at system-wide level, but we are at the correct timing that we really can experiment and research about what institutions can be do at the individual level. So that's our task here. We do not belong like financial innovation division. We do not belong to the supervisory arm, neither to the research team. We are in between. So we talk with the, with the industry. We have industry dialogues, and we talk also with our internal people from supervisory, and we provide a little bit of research and analysis as our own input. No? Um, so 
we were concerned, and uh, our concern was raised by our people from the supervisory uh, arm about exactly what you said, David, the complexity of the new models that banks are, are coming, are putting on the table. Um, it's fair to say that it's not strictly new. We have had like neural networks and the like for some years ago, um, but it was not systematic. It was just spin-offs, uh, one, one, one per time. Now it's like more common. The pressure is like the models are there, the technology is here, and banks are feeling the need to be understood. However, these models are yet not included in the regulation. So from there, our, our, our willingness to study. So what we did is like benefiting from, from our position in the, in the central bank, we, we had the access to, to granular data, to real data. So we wanted to experiment like what, are, what is the feeling of the bank wanted to implement one of these models for a regulated issue like credit scoring. Just a little bit of disclaimer, but we do like several other things. And by the way, uh, again, David, we have done quite of the same analysis as yours, but for the Spanish regulation. We have also gone into the normative complexity and the legal complexity of anything that has been issued by the Bank of Spain with kind of the same conclusion as you. Um, this is the, the, the line of research I wanted to, to convey to you today. Um, the first is, the, the, let's say, the motivation of our research comes from this uh, industry dialogue and this um, feeling that there is a potential really uh, good economic impact of using more complex models. So in this sense, we would be um, trying to understand, not from a statistical point of view, like there are so many papers and research done on, you know, machine learning models are outperforming statistically, other like linear regressions and more traditional econometric tools. But we wanted to put a, a money value on it. Um, there, there was something done regarding a potential new businesses created and financial inclusion. And if you are more accurate, you can just give loans to more people because you predict better the, predict the probability of default. But we wanted to take another route. Uh, let's say with the already portfolios that you have outstanding, what is the improvement in the risk-weighted assets? Um, and, and again, our stance at the beginning was neutral, but the stance of the institutions is that there are potential significant savings. And we concluded that the savings, having a real portfolio of a credit retail portfolio from a big Spanish bank, was significant, was in the two, uh, uh, two digits, you know, like up to 17%. So we say like, you know, there is potential big issue here going on. We have to study also the embedded risks because we acknowledge that is another kind of modeling. So there are another kind of model risk factors. And that's the second paper. So we wanted to put on the table like all the buzzwords that were already like already starting to, to happen there, like overfeeding, like uh, data privacy, and these kind of things that were like really connected to machine learning, but nowhere in the regulation you could see that that was a problem. However, when banks were sitting with the supervisors, those buzzwords were in the conversations. So we wanted to convey a, a framework to put something on the table to say, you know, how, how should we account for these new model risk factors? That's the second paper. And the third one is, you know, more complexity here, more complexity can give you savings, also give you risks, but can also the technology help you to mitigate these risks? And we are finding like the big topic here, like the big model risk factor is interpretability, like to open the black box models and to really understand how these neural networks and random forests and the like uh, are explainable. So can we really take control of the predictions of these models? And that's our third line, uh, third article and, and, and current line of research. And we are trying to dig deeper into these interpretability techniques. Um, so, just very briefly, uh, for anybody who may have more interest, I'm happy just to share more, more insights on the articles, but the first one says that, you know, more complex models give you more accuracy, you, you know, it gives you better granularity, so when you have to discern about the, discriminate like the, uh, the risky buckets uh, uh, following the internal rating-based approach so that we would not be killing, uh, we having the, prob the, the possibility to access these new tools give you just a, a better accuracy of your predictions, so you can discriminate better, so when you go to risk weighted assets, you just get some savings. So that's, that's a benefit that we cannot forget. Like, um, we are here also with this trade-off, and, and all, all, all my topic, my uh, discussion today could be about trade-offs, you know, but I want to say that there is a potential benefit here. It's not that we want to allow models just because of the sake of complexity, you know? We want to allow a thing that may allow us to go farther, to uh, reach financial inclusion, 
and to save uh, uh, potentially euros to the banks. Um, but there are risk factors. And what we just concluded in the second one is that, you know, we want to compare the models on a, on, on a fair basis. Basically, not only about the famous accuracy like, like rock and other precision and, and recall and whatever the metric you want to take, but we want to adjust those metrics by the complexity of the model. You know, are neural networks so famous? Are, are, are the best models and the most efficient ones? We conclude that no. They are not the most efficient ones when we adjust for the model risk that they bring to the bank and to the system. However, there is a big risk factor, at least from our opinion right now on the table, that is the interpretability, explainability, transparency, whatever you want to call it, of these models. Um, we, we, we are changing the paradigm from uh, simple linear regressions to hundreds to thousands of uh, potential features embedded in the models. So we have to be comfortable. And, it, and it's correct that the regulation is simplicity. And in that sense, we also need to be uh, reliable. And, uh, and the fidelity of the explanation has to be there. So what we started, when we started our research, we were really, doubt, we were really doubtful about the potential of uh, new techniques to really open these black boxes. But what we feel as of today is that um, the university is advancing so quickly. So there are currently very interesting lines of research trying to open these black boxes. Basically, we are taking two big of the most famous one, now that is supply values that uh, are relying on game theory, and basically everything goes uh, permutation, no? like changing all the features. This involves more complexity also and a other level that is uh, computational complexity, computational cost. But the, but the results are promising. I, I'm not saying that this is as, as of today here, but um, it, it's really a, a discussion that we could have, like whether it's more interpretable as static linear regression or something like uh, the explanations given by one of these techniques that actually give you further and broader insights on the uh, magnitude, direction, and combination of interaction between all the features. So actually, sometimes we have not to forget that simplicity it's not mandatory, but that simplicity sometimes always has, may have also a cost, no? Um, so that's, that's just to bring some food for thought for the discussion. Um, so I, I just sum up uh, like opportunities and challenges. Basically, we are in the financial innovation division, but we want also to convey the message that you know there is a potential benefit here. So there's a trade-off. And on the trade-off, there is regulation. Regulation has to be stable, has to be predictable, has to be simple. Uh, and there are so many new risk factors, and we have discrimination, biases, so a, a lot of challenges for the regulation. But just yes, the second message, I, and I will stop here, is that regula regulatory um, uh, authorities cannot compete with each other, so they should collaborate. And when you know we have concerns on data privacy, be careful because maybe that is against explainability and this kind of thing. So uh, there is also potential. Um, um, game to be played between the regulatory authorities that they, they should work together uh, at the time of, of regulating in order, David, not to become even more complex with overlying uh, 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 regulatory requirements. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Andres. That was lots and lots of food for thought. Malcolm, can we hand over to you? So I think we'll just wait for your slides to come up. Yes. Um, it sounds like you're having a fascinating time. Uh, my apologies that I can't be in beautiful Budapest uh, this afternoon. Um, although they're titled uh, the presentation, I think uh, they're more really just um, a few remarks. And I'll try and weave in uh, one or two comments on uh, both your presentation, um, uh, David, and also Andres's uh, presentation. I'm hoping I know how these slides move forward. Um, is that right? Okay, yeah, brilliant. Um, just to give you a, little, a bit of background about myself, I'm a member of the ESRB Advisory Scientific Committee. I think there are several other members who um, you will have heard from uh, um, either earlier today or yesterday. Uh, I've co-authored a couple of reports uh, with other members of uh, that committee. Uh, that hopefully are relevant to uh, the discussions that we're having uh, this afternoon, one on regulatory complexity and one on uh, will video kill, 
the Radio Star and that's digitalization. Uh, I'm an actuary by background uh, with a, a focus on investment management. So I, I kind of come from a slightly outsider's perspective and hopefully I can uh, I contribute in that way too to this uh, uh, panel discussion. Um, the suggestion was that there'd be three main areas that we'd focus on, one being regulatory complexity. Uh, David, your, your uh, excellent uh, talk covers that. One on the macroprudential toolkit, which I will try and cover very briefly, and also one on digitalization, which I think Andrew's uh, presentation gives some hints on. Uh, so just uh, a few uh, obvious comments on regulatory complexity. Uh, the financial system the regulation is very complicated and, and we've seen strong evidence earlier um, this afternoon. Uh, but of course, the system is also complex. Uh, so, and the system has faced lots of different stresses uh, and there is this inherent justification for having some regulation uh, the information asymmetry. The question is whether we've got the, the balance right. Uh, and one of the things I would highlight uh, throughout my remarks is that I think an important driver of uh, regulation and regulatory complexity uh, and the where you should position this trade off uh, relates to regulatory perimeters. And I, I would here highlight that within the banking world, we tend to say the regulatory perimeter, um, but uh, it, you came from the insurance space, you'd be talking about the insurance regulatory perimeter or the asset managers, they're subject to regulation. There's a different regulatory perimeter for them. So there's all sorts of different regulatory perimeters uh, which each in our individual um, areas will tend to kind of abstract away. But I think that itself adds uh, additional complexity and likely requirement for complexity. Uh, some initial thoughts about that complexity and whether it's practical to uh, reduce it. Um, uh, looking at uh, VAL2, there were some areas that were definitely underemphasized. And here I'm thinking particularly of liquidity risk. Uh, looked at more generally, the way I see at least capital regulation uh, is essentially that if a business uh, suffers some kind of fail, yeah, a business model uh, goes awry. Uh, typically the firm has very little franchise value and the issue that you want is some method of ensuring that there's enough uh, of net assets uh, minus liabilities uh, that you could transfer that business uh, without it being too painful. Um, so it does seem to me that when you get to that kind of stage, uh, all the different risks and all the different buckets that we might have otherwise focused on are, um, they kind of become less relevant. Uh, and so some of the complexity that I think uh, bedevils the banking regulation is uh, uh, a consequence of our own history. Um, and things like the interest rate risk in the banking book, uh, it seems to me that you need that to somehow or other link with how interest rate is uh, treated, not in the banking book. Otherwise, it, you inherently run into challenges. And because we've had um, uh, different frameworks and different parts of uh, bank balance sheets, uh, we're going to have some complexity unless you were wanting to rip up uh, those differences. So uh, I've got here just a list of the few principles that we picked up in our ASC report uh, and what I've just been highlighting there is one of them which is uh, resolvability and I think there's much more focus on resolvability uh, since 2010 um, whether that justifies the huge increase in complexity a um, bit more doubtful. Uh, turning to um, other uh, areas um, I, I think I'd agree with you David uh, quite strongly that the uh, the buffers um, do seem to be rather um, uh, complex. So I've highlighted here an outside or an outsider's perspective. Uh, there seem to be loads of different buffers, all, well, not all, but they seem to have relatively similar purposes. They interact in very complicated ways in all sorts of other kind of requirements. Uh, and yeah, quite why we need that level of complexity is uh, uh, doubtful. Um, 
uh, would just add though that uh, I can see other types of tools and uh, more activity based uh, tools um, that um, maybe are less well developed uh, and if we want uh, complexity targeted in the right direction then maybe we need to focus a little bit more attention on those those tools um, and of course uh, the banking industry isn't um, a kind of uh, in uh, splendid isolation it has to face other angles there's the political goals which by the capital markets union which have tried to one can argue de-emphasize banking compared to other capital markets uh, funding sources. Uh, and also we see this big uh, digitalization drive. Um, and just on the digitalization, which kind of picks up a little bit uh, with uh, Andrew's uh, comments. So there's a, a much more recent ASC report that I contributed to uh, looking at digitalization and the future of banking. Um, it does seem to me that uh, we'll focus more on the non-financial, at least the less financial, so less on market risk and credit risk, uh, more on operational risks. Uh, you can uh, envisage certain outcomes if, for example, a big tech um, uh, came into this space in, uh, in uh, volume, or if uh, central governments issued uh, very attractive uh, central bank digital currencies uh, where uh, incumbents are um, uh, very uh, subject to disruption. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that, again, uh, what you're talking about here is uh, the regulatory perimeter in danger of, of swiping an awful lot of uh, what we think of as, uh, um, uh, as the banking activity. Uh, so I, I think uh, when it comes to regulatory complexity, um, the key kind of focus should be on how you handle this regulatory perimeter or perimeters, as I've highlighted, and how you ensure that um, the industry is well placed if there is some kind of need um, for uh, a greater number of exits, orderly exits uh, from the industry if some of these uh, directions of travel actually come to pass. So those are my uh, uh, opening remarks, um, but uh, I think the aim is to allow um, uh, others to ask uh, questions and to uh, take us wherever uh, you wish us to go. Malcolm, thank you very much. That was really, really useful um, scene setting. Perhaps I'll kick off with a few questions myself, and then we can kind of open the floor so you can think of some questions you're in the audience. That would be great. Um, why don't we do it in the order of um, speakers, if that, if that sounds okay. So, Andres, you, you, know, you presented some very interesting material about um, how machine learning techniques can be used to make capital savings for banks. Um, I'd be interested, maybe you can kind of expand on, on that question and, you know, is it both in terms of these are just battle, better models of PD, LGD, or is it also related to kind of lowering compliance costs associated with complying with the very complex set of rules that we have? What, if you could expand on these, you know, where those savings actually come from, that would be useful. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's interesting that it's a, it, it gets a little bit technical, but I, um, I would sum it up like uh, seeing that you gain the accuracy in the calibration. I mean, you, you, you get a better possibility to discern uh, at a very low level of probability for this uh, uh, unexpected loss um, who is more risky than the other. And you are able to do it on a stable and, and, and robust way. So I would say that is a statistical power, actually. But it's true to say that when you talk about uh, IRB systems, there are more things embedded. So uh, we completely acknowledge that challenge. And machine learning is not that good in all the topics of, uh, let's say, calculating the capital requirements. That's also why we have like an opinion that machine learning may assist on some of the tasks that are required for capital requirements, but you don't need to do it for everything, like from, from black to white or the other way around. Uh, as you have the intuition, there are things about data privacy, uh, technology providers, 
quality of data, um, also governance of the models, uh, understanding of the models by the hierarchy and the people in in involved in the process, and that's be that becomes more challenging. So you get savings because statistically you just do it better, but to uh, govern the model becomes harder. Uh, at this point in time, the question for the people involved in, let's say, these teams of data science is, is it that because of the models or because of the data? You know, we, we have more data, and act, actually, we, we, I think that we can agree that the, the world is more complex because we get more data, just because we are able to get to that behavioral data that we were not able to, to, to store it before. And you know the biases are in the data, and let's say that the problems in the data, and even dealing with a very simple linear regression for a very big systemic bank is done quite complex. It's a quite a complex task. So it involves mathematicians, involves uh, economists, and regulatory compliance teams, and so many profiles. That brings me to the need to maybe update the skills of the people just to make everything a little bit more compatible and simpler. Um, but I still find a room for machine learning, at least at, uh, somewhere in the process. Could I ask you a couple of follow-ups? So these were kind of in my mind while you, were, while you were speaking. So I guess one is a question about the impact of the pandemic on these machine learning models, where how can I express my concern? I guess basically we saw like a very large drop, unprecedented drop in GDP and asset prices. But as we heard yesterday in one of the talks, bankruptcies didn't increase, right? Defaults didn't increase because of enormous government supports. And how do you kind of capture that in the models? And is there a risk that the models will be spitting out too benign projections for losses as a result of this experience? Yeah, you, you, you picked a very, very well point. Um, the, the, the concern, uh, it's called in the regulation stability of the predictions, and uh, it's quite easy for a supervisor to kill any of these models because you just ask for, through the cycle, predictions of the PD, and then you kill anybody going with an error network because basically you are not beating any stable uh, model like linear regression where you can't impose the relationship between the variables. I don't want to go technical, but you are absolutely right that we need more time to test these kind of models. Mm -hmm. uh, this does not say that, that the tools themselves have the power to work very well out of sample. So we should also not, not uh, buy the arguments that maybe are simplistic, not simple, that just because we are training on a data set, we are learning garbage in, garbage out. I mean, there has so much uh, knowledge put on these models that from a technical perspective, we can make them very robust, but for a supervisor, we still need more comfortability for through the cycle PDs and this kind of stress that the supervisors require. But in order to show them these results, we need to start. So that's kind of the things that I think that we are starting to have, like, and, and, and I feel very optimistic. For, for example, the EBA is having an industry dialogue about using machine learning on, on IRB models. Germany did the same, and this is the kind of environment, like a sandbox, where you can try to try these things out and see what happens when you impose these kind of things that you mentioned, like COVID crisis or just killing everything because suddenly something changes. So we have to still get some time to learn about the impact. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Malcolm, I might turn to you, if I may, and just pick up a couple of the points you raised in your, your very nice opening remarks as well. But maybe you could tell us to start with, so um, this really comprehensive ASC or Advisory Scientific Committee report on complexity, Where's that actually landed now? So I guess you published the report. Did it actually? Did you end up with some pre, some kind of suggestions for areas you'd like to see simplified? Is this now on the ASC's work agenda going forwards? How, how does it fit into the the policy making process, if, if you like? Yeah. Okay. So um, so the 
ASC is a committee of the uh, ESRB. Um, it's primarily external uh, individuals, economists, uh, academics, uh, etc. Um, we do obviously think about uh, the policy aspects, um, but at the end of the day, um, we are coming up with um, a kind of broader uh, perspective. So, in fact, Prasanna was one of the uh, co-authors um, of the report. It, it's, uh, I think, it's probably a little bit more conceptual than has seen uh, um, a huge focus in terms of. Uh, um, kind of specific policies that have picked up. So it's trying to, uh, uh, I guess, guide that direction of travel. Uh, and I mean, some of the comments that you uh, opened up with uh, in your presentation are ones that are rehearsed and analysed and considered in, in more detail uh, in, within the report. And then there's some uh, policy recommendations that are typically uh, included uh, towards the end. So that's kind of the way that these um, uh, ASC uh, reports uh, um, work. Uh, they're not sort of specifically um, in any way kind of policy uh, that uh, the ESRB has agreed that it will uh, pursue. Um, uh, that's the role of the general board. We are coming up with um, uh, thoughts, um, but from a position of able to yeah, understand uh, both the policy uh, direction, uh, but also uh, trying to bring uh, academic rigor to the uh, debate. Um, I mean, just picking up on your earlier question as to uh, Andres, so that's covered in this second report that I referred to. And I think your, um, uh, in your opening comments, you were uh, querying the role of internal models and um, clearly, uh, the more that you build in sophisticated uh, machine learning into that type of computation, uh, the more um, uh, uh, the challenges that might arise uh, if you're also uh, linking that into the internal model space. Uh, and um, uh, machine learning, um, very powerful at uh, telling you um, relationships that exist in the data, uh, not so obviously um, capable of uh, identifying relationships that don't exist in the data, which I think was your purpose of your uh, uh, question or alluded to in your question. Uh, the other thing I'd highlight on the machine learning is um, there is, of course, a risk that the banks don't have that as their competitive uh, edge. Um, and if one thinks of uh, the people who uh, you would typically go to for machine learning expertise, uh, they would tend to be the big tech companies. Uh, so again, um, it plays to this question as to where will the digitalization uh, uh, ultimately end up. But I think you're going to be covering that more in the next panel session than in this panel session. Thank you very much. I wonder if there are any questions from the audience. We've got three here. so. So I got the benefit of the microphone being close to me. Uh, thank you very much for the very stimulating uh, presentations. I, I agree with aspects of all of them. And thank you, Malcolm, for reflecting on two of the uh, reports uh, from the ASC. Um, I'm going to make three remarks that are uh, potentially contradictory with each other. Uh, the first is that uh, as an economist working in academia, I like simple models, models in which I understand what is going on. But at the same time, I think we, we should be modest and, and, and notice that the world is complicated and continuously trying to look at the, at the complex world with simple models might be missing something, right? So if the private sector is max massively adopting what we could think at first instance as black boxy approaches to the reality, um, I think that the regulators and supervisors of the future should not uh, lose track of, uh, say, artificial intelligence as a potential useful uh, tool. Uh, it will be very interesting to see what is going on. And in that sense, I welcome uh, Andres' work in this area. 
which I, I but I was a bit surprised on the focus. So, so it, my reinterpretation of what you have done with co-authors is uh, exploring what the industry might be doing using artificial intelligence with their credit-oriented uh, data. At the end of the day, they might be saving on capital. They might be optimizing on the on the risk weight. So this is connected to. Uh, this is connected to David's actual concerns about the internal models. So if we remain in the world of internal models, the industry will uh, use increasingly sophisticated methods to impute uh, PDs and LGDs or whatever else is needed. And, and there are two possible views, two polar views. One is that with these models, we get closer to the real values of PDs and LGDs. In that sense, okay, if the formula is based on, 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 on the right assumptions and uh, with these numbers we will be uh, asking banks to have a level of capital closer to the desired level of capital. But alternatively, these techniques could be optimizing on the data mining side. So in the universe of models, uh, you, you detect the one that gives you the lowest uh, risk weights. And this is the one you pick, and then for the supervisor it's a challenge to, to detect that you pick the model that gives you the uh, best uh, risk weights uh, from your private perspective. So I was trying to think a little bit that actually under any of the two views, if at the end of the day for a given loan portfolio using artificial intelligence, banks are able to operate with lower capital, uh, they will be less resilient than before. <laughs> so, so for a given portfolio, my first reaction to the existence of these techniques is that we need higher capital requirements uh, to offset the optimization on the risk rates. But then I have to go into second round effects. Uh, uh, the capital requirements are important for pricing and eventually for portfolio selection. So I think that keeping an eye on all these three uh, things uh, together in the future is then, uh, I mean, one lesson that I extract from, uh, from uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Should we continue? Um Paul, if you'd like to ask your question. We'll collect a few and then you guys can respond. So thanks, thanks for the super interesting presentations. I um, learned a lot. My question relates to, so, so David, I think you talked about this um, idea of a retrospective on what elements of the capital stack were being actively used. And one of the questions you'd asked was about counter-cyclical capital buffer. Now that one was quite prescriptive when it came to the, the, the risk buildup phase. And there was a credit to GDP gap. There's a whole bunch of, even I think if I recall formulas were in, 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 in these written documents are a bit unusual. No? And, and so with that in mind, I wanted to ask the following two questions, and they're related. So one is, is, is constrained discretion maybe, was that a failure? Do we have to think about heuristics or rules which govern the build-up phase? And, and recalling there is a build-up and a release phase, like other facets of life, the release phase, you know it when you see it, but the build-up phase is predictive and it's much harder. Um, so is there a case for rules to be in, the, in, in this framework as a means of just circumventing entirely discretion? The second question was the build-up and the release phases are, are two distinct phases when it comes to releasable buffers. So either the, the counter-cyclical capital buffer or the Sam Woods, I don't know what you want to call it, mega buffer, if there's a releasable part, do we give up entirely on the, the, build, the risk build-up trying to get rid of this as a name which is unachievable and focus merely on resilience or is there hope for the risk build-up phase to be something we could actually tackle? So David, I really liked your presentation. You asked a question though, and I think I know the answer to it. So the, you asked, why is there so much dispersion in risk weights? And to my mind, the answer is pretty simple. Risk is a latent process. We can only infer that latent process by how some ob object prices move in the past. And that means you can, unlike th the temperature, you can put a temperature into the air here, you find out the temperature is 22 degrees, 0.35. Uh, you can measure temperature as precisely as you want by a thermometer. 
because risk is a latent process, you can only measure risk by a model. And because every model by definition is wrong, and you have no, really no proper way of discriminating between models, effectively there's an infinite number of candidate risk measurements, all equally plausible ex ante. And that is why I think you get all this dispersion. And what, what, what I've done in the past is I measured the real confidence bound of risk measures. It is enormously large. So in one case, we picked the expected shortfall in Basel III, using the Basel III methodology, under a true model, the confidence bound, if the true number is 100, was from 40 to 300. By random chance, one bank gets 40, by random chance, another bank gets 300, and both are doing the correct thing. So I think that is really what the, this complexity you identify in Basel III is really trying to put a structure on something you can't put a structure on. So this is why I think this is, it, it's, it's complexity for no discernible reason, it doesn't deliver much utility. And I very much agreed with what you said, is that you said the problem is risk sensitivity in regulations. But I would add one more layer to that, which is, I think the problem is we focus too much on individual institution resiliency and we don't focus on system resiliency. And the answer to system resiliency is very much different because you can have, if you try to make everybody safe, that increases systemic risk because you reduce shock absorption, absorption so ability. So the Macro proof should not try to make every institution safe. That's exactly the wrong objective if you want to get financial stability. So. Three great questions there. I wonder if, Andres, if you'd like to begin, maybe feel yes. free to address all of them, but particularly Javier's question. Javier's concern. Uh, uh, you described it pretty well in the picture. It's a, it's a trade-off. Um, um, what, what we see is that basically we have also to be aware and, and, and to say it aloud what we have as of today regarding simplicity in IRB. Uh, a normal average model is, is, is nothing like, let's say, public, but it's unofficially uh, known, uh, may have like the, the form of a, of a logistic regression with around 13 variables. Why? Because that passes the supervisory test, meaning questions on the table of the supervisory person, asking about through the cycle, seeing what, do you ha what, what does it happen if I change this variable, this other variable. So really allows the supervisor to stay calm. But think about 13 variables. Are that enough to really describe the complex world that we're living on? From there to a thousand features in a neural, deep neural network, there is a long way to go. So there are so many things that we can just still be open-minded to see at what point in the validation of IRB models, maybe that we have the possibility to allow machine learning to help. I would not go for the maximum, but I would say that there are, there are things that may, may really help us to really get a better understanding of the usefulness of the model. And I, I'm picking just the sentence that you said at the, at the beginning, like all the models are wrong, but the sentence goes on and says that some of them are useful. So I would say that we have to decide which are useful. Nobody says that the model perfectly describes everything, but it does exist a metric about the usefulness of the model, and Javier mentioned it, it's like if you really can depict the estimated PD that matches the historical PD. So I don't want to be technical, but I mean, if you really are good predicting, you are good predicting. Uh, and that will allow also to give you credit to more people. So there are always trade-offs in the finance and in economics, and what I always want to put on the table is that if we want to go conservative, it's very easy, but we, we have to allow the innovation to happen because it also has benefits. The way is at what pace uh, and, and, and with how many number of rules. But I, I, this is the discussion I would like to open. Like, we can just close our eyes, say it's more complex, but actually, the reality is that it is not strictly more complex. It opens the possibility to get further financial inclusion, and there are possibilities to mitigate the risks. And also, the simplicity uh, sometimes is not always more beneficial, because uh, if we are more comfortable with uh, a regression, Javier, because we, always, we only have like parameters, and we know like how to make causal inference about the things, 
maybe just the interpretation we're having, it's transparent and white box, but it's wrong. Maybe if you get a more insightful model, you can get more interaction between the features and really understand that better. So machine learning is also working on causality. So uh, it's not still here, but if you listen to the people working on this, the, the, what I want to say is that the, the results are very promising. Of course, it's not to be in production tomorrow, but results are promising. And we have to unlock these guys to make things happen. Uh, and that's why I, I, I really feel comfortable now in this stage, because I, I know it's a future risk for the system-wide uh, banking sector, but it's also a potential system-wide opportunity. Uh, and that, that would be my message. Do you think I could kind of like push you one step further on, I, I like the way Javier claimed, uh, phrased this in terms of, you know, there could be two situations, a search for truth versus basically data mining and trying to game the system. So let's just for the moment imagine it's case two. So let's imagine all the banks in the system are basically just trying to arrive at the lowest possible capital requirements and they're not after the truth. I think that's probably true. Is there work that you guys can be doing, you know, recognizing this is an investment and a, you know, something that's coming, you know, we should be aware of. Is there work we can do to make machine learning less susceptible to gaming and this data mining? What, what, how would you respond to this, this concern especially, I suppose? I think we can control for those kind of risks. Uh, in order to really happen what you mentioned is that we should be having like super overfitting of the data and, 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 and maximizing that individual in sample and not out of sample, but, but the statistics are already there. So that should not happen. But in any case, the IRB model is quite complex itself, so you can allow to use whenever, whatever you want. So in order to do the selection of the features, in order to test for the stability, or you don't have to go for the maximum usage of the machine learning model, but when you go into a bank and you talk with the real data science people, they also are aware of these issues, and they, they are the first that they do not want to obtain uh, wrong results. And also be aware that you, when, when, when you talk about the modeling in a bank, they do not use one single model. They all use ensemble models. So they just combine like dozens of models into one only outcome. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to put the burden only on machine learning when the burden might be in so many other instances like the data, the, the, even the skills of the people or, or even the skills of the supervisors. Um, so I, I, I cannot put the burden e everything on machine learning. I, still, I cannot. Thank you very much. Malcolm, would you like to you know, react either to that question or either, either of the others? Take your pick, um, really. Well, uh, can I react to the machine learning? Um, it does seem to me that uh, there are two different, or fundamentally different uses that machine learning can be put to. Uh, with maybe uh, mixing or, or, or kind of bringing together and it's worth uh, uh, differentiating them. The first is to actually work out what the PD uh, uh, loss given default might be uh, for a book of uh, assets. Um, and it seems to me that if you average over the entire banking system, um, the, the book probably doesn't change very much by people um, using machine learning uh, in that computation, whereas, uh, and therefore the risk ultimately hasn't changed very much. So I, I, I think there the risk of gaming the system is very high, um, and um, one would need to be quite careful about how that was being uh, introduced into machine learning, uh, sorry, into uh, uh, internal models. Uh, the other use of machine learning uh, would be to actually decide which uh, loans or which individuals or corporations you want to lend the money to in the first place. And that's where I think the biggest sort of uh, growth in machine learning has been within the banking sector. And there, um, I think there is a, a big first mover advantage uh, because if there is better data, you can price your uh, product more effectively, you can make more money. Uh, of course, it will then hinder everybody else in the industry. So I think there's a, um, a question as to whether we're talking about a zero-sum game here or an approximately zero-sum game. 
and I think it's much more close to an approximately zero sum game uh, when it comes to trying to work out capital requirements as opposed to um, whether you can gain a competitive advantage uh, on others. Um, in terms of the, I think the question was raised about the heuristics and rules. I mean, I personally would, um, uh, in Sam Wood's uh, analysis, uh, I think I would tend to favour increasing the, the minimum uh, and reducing the, the, the buffer size. Um, I think if we've had loads of different buffers created, um, uh, all doing relatively similar purposes, maybe there isn't such a need for uh, as wide a range of, uh, of buffers. And what we should ideally be targeting is the end state where we want the uh, sector as a whole to be uh, better capitalized. Um, but of course, your, your, your comment uh, about uh, what's happened in practice since 2010 highlights that you, you do need a profitable uh, business um, sector for that to actually happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll just react to the um, Paul and John's questions as well, and then we can wrap up. So, Paul, your question, it was a very good question on the CCYB. You framed it in terms of, you know, has discre constrained discretion actually worked? My view on this is that in practice, there's been no constraints on the process, and it's been pure discretion. And I think that is the reason these buffers haven't been applied. Um, the only countries that I think have applied these tools basically wanted much higher capital requirements than Basel III gave anyway, so they just built up these buffers on autopilots. Um, so I think we do need a radical change of the decision-making structure over that, that tool if, it, if we're going to kind of still claim it's part of the macroprudential arsenal. That would be my view. Um, and that could well involve something that's more rules-based. That would be my preference, I think. Um, John, I think your point was very well taken on you know, principle. As there's no true answer out there, and as a range of models consistent with you know valid efforts to try and arrive at the truth. Maybe that's how I'd frame it. But maybe the one piece of evidence I'd throw back at you is the fact that not only is there dispersion in the cross section, but the average risk weight through time has fallen, which I think is indicative of the fact that it's not pure. Banks just trying to do their best given the data, but it's, it is actually gaming. Um, I think we're out of time, at least that's what the clock is telling me. So it's probably time for a coffee, I think you're about to tell us. So why don't we wrap it up here and thank our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts with us on this very highly relevant topic. Now we will take a 20-minute cafe break, which will be followed by the closing session of today on the effects of technology on bank competition and financing the transition to a knowledge economy.
one should cover a topic that points towards the future. The effects of technology on bank competition and financing the transition to a knowledge economy. The discussion will be moderated by Mr. Sopnam Dumohanti, Chief Fintech Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. The members of the panel are Mr. Jesper Berg, Director General at the Danish Financial Supervisory Authority, who will join us online, Mr. Gergely Gobler, Deputy CEO of Interactive Broker Central Europe, and Mr. Leonardo Gamba Corta, Head of Innovation and Digital Economy at the Bank for International Settlements. Mr. Gamba Corta will join us online. Mr. Mohanty, Mr. Gobler, please take a seat on stage. Hi, uh, good evening. I think we're the last panel. I hope uh, we'll make it interesting for people to make sense of it. Uh, so I was supposed to give a, a kind of a, a context setting, but I would like to invite all the panelists uh, to the last panel. Uh, good to see Leonardo calling from I get Basel. Yeah. And, uh, and I hope we'll have a good discussion. But before that, uh, uh, let me uh, let me set what has happened in the space for last uh, six years or, or ten years in some case. Uh, you know, I, I particularly don't like the word shadow banking because in reality they have shown more spotlight than the banks themselves in solving real problem. So, uh, so if you look at what the shadow bank have done, they bought extraordinary technology. They bought uh, a strong sense of consumer experience and, uh, and they have really shown that how technology and, uh, can, can, can be built into business models and hence uh, can change the way we think about financial services. Uh, as against incumbent bank who have been largely uh, fallen behind on technology adoption and, uh, uh, and, and their there's no incentive for them to really look at the new way of doing banking or financial services. Uh, we, we have seen uh, over the last five to six years that this uh, shadow banks or the, or the, or the non-banks have, uh, have influenced even the traditional bank. And I will take example from Asia that during pandemic, uh, the regulators have rushed into announcing digital bank licenses. And in, in ASEAN alone, 25 plus digital bank licenses were announced right through the pandemic, almost five per country. And why did regulators respond to that? Because they could feel that the traditional banks were not up to the mark. So they got to inject competition. So they started issuing digital bank licenses who kind of are supposed to replicate the shadow banks, technology uh, approach, consumer models, and the experience they bring to the, to the space. Uh, if you look at uh, the future from now, uh, we are, from a technology standpoint, we are seeing the trend going two direction. One is embedded finance. Second, a little longer, uh, maybe future, is the rise of decentralized finance. And Embedded finance in particular has been, is an interesting play because it's a combination of the knowledge we got out of the role technology played in making the shadow banks more competitive and also the rise of consumer preference where they want to stay and live and play. Consumers don't want to come to the banks. They want to play, they want to engage in their own digital space, whether it is e-commerce sites or there's travel portals or their gaming sites. So it's the bank who has to follow them now. And that kind of pushes the banks to start embedding their financial services into the technology platforms where consumers are interacting more. And that's what we call as embedded finance. And we are seeing a massive trend where 
where, uh, where you can fulfill your insurance need at the gaming site. You can, you can see customers are getting onboarded at the e-commerce site. You're offering trade financing happening at the, at the point of transactions. And now more particularly recently, the, the spectacular rise of the buy now, pay later. It's a classic case of emerged finance where the finance is happening at the point of transaction. Now, some of the technologies which was bought by in the latest stage by this, this, this new this non-banks is a, is, a, is a DLT technology and the digital currencies. And that led to a, a, a series of uh, transformation impact on financial services, starting from cryptocurrencies, digital, central bank digital currencies, and how to use DLT to rethink about where the, the way uh, the middle offices and, uh, are designed in the financial services. And, and I think that is now leading to a new construct of decentralized finance, where all the processes between the issuing of or, or, the, or the creating of financial services and the consumption of financial services will see a complete change in the model. It will go to more decentralized construct. Smart contracts will execute transactions between two parties. Rules, regulations will be embedded in the piece of smart contracts. And that will completely disrupt the financial services. And this is within the regulated sectors, which, which will take this uh, new way of doing financial services. And, uh, uh, and further down, if you think about uh, the broader impact which technology is going to bring, is to start, uh, it's going to start looking uh, in terms of uh, the design of financial services. Uh, consumers will start uh, getting more of the financial services running on, 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 uh, on, on a piece of code uh, which will have, where I, where in one example I'd like to state, where multiple services get embedded. And one classic way is that today, when you buy goods and services, that is one part of the transaction and you pay for it. You will see both this getting, getting merged to a single transaction. I think that also talks about how technology is going to shape the future of finance. So with this context, I thought uh, we have uh, extremely uh, well, uh, it's a good, a good range of experience on understanding what risk does this uh, technology, the new business model, and, and I would say, I, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, in, in this part of the world, in Asian context, most of the non-bank players are already part of the regulatory coverage because in the case of Singapore, uh, we, we created a like, Payment Service Act, basically capturing the, uh, the, 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 the landscape of those non-banks who are kind of running outside the regulation are being captured within the new regulatory framework. So to, to discuss today, we have uh, uh, three uh, extremely uh, well uh, experts in this space. Leonard, I know for him from, uh, from Basel, he has, he has done a lot of work in this space. We have Jesper here uh, on the on the on the call here, and we have Gargi. I think I got it right, right? To speak on this in this topic. Uh, so let me um, frame. Uh, I, mean, I have framed some questions to uh, examine the impact, or at least the stability impact. But we'll look at other set of risk through this through this uh, panel. Uh, so let me start asking all of you uh, your 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 quick reaction in terms of what are the Financial stability issues you 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 f see in, in this in this space where technology, uh, while it brings remarkable opportunity, can create can can has own risk and we do see that in many uh, many of these uh, companies. Uh, but particularly, I'm not I'm not seen evidence. Maybe you can help me to understand. Maybe this more of a uh, perception that are there real financial stability risk? This uh, neo banks or the non banks are bringing to the space. Uh, so why don't I start um, right here with Gargi with you, and before I go to a or to a panelist on joining us online. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me properly. Thank you for the invitation for this uh, panel. I think uh, this is a very important topic to discuss. Uh, I do think that there, there are risks, uh, not just opportunities uh, due to the uh, financial innovation and, uh, and also the rise of the uh, neo banks or, or, or shadow banks. 
I don't m myself. I don't like uh, th th this phrase "shadow bank" because uh, it it creates the feeling that someone o operates in the shadows and uh, and and does something uh, uh, fishy. But uh, that's not the case. Shadow banks are are those banks that are not yet or not well regulated, but will become one. And, and you mentioned that shadow banks in Asia has become the part of the financial regulation, and I think this is the uh, uh, this is the good way, or the good path. So, getting back to the uh, uh, risks, uh, financial stability risks uh, that neo banks uh, pose, I think this is uh, in connection with the uh, with the with the sluggish regulation. Regulators cannot adopt that fast as, uh, as companies innovate. And uh, uh, these neobanks uh, usually find their way to uh, the less regulated areas of business or less regulated uh, parts of the world. And this regula so-called regulatory arbitrage is a huge risk in my opinion. And uh, if we look at the, the neo banks that operate in Europe, uh, I think that's uh, it, it creates real problems or, or, or real risks that uh, they find, find their way to operate in a in a country that has uh, less regulation or, or or less strict regulation, and also. Uh, they can operate from this country and uh, and offer services to, to the whole European Union uh, via passporting or, or the whole European economic area, which means that uh, if they face some troubles in, in the future, then uh, they will hit all the clients around Europe and not just in the country that uh, the, these companies operate in. Uh, let me bring one example, Revolut. It is a very well-known company and uh, it brings very good innovation and it's uh, very ambitious. It has a banking license in Lithuania. And it, it is a very ambitious company, but still it has risks. And if something happens to Revolut, all the 11 million million clients that it has throughout the European Union has to be bailed out by Lithuania itself, which is a rather small country with a rather small uh, deposit insurance guarantee scheme. And there is no answer for that in the EU yet. There's no, not a common uh, European deposit insurance uh, uh, facility. And yet nobody knows what would happen what would the Lithuanian taxpayers would say if they would need to bail out 11 million clients in the European Union? So these, this, this raises political questions, this raises financial stability questions. Uh, what would the other banks in Lithuania, the uh, prudent banks in Lithuania say if, uh, if they need to offer their, their money, their capital to bail out one com company that uh, works in elsewhere in the European Union. So I think these questions aren't yet answered and uh, these, these are certainly parts of, of the risks sure. that uh, shadow banks or neo banks pose. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Leonardo, I'll go to you, but be, let me ask you a more pointed question here. Because a lot of these new uh, new banks or unregulated banks, they do very narrow banking. They try to they try to solve a particular piece of services, make it better. They don't really do an expanded multiple banking services. Keeping that in mind, your uh, views on the impact it brings to the financial system on the context of financial stability. Uh, Thanks, Sabnandu, for the for the intro, and uh, uh, let me complement the views of uh, Gergely and focus in particular on this new risk, the one, the one that you mentioned, uh, and in particular to the new uh, risk that are introduced by the, the this new model of financial in intermediation. So, uh, in particular, the new ways to conduct financial intermediation bring some uh, uh, new risks, not only in terms of financial stability, market integrity, but also in terms of uh, competition and uh, data privacy. So in terms of financial stability, let me first, first focus on financial stability that was uh, the focus of your, uh, of your question. Then I will touch a little bit on competition and, 
and the data privacy. So on financial stability, I would like to focus on three specific points. So the first point is, uh, for example, uh, cloud computing. So entire IT system, including the core banking system, can now be hosted anywhere in the world. So uh, most cloud computing services are provided by a few uh, big tech. So the failure of one of these clouds become because of a cyber attack, for example, of technological problem, can produce some serious financial stability problem here and have a systemic impact. So this is a, really a, a financial stability risk. The second point is more general on, on lending provision. So big tech and fintech loan are granted on the basis of credit scoring technique that rely on the application of machine learning model and big data. So while these uh, uh, credit scoring technique have proved to be a very good uh, 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 way to uh, to provide lending and the performance so far, especially for the big tech, was uh, was very good. Their performance over a complete financial cycle or a real cycle has not been proved so far. So this is also another source of uh, uh, very important uh, analysis to be to be conducted. And the third point is uh, that this kind of uh, loans, if we remain on on, for example, the lending provision are of a transaction type and are not based on a, a traditional long-term lending relationship between a client and a bank. So, for example, there is evidence that relationship banks charge higher intermediation spread in normal times to small and medium enterprise, but offer then continuation lending at more favorable terms uh, then transaction bank to profitable firms uh, during, for example, a crisis. So it will be very interesting uh, to verify the behavior of fintech and big tech firms uh, uh, in the provision of credit in the case of uh, large shocks. Uh, and we have two examples <laughs> recently, uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, the, the Ukrainian war. But as I have already uh, mentioned, uh, this is a new business model based on data rather than collateral could create uh, new risk in terms of market power and misuse of data and the occurrence of digital monopolies. So these risks are particularly high if uh, the big tech, they enter into, into finance. So regarding the market power risk, it's clear that the big tech potentially they can scale up very rapidly. So big tech have the ability to leverage their vast rows of data and large network of users across a range of set, uh, set uh, of, uh, of activities that are very different. This leads to a data network activity or what we call the DNA feedback loop. But what, what does it mean? Well, it means that uh, the larger their network, the more activity they are able to perform and the more user data they acquire to further improve the, and expand their services. Thus, reinforcing this kind of loop. So this has been why uh, big tech have been able to achieve such dominant position in many markets. For instance, we know that the two big tech firms in China were able to capture 94% of the mobile payment market in just a few years. So big tech in principle can become dominant player and consolidate their position by raising barriers to, to, to entry. And this market power can pose risk to fair competition and coming back to your uh, call, even to financial stability. And then there is a last point regarding the misuse of data. Uh, there are risks that personal data are used in the way that are not uh, in uh, the interest of the users. So for, for example, the combination of e-commerce and payment data may help big tech to predict very accurately what user would like to buy and how much we are willing to pay. This allows big tech to price discriminate with great precision and thus extract a much larger share of consumer surplus. But there is also more. So big tech can not only extract all our consumer surplus, but move our demand schedule so how? Well, simply by sending us advertisement and information that can influence our preferences. So in some cases, big techs can know even more than us about our personal situation. This is a problem that in the literature has been named inverse selection rather than adverse selection. For example, I can consider myself a careful driver, but big tech via machine learning and big data can detect that I am not and price myself accordingly. So these are all the problems that should be considered together with uh, with the financial uh, financial stability. Well, Leonardo, can I can I just push you in a couple of these things? Uh, you know the cloud computing issue you bought. It was it was a real issue two three years down the line, but I think it has evolved now. 
Lot of the countries have started put, putting private cloud, national cloud, so they are trying to de-risk this big five top cloud computing companies uh, running this infrastructure. So there has been certain uh, certain uh, uh, actions being taken by different jurisdictions. And I'll take an example in Singapore. We have a lot of private clouds coming out. Banks themselves with large network are building their own private cloud. So there is this response to uh, uh, to, to, to this particular issue, and banks themselves are moving to the cloud uh, infrastructure. So, because it's, it's a scale and a cost, uh, uh, cost game, so there will it doesn't really limit to non-bank players uh, as our big tech themselves. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, on the cloud computing side. On your on your second point on the on the, did we really see during COVID uh, some of the big tech? Finances services were actually withdrawn. I thought it was it, it was during COVID. In fact, they became more active, uh, at least in Asian market, uh, and uh, their own digital services became much more mainstream uh, and much more popular. Uh, we saw during COVID, a lot of these digital banks, big tech, were able to operate more productively than the traditional bank. What is your observation on that particular uh, comment you made on the? On, with, on the, on the, on the uh, different on the crisis and the cycles, credit cycles, how this big tech will stand up. So, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to elaborate on this because uh, we actually have uh, um, uh, some research that uh, uh, is uh, currently uh, underway by an, uh, to analyze uh, uh, what are the effects of uh, uh, big tech credit during the, 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 the pandemic for the case of, uh, of China. Mm. And we actually find exactly what you were mentioning. So this means that uh, despite our prior that these uh, credit are transaction type and uh, they could uh, be uh, abandoned in the case of, uh, of a shock, mm. uh, we, we notice uh, uh, um, a, re a resilience of these uh, uh, credit lines from the big tech and the capacity of uh, big tech uh, firms uh, to continue the, 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 the supply of credit with a very positive uh, mm. real effect on, on firms. So yes. on this, uh, yes. I want to just... Yes, so I, I think that... that, that, that th th thanks, for. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to the report because that's interesting because many of us thought that during COVID, uh, this will be a real test for these companies where they can withstand the crisis. In fact, they have come out stronger uh, as we have seen in... in and in fact, we also saw remarkable innovation during during COVID, where they could uh, provide services like trade finance, invoice financing, cash flow financing, uh, much more efficiently than the banks. Uh, so, uh, on, uh, yeah. on the cloud computing, uh, let me just elaborate a little bit more. Uh, I am with you in the sense that uh, um, research conducted here at the BAS has stressed that. Uh, uh, when we analyze the cost of a cyber attack. Mm. Uh, these costs are, uh, are lower for firms, uh, not only in the financial space, but also in other sectors that use uh, cloud computing. Sure. So when the shock is small, the cost is lower. Mm. So my, my point is a general point uh, about something that we have not seen so far. Sure. So what happens is the shock is very large. Okay. And, uh, here, again, some very preliminary uh, analysis shows that there is a non-linearity. When the shock is very large, uh, there could be a substantial cost. But uh, on the other side, uh, I am with you uh, saying that uh, uh, firms that use cloud computing are less subject to uh, small uh, cyber uh, cost. Sure. Um, moving on to uh, Jesper. Jesper, Jesper, I, I hope you got it, got it right. Uh, so, uh, I can see you're from capital market side. Uh, your view, because uh, we, I mean, I have an interesting example very recently of the Luna Terra, cra uh, Terra crash, what happened in four days, $45 billion got wiped out by, uh, by a particular market manipulation happened on the crypto, crypto side. But your views on financial stability impact, uh, especially in the capital market side, if there are fintechs which uh, do, do you, you do feel strongly that they will have those, those risks? I, I, I think the important point uh, to, as, to start with is to make a distinction between different forms of financial activity. I mean, shadow banking is, 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 is sort of a very broad term, which includes anything from fintech to uh, uh, 
mutual funds to pension and insurance for financing the economy. And, and I think depending on the specific form, there are different kinds of risks. Uh, when it comes to FinTech, again, there in, in that space, we have anything from decentralized finance to big tech and, and also other business models. And, and, and the risks are very much associated with the specific business model and the trade-off. Personally, I think that uh, where we have to be aware is uh, one where other institutions than banks try to copy the bank business model and uh, have some form of intermediation uh, which is not back to back, just like a bank. It's, 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 and, the, and the classic example was money market mutual funds, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but more recent examples are some of the stable coins which proved to be less stable than we thought they were. Yes. And, and obviously, uh, 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 crypto is characterized by not being regulated in the same manner as mutual funds and money market mutual funds. And even with money market mutual funds, we've seen our share problems. So it's it's really no surprise that that there are risks out there when you try to copy the banking model, uh, uh, and and when you're not even subject to the restrictions mm. of banking models, or for that sake, sure. similar models. So intermediation is is by nature, uh, intermediation of, of something where we claim that liabilities are liquid and where the assets are, are less liquid is, is something which, which by, by nature is, is tricky and can cause stability problems. I, 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 I think if, if I were to look at the space in terms of the entire space of, 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 of FinTech, I think where we are likely to see the most competition and where we're also faced with an issue is in relation to big data. Hmm. I think big data has some advantages uh, which banks historically have, but which they are, have better possibilities of using. Uh, and the reason why is that uh, big data are not subject to the same sort of restrictions which banks are in terms of using data across business lines. And we, we, we typically say as regulators that, I mean, if it quacks like a dog, we need to regulate it like a dog. And, and, and in that sense, uh, going back to my issue of, of, of intermediation, uh, I don't think the issue is that big data will, uh, if they establish bank-like structures, will not be regulated like banks. I would even doubt they would establish these bank-like structures to a very large extent. But, but where I think they have a competitive advantage because of the skewed regulatory landscape is in relation to the use of data. And, 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 and that use of data advantage uh, is becoming all the more important in an environment of low or negative interest rates, which is to back it's like global warming is to ice bears in the sense that uh, uh, it is not in their preferred habitat. So I think banks are under pressure because of the low or negative rates, and at the same time, the historical advantages they had in terms of known customers, they're, they're to an increasing extent competing with uh, 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 big data who knows more. Facebook knows more about us than your bank. Uh, uh, Google knows more about us than our banks, and, and Google and Facebook can sell that data, which our banks can't. So I think that's a big issue. So, so just to flag, I mean, my, 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 my basic point is that we need to look, when we speak of shadow banking and fintech, we need to look very much at the specific model and then compare the risk and the regulation to, to the models we're used to. Thank you. Well, uh, let me switch on, uh, switch out to a different uh, topic here. Uh, one thing we saw is that banks, with the support of regulators, started collaborating more with these fintechs. Uh, I think the model has changed, especially in the Asian market, we saw that many of these fintechs who were doing financial services kind of outside the regulation, they pivoted to a model where they collaborate with the banks and they figure out that's the most optimal way to, to bring innovation. A quick uh, take from three of you, that will that model going to be the model going forward where you will not see this competition really standalone competition coming with the banks, regulated bank, but you see more of a collaboration model where the same disadvantages which 
uh, uh, just, just bought out in terms of data usage can become an advantage because now both are collaborating. Whether it is a Google collaborating with the bank or which is a Facebook, hopefully someday they collaborate, collaborate with the bank and find a middle path to, to, to make a best out of the both uh, opportunity. Uh, starting with you, Gregory. This is an excellent question. Uh, I believe that uh, going forward, uh, there will be more and more competition and less collaboration between fintechs or big techs and the incumbent uh, players. For the start, I, I, I remember when Facebook uh, started its initiation of uh, Libra, its own currency or digital currency, uh, which uh, was postponed or delayed uh, for, <laughs> I don't know, unlimited time, but uh, it is clear that there, there's intention in big techs to become market players and not just collaborators with, uh, with, 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 incumbent, uh, with incumbent banks and, uh, and, and financial institutions. And I think this intention uh, is there. Now it's not that visible, but still uh, I, mm. I think it, it, it waits for the opportunity sure. to, to break out. And that will bring uh, a real competition to the banks. As Jesper and uh, Leonardo already said that these players, these big techs are way more competitive uh, because of their nature, because of their, their the, the number of clients, mm. billions of clients, it's, uh, you, you can be way more competitive in this regard. And I, I, I believe this, bring, this will bring risks to the system because uh, uh, what happened to other markets where these big tech players appeared, like Google in, uh, Google in the GPS industry, the navigation industry, or Facebook in uh, the uh, social media, they very quickly became uh, very popular, very cheap, and uh, they executed all the other players on the market, and that led to less competition at the end. So first, they pose big competition, then they kill all the other players, and they, they get the monopoly, which is not good, and this is a risk in financial industry. So, uh, so but there is a trend to collaborate. I'll give you an example. Leonard, before I come to you on this, let me give you two data points. The 25 digital bank license which was issued in ASEAN market during COVID, if you look at who applied for the license, every country you'll see a big tech collaborating with a couple of other banks applied for license. Whether it's in Singapore, we issued five digital bank license and financial is one of them collaborated with some other fintech and applied for license. The same is true for Philippines, same is true for Malaysia. The big tech actually went and collaborated with one small tier mid-sized bank and applied for a digital bank license. That's one data point, which means there is an intent to not fight it out, find a way to collaborate and hopefully kind of opportunity. That's one data point. The second data point, data point to this uh, uh, trend is uh, that a lot of this uh, 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 digital bank lic the licenses uh, they are using uh, outside that, for example, I think Leonardo will know this, when PBOC came heavily on the big tech companies on the lending side, they actually put a regulation saying that they must fund 30%, if I'm not mistaken, from the balance sheet for if they want to lend. Earlier, they were just passed, they were not taking the risk, they were just passing it through. Banks were balance sheets were exposed, they just making fees out of not taking no risk. Uh, so with this two data point, Leonardo, do you think that the trend is now up there, that they're going to collaborate more, given in PBOC example in China, they force the big tech to use their own balance sheet for lending, and this new licensing trend, where you see more big tech collaborating with the mid-tier and small banks applying for digital license. Yeah. No, no, definitely this is, uh, this is uh, the most uh, plausible uh, scenario that I see for, uh, for the future. I mean, uh, we always thought about three potential scenarios. So one scenario, so number one, is uh, big tech, they, they dominate. 
but um, you know that uh, we know that uh, big tech uh, they don't want to be fully regulated and that this should uh, really uh, under undermine their uh, business model that is based on the combination of uh, e-commerce uh, and uh, other business and other financial services so uh, the first scenario i don't think that is going to 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 happen the second scenario that is uh, the banks they could dominate but uh, here also we have some problem because banks uh, do not have access to the same level and variety of data of big tech that operate often in closed ecosystem. Second banks have uh, the legacy of old IT system and the data are organized in silos. Uh, and third, data processing for credit scoring could have high fixed costs to set up the necessary IT infrastructure and create a highly specialized team. So the most plausible scenario is the one that you depicted. And it is the one in which, uh, in the medium term, we'll see banks and big tech to cooperate. Banks can cooperate with, uh, uh, with big tech, with fintech. They can uh, start their own fintech. In this scenario, big tech will provide the services for banks and distribute the third-party products on the platform. Mm. In these scenarios, banks will capitalize on one important element that is trust in the use of data and long-term expertise in the financial intermediation process. Coming back to the, uh, to the example of, of China. In China, uh, we have seen, uh, and this is clear, that at the beginning, uh, the, the, the PBOC uh, rightly uh, uh, just uh, uh, operated with a very mild regulation, let uh, big tech to, uh, to uh, develop. And then at a certain point, as you mentioned, they introduced some, uh, some, some limits. And uh, these limits are also, in a way, um, uh, setting uh, uh, rules to let uh, big tech to uh, cooperate with with banks. The one you mentioned is 30% uh, of skin in the game in the lending uh, in the lending uh, production, not only uh, originate mm. uh, to to distribute, but also uh, trying to uh, uh, to understand how to optimally share the data. Sure. So let's start, let's start from this uh, uh, consideration. Is uh, we can also share all the data, no? produce a big data lake with all the information, but are there, are there uh, the banks and other financial intermediaries uh, able to exploit this vast amount of data very soon? Or is it possible and better to let the big tech to process the data and then to pass not the data, but the information? So sharing of information rather than, rather than data to the, to, the, to, the, to the bank. And I think this is, will be the, the future, the sharing of information rather than data, because uh, there, there is, you know, uh, of course, uh, a, a specialization in the use of data, that big tech uh, that uh, could be uh, useful to develop further and to allow to the, in the, in the, the financial intermediation in the future to, uh, to, uh, to see this kind of specialization. Sure. Jesper, before I come to you, let me give you a, uh, on, the, on the open finance and open data access, uh, what we saw in Europe as part of the open banking, that uh, there was this requirement for, uh, with consumer consent, you can pull data uh, for, uh, from the banks and give to third party and they can provide a services. In Asia, the model was quite different because in Asia, the same open banking model was done a little differently. And ex uh, let me explain that. Uh, in Singapore, we implemented something called SG fin Financial Index, uh, uh, Database called SG Findex. And the principle we applied that if you want to participate in an open data exchange platform, you must be a contributor, not just taking, take, taking data out. So the rule we built, designed that the participant in sharing data network should, have, should both contribute and able to uh, pull data from the same network. And that actually, in a way, uh, became a constraint for a lot of the third party who don't have, who have nothing to contribute, but they, they just pull it out um, uh, to so stay away from the network. Now, with this open banking and the Asian model, which is pushing for a contribution model uh, as against just consent, I can pull the data. Do you think with this in kind of uh, mandate and infrastructure, the speed to collaboration uh, will it uh, go forward or you will find uh, the long-term uh, loser in this space will be the banks? Good question. Uh, I, I, I think, again, it depends a lot on who the competitor is. I, I, my guess, uh, and it's a guess, 
would be that most of the smaller fintech companies uh, will uh, eventually have to go for a model where they are sold to banks. Uh, I, I would tend to think that uh, uh, they won't have the capacity to go full scale uh, and uh, that uh, they basically contribute by providing accessory services linked to payments one way or the other, say accounting or other kinds of things. And, and, and I, I think it would be a little bit like the pharmaceutical industry where uh, sort of taking the full step from the first clinical test to, to going live is, is, is really tricky. Uh, and and uh, the regulatory costs are very similar in the two industries. So, so I think at the end of the day, uh, they will try uh, uh, to sell themselves to bigger banking entities. I think there's a big difference to the business model of big data. I don't think the big data will establish themselves, as I said earlier, uh, financial intermediaries, but I think they'll put themselves on top of financial intermediaries and they'll try to own the customers mm. like you've seen in, 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 in other businesses. And, and if they succeed in that, banks uh, risk in becoming uh, commodity suppliers mm. in terms of banking services, accounting services, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that's typically a much less profitable business than the business of owning customers. Sure. So, so I think that's where the battleground will be. And then the, the, there is the whole uh, uh, decentralized finance and cryptocurrencies and various kinds of things, which, which is a more fundamental difference in terms of business model as a competitor. But where I think that central banks clearly will also play a role in, in and, and central banks are trying sort of to figure out uh, whether they see these as potential competitors and most central banks are developing a response to these crypto sure. uh, providers. Uh, 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 so, so, so again, my bottom line is that, that I think the kind of competition you will see and, 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 and the kind of games you will see will depend very much on which of the underlying business models you're looking at. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, I, personally, if I was a bank, big data would be my biggest fear. Okay, we have uh, uh, we're the last segment of our discussion. So before we go to the last question, which you will have five minutes to uh, reflect on, let me try to uh, set the baseline. I think shadow bankings are no more shadow. I think they are more mainstream in many ways. Uh, some of the risk which Leonardo and all of you uh, uh, articulated has changed a lot. Infrastructure risk has become far less risky because of technology advancement. Some of those regulatory exposures, uh, arbitrage are getting narrower. I don't think that's going to be a, a big gap. And uh, some of the data advantage are slowly getting into the mainstream financial sector. So I think with the collaboration and digital bank licenses, competition also going in the direction of the fintechs. So if the digital bank becomes successful, then I think it's a level playing field for everybody. So with that, optimism that this new banks, fintechs, did make a positive impact to the sector in terms of technology, consumer experience, new business model. Let's spend the next five minutes painting the future. Where do we see some of the most disruptive uh, change will happen? Uh, at least in my mind, uh, we, I think all of us at least discussing now, and we see some early evidence that what seems to be fanciful, the decentralized finance, at least from my perspective, the experiments we are doing, it seems feasible, especially on the capital market side. Uh, decentralized finance will see some real examples, production cases coming into, into life. Uh, so starting with, this time starting with Jesper, uh, uh, from your perspective, what are a couple of things, just short uh, intervention on the future of finance, uh, keeping in mind the progress we are making in the decentralized finance space, smart contracts, digital currencies, uh, 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 and the DLT technologies in play. Well, clearly the biggest battle is going on in, in payments. Uh, uh, you mentioned before the, the difference between the rule set up in a, and, and in Europe, most fintech providers see it. 
Uh, and, and why are they there? I think they are there for two reasons. One is that uh, the global payment system for uh, 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 ordinary people do not work very well. I mean, the famous story of the Philippine mate in Canada who needs to send money back uh, and, and gets uh, 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 the money she sends back reduced substantially because the system doesn't work well enough. I mean, that, that, that was the Libra uh, sort of promise to do something about that. And I think there's still uh, a clearly a, a, a possibility out there to do things smarter. We'll see whether that will be a central bank issue or whether that will be some of the crypto providers who mm. manage to sweep in that space. I, I, I think the other sort of big, really big question is owning the customer, as I said earlier. Uh, owning the cost, it, it, owning the customers in most businesses is the key to being very profitable. Uh, 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 there are very few instances, uh, semiconductors where Intel uh, do not own the customers where, where they still are profitable. But, but in most other businesses, money is in owning the customer. And, and I think that that is, is uh, and there I think, as I said earlier, big data is going to be sort of the, the big competitor. Sure. I think we'll uh, lost. Okay, Leonardo, uh, uh, DLT, uh, smart contracts, digital currencies, uh, new decentralized, decentralized finance models. Five years from now, will you see some major disruption in the business models? Well, uh, let's start with the payments. So on payments, uh, I, I, I don't believe that uh, cryptocurrencies uh, will be uh, will be necessary, will be the, the future. So I see more of a, um, a development of uh, uh, a system grounded uh, in uh, central bank uh, money that uh, offers a sounder basis for innovation, ensuring interoperability of services uh, domestically and across the border. And uh, such a system can really sustain the, a, virtu a vir virtuous uh, cycle of uh, trust, uh, greater adoption through network effect, uh, and, uh, uh, and develop more. I mean, uh, we have seen that the DeFi system are not uh, scalable. They are a problem of congestion and so on. I don't see so far a lot of uh, uh, improvement in DeFi lending. DeFi lending are uh, over, over collateralized. They're used by uh, rich, I would say, because if you, are not, if you don't have collateral, you cannot get mm. the loan. That's true. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult at the moment to use this uh, DeFi lending for, uh, you know, for financial inclusion. But we can use uh, some element of DeFi that is very good. That is the smart contract. Especially the, the automated market makers, the AMMP. We can, we, we, we can integrate this element uh, into a system that is grounded on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, central bank money, that mm. is grounded on... Uh, the provision of public good, as we have seen in, in many countries, and Singapore is one of these. Good. I agree with uh, Leonardo that uh, decentralization is not uh, a necess necess necessity. It uh, brings opportunities, but uh, I see good digital channels, good digital structures can be built in a centralized way as well, not just in with, with decentralization. So I do believe that uh, either of the two is the uh, is the future. But for sure, digitalization needs to be done. And all those players, all those financial institutions that won't accept this, uh, they will certainly fail if they don't give enough customer experience for their clients. If they don't uh, compete in, uh, in in digital channels. I, I believe they won't survive, and uh, this will have an impact on how the future financial industry will look like. And uh, let me uh, ref uh, refer back to what Leonardo said uh, in the start of this meeting, uh, uh, that uh, collateral will be less important and data will be more important. And I do believe that this will uh, define how lending will work in the future. Thank you. Sure. I think we are uh, up for the, uh, on this panel. Time is up and right on the time we close this. But let me uh, end saying that I think the future of finance, uh, 
definitely will see a significant shift. Uh, some of the experiments we are seeing in Asian market uh, do lend itself saying that some of, the in, some of the middle office infrastructure may not be a necessity anymore. Uh, if we do the right design with smart contracts and all, we can see some of the changes. But I do agree that the role of money and the traditional construct will continue to stay. But I do have a little bit of a naughty idea of how to make it work without the traditional money, especially with the new models coming around where you can tokenize very well-known companies as a shares like Apple and make money like instruments. So with that optimism that there will be some innovation out there using this new technology, uh, I think the, the trend will continue. Uh, banks will be forced to digitize more because the consumer demand is going to make it work because the generation coming after us are not, will, not, will not be happy with the current state of incumbent banks, technology and consumer experience. They have to change. They have to change for the generation coming ahead of us. They may not agree with us the way we think about bank. And hopefully, metaverse is the way to go. Thank you very much. I thank our panelists and Mr. Mohanty for letting us glimpse into what might turn out to be the very near future at finance. With the closing of this season, we have reached the end of the MMB ONFI Financial Stability Conference 2022. Before officially closing the event, I would like to ask Mr. Janos Sakács, head of the Macroprudential Policy Department of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank and part of the organizing team of this conference, to deliver his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be very brief and I will not take up a lot of your time for two reasons. On the one hand, we have had a lot of fruitful discussions, but I believe that it has been also a very tiring two days for everybody, which is somewhat also reflected in the slowly decreasing number of participants that made, us, made it with us uh, through the end. So uh, on the other hand, uh, we have had a lot of great experts talk about financial stability matters, and I think that we have been given a huge amount of information in a very short time, and it surely is going to take some time to process all of this. So I don't think that there's a lot to add to it, so I would just like to highlight uh, a couple of the, of the major points that we have heard uh, in the past two days. So yesterday, most of the conversation was centered around stress in the financial system, stress in different forms, including the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and its implications, the current Russia-Ukraine war and its implications on financial stability, and the methodologies that we need to develop to be able to better measure stress in the future and to use this a uh, new capability for better uh, decision making in policy, especially macroprudential policy. I think that we heard a lot of great insights into uh, how this can be done and a lot of great ideas were shared with us uh, by both panelists uh, and presentations yesterday. And I believe that this will be uh, a very good basis to build upon in the future, uh, for example, in terms of how the counter-cyclical capital buffer can be calibrated and how stress test methodologies at central banks can be developed further. We heard a lot about policies also, besides methodologies, including uh, the macroprudential framework and how it has developed in the past uh, decade or so, uh, mostly focusing on Europe, but also from a global perspective. I think we have learned that uh, countries have become more and more active and creative in using these measures, capital-based measures, borrower-based measures, and we have also seen that one size does not fit all. We have heard a lot about how regulation can uh, become more and more complex, the way we move forward. And uh, I believe today's was a very interesting presentation by, by David, and uh, the conversation was also very interesting, especially to us uh, central bankers and those working in the field of uh, macroprudential policies. And uh, what I found most interesting was that there's no definite conclusion at the end of the, of the conversation. So I believe that uh, it's going to be very interesting to see when we move forward whether more or less complexity is actually uh, optimal. But definitely this was a lot of food for thought um, for, for regulators. Uh, today especially, but also a bit yesterday in the CBDC panel, we also heard uh, about the future challenges and we, we looked a bit further on uh, into the long run. And uh, the two major topics that we covered was digitalization 
and uh, the green challenge and the green transition in the banking sector. Uh, regarding digitalization, I think we have heard a lot of great thoughts, one of which uh, was centered around uh, the way virtually all central banks are currently considering the possibility of introducing uh, digital currencies uh, also uh, as, as a way to answer, to, to give an answer to changing consumer demands and also the, because of the growth of the crypto asset market. What was also very interesting in this uh, topic for me was that there also was not a one-size-fits-all solution. And what we have heard is that different types of countries might, uh, uh, might, um, might approach this question very differently. And CBDCs will surely be a thing of the future, but what was a very big question, I believe, was uh, what use the different countries will use them for. And I think that there are gonna be very big differences uh, in this regard, the, the world over, but uh, a sure thing is that uh, that CBDC will be with us uh, in the next couple of uh, in the next couple of years. And regarding green transition, I think uh, there was also a very interesting debate today, uh, especially and uh, basically in, in all of the all of the presentations we heard uh, a lot about the importance of climate change and its financial stability risks. But at the same time, we have also heard the opinion, uh, especially by Mr. Danielson, who I unfortunately don't see here right now, but he had some very interesting uh, questions about the, the politics of it all and, uh, and the, the uh, way central banks factor into this whole process. And we, we at the Central Bank of Hungary also uh, are talking about this a lot. And I think this is going to be a very interesting question uh, moving forward for both supervisors and macroprudential uh, authorities. So I believe that all the methodologies that we heard uh, in the presentations today will also be a great help in identifying these risks and answering some of the questions that we heard today. And one of the very uh, important topics that came up in almost all of these presentations, and especially in the green uh, cli climate-related topics, was data, and uh, how there's a data gap in basically every field that we've been talking about, and how, um, and how a, a filling of these, these data gaps uh, need to be done first. And especially in, in uh, measuring climate-related risks, I think we have seen that both governments and central banks, but even the private uh, companies will have, including banks, will have a lot to do in this regard. And that's when we can actually move forward in the future in answering these questions. So uh, that would basically sum up, I think, uh, all of the topics that we have, uh, we have covered. And uh, I hope that uh, these two days have, been proved, uh, have proved as useful to you as uh, they did to us on side of the, of the Central Bank of Hungary. And we are very thankful to all the speakers, uh, panelists, and uh, keynote speakers and presenters for accepting our invitation and joining us either virtually or uh, what we're even happier about is that a lot of you could actually make it in person and uh, be here with us in, in these uh, two days. We are hoping to turn this into a, sort of a series uh, of, of conferences in the next years. Um, we, we are uh, really hoping that we can continue this discussion with you on, on an annual basis if we manage to. And on a final note, I would like to say uh, thank you for the excellent team, uh, the organizing team behind uh, the event uh, of these two days, and uh, they have put a tremendous amount of time and effort in the past couple of months uh, into organizing this conference, which I believe has been uh, very successful on, on our part, and uh, therefore I would like to ask all of you to give them a big round of applause. And with that, I would like to thank you, all of you, again, for coming and participating, and I wish you a very, very pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sokac, for the wise remarks and the excellent conclusion of the event. Once again, I thank all our speakers and participants for sharing their great insights and our audience for staying with us till the end. If you missed any of the speeches or you would like to rewatch our sessions, you can find a record of the conference proceedings on the official MMB YouTube channel. I wish you all a pleasant day. Keep safe and healthy, and I hope we meet again. Goodbye.